Good morning, Leslie. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Sure, happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Morning, Dave. Good morning, Michaela. Good morning. Have a great meeting. This is a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now broadcast live on our web portal and YouTube. Good morning, President Wasserman. Good morning, Rhonda. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you as well. Have a wonderful meeting today. Thank you. How can we not? It's going to be a great day for a meeting, I think. There you go. <laughs> That's the can-do attitude of Santa Clara County. Gotta have it. Good morning, President Wasserman. I will be your clerk today. Hey, Jess. I have 30 seconds to 930, and we are waiting on Supervisor Simidian. Gotcha. You stole my thunder, Jess. Sorry. That's all right. And I'll let Supervisor Chavez know that she'll be doing the pledge. Recording in progress. Wonderful. We've got 930 and I believe Jess, we're looking for Supervisor Simidian and then we'll be a full team. Yes. All right. And Supervisor Lee, we're going to call on you in, um, today to do the Pledge of Allegiance and there's Supervisor Simidian. All right, the team's all here. Roll call, please, Jess. Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Allen. <clears throat> I'm here. 
President Wasserman. Here. Thank you very much, Jess. And with that, we're going to move on to item number two, which is our Pledge of Allegiance, which today will be led by Supervisor Lee. I ask that all of you that can stand for this do so. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, sir. Now I'm going to turn to Vice President Ellenberg, Ellenberg to introduce our invocator, Vice President. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanksgiving is nearly upon us, and many people have food on their minds, uh, whether it's which recipe to make or how to access a meal for the holiday. Food is life, culture, sustenance, and connectivity. And for those who don't have enough of it on a regular basis, really nothing else matters. As most of us are likely aware, Second Harvest is one of the largest food banks in the country. Since 1974, they've been working to ensure that everyone in our community has access to healthy food. Today, in close partnership with more than 300 community organizations across Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, they serve an average of 450,000 people every month. During the pandemic, they played a critical role in supporting our community's sudden and critical increased need for food, quickly doubling their operations. In a matter of months, they were able to go from serving an average of 250,000 people per month to the more than 500,000 per month they were serving at the height of the pandemic. Leslie Bacho has served as Second Harvest CEO since 2017. And before taking that role, she served as the Chief Operating Officer of the San Francisco Marin Food Bank for 19 years. Rooted in her conviction that access to healthy food is a basic human right, Leslie has dedicated her career to addressing hunger in her community. Tracy Weatherby joined Second Harvest in 2018 and in her role, she and her team lead efforts around legislation and advocacy by collaborating with government agencies and government officials to advocate for policies in support of reducing hunger. I'm happy to welcome Tracy and Leslie this morning to offer an invocation to the board. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation and for that introduction, Supervisor Ellenberg. Leslie and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all this morning. We're grateful to the board for making room in this meeting to hear about what we're seeing in the community as so many families, seniors, and individuals struggle to make ends meet. And we are appreciative that you wanna learn more about Second Harvest and our network of partners and how we're working to maintain our community's basic safety net. I'd like to begin by expressing gratitude on behalf of our organization to the Board of Supervisors and all our partners in Santa Clara County government. Every day we see the dedication each of you have to upholding a strong safety net in Santa Clara County. And we've appreciated partnering with the board on food systems plans, on school and summer meals. And our county government is a crucial partner in the work we do even beyond distributing physical food. We partner with SSA to sign up people for CalFresh and we co-host the safety net committee. We collaborate with environmental health and sustainability on food rescue, with public health on nutrition and farmers markets, with county libraries on summer meals, and with the Office of Education on universal school meals implementation. Together, we're a powerful network to work to end hunger in Silicon Valley. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning, and thank you for your service. About this time last year, we were given the opportunity to offer this invocation at this meeting, and I remember sharing remarks rooted in optimism about the pandemic being nearly behind us and the promise of hope that would bring for our community. To be sure, we're in a much better place now in terms of the medical crisis we all endured over the last two and a half years, and there's much to be thankful for in the opportunity to be together in person again in the community. But as you all know from your close work with your constituents, Many of our neighbors are struggling with even greater financial challenges today than they were at the height of the pandemic. Sky high inflation, food costs, and gas prices mean hundreds of thousands of families and individuals are struggling to pay their rent and put food on the table. Irma, one of our clients who generously shared her story for our holiday campaign, explained, either my car eats or I do. Our clients are facing these kind of impossible decisions throughout the day, every day. Do I pay the rent or the PG&E bill? Do I repair my car or buy groceries? In our recent survey of our clients, 
60% of people said they share, they said that they have at less than, sorry, $250 in savings. They are living a reality that the wealthiest in our community can hardly imagine, the financial vulnerability of having no cushion. As Supervisor Ellenberg just shared, we're continuing to serve more than 450,000 people on average each month. Now that's 80% more than we were serving before the pandemic. And in the past few months, that number has grown to more than 460,000 people. And that's not too far from the kind of numbers we were seeing at the height of the pandemic. That's surprising to some people who are tracking unemployment levels, but the painful truth is due to the incredibly high cost of living here with prices of food, gas, and rent steeply rising, it is getting harder and harder for folks in our community to make ends meet, even those that are working full time. The health emergency may be winding down, but our clients are still very much in emergency response mode. And so are we here at Second Harvest. We have been so incredibly fortunate that our community has stepped up and answered the call every time we've told them what we need. You may be surprised to learn that only 5% of our funding comes from the government. The rest is from private sources with more than 70% coming from individuals. As we see layoffs and market volatility impacting our supporters, we're concerned about the holiday season and whether they'll be able to continue to step up and help us meet the need. Second Harvest and our more than 400 nonprofit partners are a huge part of the safety net. It's going to take the support of community and government to keep it going through these current challenges and whatever may come next. Hunger in Silicon Valley is a solvable problem, yet we need to be very clear, no one from outside Silicon Valley is gonna come in to save Silicon Valley. It's really up to us, to all of us together. We know what we do and it, we know what to do and it's more important than ever that we come together to do it. Now, I have the benefit of seeing the power of community coming together every day. And that's why even in the midst of so much need, I remain a hopeful person. I see all of you committing your skills, your talents, your experience and service to our community. I see so many young people who join us in our warehouses at our, our food distribution sites who want to get engaged and make real change. I see the hundreds of nonprofit partners, the tens of thousands of volunteers and donors who come together to make a difference in someone else's life, providing them with one of the most fundamental basic needs. This network of support is not just good for the person receiving food, it is good for all of us. Thank you, supervisors, for being such an integral part of the work we get to do at Second Harvest and for being part of the community that makes our work possible. Our need for volunteers and donors remains high, so I appreciate your support and encouraging your constituents to join us in making connections through food. I wish you a productive meeting today and thank you again for the opportunity to help you get started this morning. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Absolutely. Thank you. That concludes item number three. We're going to move on here in just a minute. I just want to get a heads up, give a heads up to anybody watching. Item number seven is public comment, which is coming up in just a moment. Is your opportunity to speak about anything not on today's agenda. If you wish to do so, please register electronically at this time. That said, we now move on to item number four, announcing adjournments in memoriam. And we don't have any of those on the agenda today. Item number five, commendations and proclamations are handled in the consent calendar under item number 74. And I just wanna say, Supervisor Lee, thank you for uh, your commendation. That was sneaky, it's much appreciated. And for th those in the public, it's a commendation regarding my service um, on the SBRIA where I serve. So thank you for that, Supervisor Lee. Item number six is to receive a report and present the annual CalWORKs Achievement Awards from the Social Services Agency. And it is my honor to now uh, welcome Angela Shing, Director of the Social Service Agency's Department of Employment and Benefits Services. Angela is here today to present the annual CalWORKs Achievement Awards, honoring the accomplishments of five remarkable families whose stories of courage, perseverance, and determination will be highlighted in a short video presentation. Angela, please take it away. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for joining us today in acknowledging and congratulating these five 
remarkable honorees in their outstanding accomplishments. For 32 years, the CalWORKs program has been providing families with services they need, such as childcare, housing assistance, and connecting families to employment and education. Um, these services are designed to assist families in achieving a safe and stable quality of life and brighter future for their children. Facts, figures, and reports can tell the stories of the success of the CalWORKs program, but every year we always say nothing does it justice like seeing the impact on these people. People are really what make the program succeed, resiliency in the face of adversity. These five honorees are, and their stories are truly inspiring. Um, and really what we wanted to do, I know um, previously we used to do these in person. Um, we've been doing it virtually for the last, I think this is the third year. So we do have a video today to really um, hopefully highlight the impact of the program on these honorees um, and really display the um, truly inspirational stories. So I think we have a video to queue up um, to hopefully really convey the impact of these people, um, truly inspiring. The video will be here in just a moment. Great, thank you. Each year, the CalWORKs program recognizes the outstanding achievement of five CalWORKs families through the CalWORKs Achievement Awards. This year's honorees are particularly notable, having demonstrated the perseverance and determination required to overcome many life obstacles, as well as the challenges of COVID-19 to create a better future for their families. Please join us in honoring this year's CalWORKs Achievement Award winners. Gerardo is a single parent with limited English skills who navigated the complex social justice system and braved the courts for many months to get legal and physical custody of his three children. Gerardo says he draws inspiration from his children and wishes to build them a better life in America. Cuéntame sobre alguien que ha tenido una gran influencia en tu vida y qué lecciones te enseñó esa persona. Principalmente mi madre que me enseñó el respeto y el trabajo duro a no rendirme y eso mismo quiero transmitirle a mis hijos. Pero también tengo un gran ejemplo y ella es la trabajadora social Yves Rodríguez que, es, que confió en mí y nunca me dejó a la deriva. Siempre actuó muy humana y profesional. Me inspira el amor y pasión que le pone a su trabajo. Muchas gracias por todo. ¿Qué consejo le dará a alguien recién escrito en CalWORKS? Que el éxito está asegurado y que pueden confiar plenamente en cualquier situación y proceso que se requieran, ya que en CalWORKS siempre serán tratados con amabilidad y respeto por todo el equipo de profesionales que están disponibles a ayudarte a ti y a tu familia. Corlin grew up in the foster care system and survived substance and physical abuse that motivated her to change her life and start anew for her children. Coraline's biggest goals now are to save up money to buy a house and to help her children grow up to be successful young men. Being in the CalWORKs program, how, how, was, how did that help you or how did that help change your life? Basically, they helped me to have more confidence more confidence um, with clearing my background, uh, being there for me. You know, um, Anthony's father is not, so so CalWORKs kind of played a part on playing the dad's role, kind of, you know. CalWORKs has helped me a lot as far as, you know, helping me take care of my kids, helping me clear my background so I can give them a better future. Um, they also helped me with my daycare, so that way I can go to work every, you know, every day, yeah. go to school, and so it, it it's also, it, it played a very big role in my life. Let's see, what advice would you give someone that's newly enrolled in CalWORKs? Strive for better and not to give up. Never give up. It doesn't matter if something, little things hold you back, always strive for the greater and, and keep going. That's probably the best advice. Valerie overcame the traumatic effects of exposure to intimate partner violence. After getting her family to safety, Valerie embarked on a complex road towards restoration and healing to provide her four children with stability and a quality of life that she did not experience. Tell me about how um, being enrolled in the CalWORKs program changed your life. So being in the CalWORKs program changed my life because it taught me how to apply in the program. It taught me how to talk properly, how to dress correctly, 
how to write a thank you letter, how to write a follow-up letter from the interview. Now for future generations of your family who are listening to this recording years from now, is there any wisdom you would want to pass on to them? Um, like what would you want them to know? Go to family, ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help from other people. Join other organizations. When you join an organization, don't be afraid to tell your story. It may help other people, but then other people's stories may help your, you as well. Denise is a resilient mother who turned to CalWORKS after leaving a challenging domestic violence relationship with no financial or familial support. Her continuous focus is on providing a bright and secure future for herself and her daughter. So how has being enrolled in the CalWORKS program changed your life? Being enrolled in the CalWORKS program has changed my life because I have been able to have experiences in actually having the chance to go back to school, um, which is something that I had never thought I could do before, um, and now have a degree as well as a certificate um, for education and plan on transferring to obtain my bachelor's. For future generations of your family listening to this years for now, is there any wisdom you want to pass on to them? What would you want them to know? I would want them to know probably to stay in school um, and obtain an education as far as you can possibly go from the time you end high school um, and to be able to allow yourself to have that education and that confidence to be able to support yourself and your family um, without having the financial burden down the road because you didn't have the education behind you. For Ruth, her husband Mario, and their two sons, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic have been enduring and personal, losing both family and friends to the virus. Now off aid and continuing her vital work at the Santa Clara County Emergency Operations Center, Ruth dreams of continuing to help her community by becoming a licensed vocational nurse. So what are some of the most important lessons that you've learned in life? I just started working with the COVID in May in the test side for COVID. And then I got transferred to the uh, vaccine vaccination side. I would say just life in general, uh, health wise and appreciate more my family. I've been always appreciating my family and thankful for them, but I would say now more than ever, appreciate more my health. What advice would you give to someone that is newly enrolled in the CalWORKS program? I would say, uh, like, first of all, they have to be their mindset on finding a job for like, I, I always wanted to, to give more because uh, I, I really needed a job. So I would say put the effort and work, work very hard. Congratulations to our awardees for everything you and your families have overcome. We look forward to your continued growth and future success. Let's bring the magic back to Thank you, Angela, for sharing this presentation. I'd like to extend a special thank you to all the families who shared personal stories and words of wisdom with us today. You have left us all feeling tremendously inspired. And also on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, I wanna say thank you to the Department of Employment and Benefit Services and to our community partners for providing exceptional services in the CalWORKS program every year. This presentation highlights Santa Clara County's continued commitment to serving families within our community, and we are all proud to participate in this partnership. Thank you for showcasing the exceptional work being done and sharing these highlights with the Board of Supervisors and members of the public. Again, congratulations to all five awardees for achieving your goals. We wish you the best of luck and much success in the future. Thank you, Angela. Anything you wanted to add? Oh, we good? Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to really thank the um, Board of Supervisors, the community partners, the um, employers in the community. This program wouldn't happen without all of you. And really, thank you so much for the opportunity to highlight all of our honorees. And um, Supervisor Wasserman, really, you said it perfectly. They're inspiring yeah. every single year and highlighting them 
says it so much more than the facts and reports and the figures that we display every year. So thank you so much for allowing us to highlight their, their inspiring uh, accomplishments. Thank you, Angela, and thank you for choosing one family from each district. I appreciate that, but I know there are many, many, many more Absolutely. similar stories at overcoming adversity, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. All right, with that, we move on to item number seven, public comment, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, is the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything not on today's agenda. And Jess, it looks like Based on the number of people we have right now, let's give these individuals two minutes each. Thank you. Our first speaker is Ken Horowitz. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak, and the timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. This is Dr. Ken Horowitz of the County Health Advisory Commission, and I want to inform the board that um, our commission is having a meeting tomorrow evening at 6 30 it's a virtual meeting and at this meeting we'll be voting on a referral to the board to initiate a discovery team to define a pilot for an integrative medicine and functional medicine services in the county health system while the county has been focused most recently on acute respiratory diseases our health advisory commission has been looking at chronic disease. Chronic disease threatens to overwhelm our healthcare system and its costs are astronomical, especially with a, a budget that we currently have at $4 billion a year. And our commission plans to make this referral through the health and hospital system in December to the Board of Supervisors. We believe that our proposal uh, is an equity issue to close the equity gap and to make services available to uh, diverse parts of our county that's currently being provided by Sutter and Kaiser and Stanford, but doesn't exist in our enterprise system. Keeping our county population healthy means that they will more successfully stay in the workforce, helping maintain the supply side of the county's economic well-being. Please uh, tune in tomorrow evening. It's a virtual meeting for the Health Advisory Commission. The agenda is posted on the county website, 6.30. Thank you, Donna. Our next speaker is Joaquin Serrano. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, my name is Joaquin Serrano. I've been a PSO for the hospital system for the last 23 years. PSOs have done a tremendous job in providing the residents and employees of the county with quality services. The Protective Services Department is a unique type of law enforcement department as we also provide patient care. We connect residents to services and have spoken to us, has spoken and assisted those going through private health practice. Under the sheriff's management, we have been understaffed and sufficiently trained and not given the proper tools for the job. I've also experienced disrespect, lack of, lack of compassion, and retaliation. I respectfully urge the board to vote no on the proposal or wait until the new sheriff is in office as he may be more understanding than the former sheriff. We PSOs are here and will always be here for the people of the community. But let's not forget PSOs and their families are also part of the community. Please help make it fair for current PSOs who wish to become a sheriff PSO. Why should PSOs do everything we have done when we first got hired uh, to get this new position? We've been told that the current PSOs have the option to apply for the new sheriff's PSO, but we also been told that you know it's an option so we could stay a, a PSO with our current uh, title, but they haven't really specified what the description or what our duties would be. We ask that you, uh, ask them to come back to the table and work out some of our questions and have more transparency uh, with this new position. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Delilah Polito. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. In the November 1st Board of Supervisors meeting, Sarah Cody answered a question regarding the number of unvaccinated versus vaccinated 
people in the, that are hospitalized. Sarah answered, the general trends that I recall seeing are that in general, people who are hospitalized tend to be older, tend to be people who have chronic, other chronic medical conditions that put them at risk. And in our county, almost everybody has received some number of vaccinations. Then the majority of people in the hospital also have had vaccinations. We have been coming, we have been coming on here telling you this. Firefighters, nurses have come on here telling you this and you ignored it. And still with contradictions coming out on these board of supervisors meetings regarding the mask. And now Cody's saying this about the majority hospitalized, you still choose to ignore it and continue to discriminate and segregate against the unvaccinated. I can enter Valley Medical unvaccinated with a regular mask, but not as a worker. There are many other county buildings I can enter. I can enter the same as a customer, but not as a worker. So what exactly are your mandates accomplishing? I can enter crowded malls unvaccinated, unmasked. I can attend crowded concerts, et cetera. So again, what are your mandates accomplishing other than to discriminate and segregate against unvaccinated workers? Why do you conti continue to discriminate and segregate? You haven't answered this question. With all the confusion and, and contradictions that have come out in the board meetings, in the media, in politics, I read an article about the Bible verse, Corinthians 14.33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. It says, God never contradicts himself. He never has to go back and apologize because he misspoke. His agenda is truth, pure and simple. Thank you. Our next speaker is Serene Decora. Please go ahead. Serene, you'll have to click once to turn your microphone on. There you are. Good morning. This is Serene Decora, owner and operator of the Family Recreation Facility at the Fairgrounds. I spoke yesterday. However, I want to go over a few key points we would like this board to consider regarding our existence at the Fairgrounds. We understand the county is working to negotiate terms with companies such as the earthquakes and possibly sports like cricket to the Fairgrounds for ultimate use by the public. We support this, but the, the reality is this is years away from being built and available to the public. The FMC management and the FMC board seem to not understand the value of the business we have operated on the property since January of 2003. They have decided that discussing our future behind closed doors and not even including us or giving the public an opportunity to hear their thoughts is okay. I'm here today to say that is not okay and should not be acceptable to any of you that the only recreation currently operating on the fairgrounds is being pushed out by the exact people who claim to be bringing recreation to the property. Here is the fact, yes, soccer is great and so is cricket, but what we offer does not just benefit people with interest in those things, those actual same users need and want the type of facility that we have and are some of our biggest user groups. We rarely host soccer teams, football teams, hockey teams, water polo, dance teams, company teams from every age group, from every, from elementary to college, from Silicon Valley techs to the firemen and construction workers. You get it, right? We serve everybody, every demographic, every age group, every interest group. This is what makes us unique. This is why we are beloved, beloved in this community. We are where the specific interest groups come to do something different, to celebrate and have an exciting challenge, to engage coworkers and team teammates. So the question is not, do we fit the purpose of the fairgrounds? Of course we do. We are the only thing currently fulfilling its purpose. We're the only tenants, rain or shine, that serve the community week in and week out. So I hope you've read some of the emails that are heartfelt and that were written for your purpose. So I'm here today to ask you to speak to your board member, to implore them to renew our lease at a reasonable rate, to give us an opportunity to have a few more months until we relocate to a new county. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Decora. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Good morning. This morning was very motivational and inspirational and all of you do so many great things to the public. That's why I'm surprised we have to deal with this almost every year. Do you remember what happened many years ago? Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Wasserman, Supervisor Sweeney, and I think was there as well. When this first came up to get rid of paintball, there was such an outcry that we filled the chambers and the overflow chambers with people. Do you remember that? Well, the people do, and now there's more. Last year was no different with the media and thousands of emails, which I hope you received. We had them all go to an FMC board meeting where there were so many people for public comment that it was shut down. They weren't allowed to speak. I didn't even know if that was legal. 
Well, maybe we should just have them come to one of these meetings for public comment here instead. So you can see for yourselves, did you see the five-star reviews, the emails, the youth groups and parents from companies? Of course, well, the kids, I'm not gonna lie, it even made me cry. Or did your assistants just press delete? Or perhaps I should talk in an English accent like a gecko to get your attention. Well, here's some more facts, all right? I won't bore you with that, but the permits that we've been trying to and keep trying to get, well, we have the same structures as the COVID vaccination sites, the trailers, the containers, the porta potties, not by choice, by the way. And I'm right now looking at our Santa Clara Development of Environmental Health Permit dated till 9 30 23. Raising our rent for the past five years, except COVID, will bring our rent up to $50,000 a month in January for a piece of dirt. We are so different, so unique. During COVID, we were the only thing that was open to the public. Thanks to our governor, we had 400 people a day. We're the only tenant that fulfilled the charter of family recreation and get kids outside off those darn screens and computer games. There is no other paintball park to go to. There is recreational sports fields all over and we can use more, especially in this county, but there are no other paintball fields. Please talk to your FMC board member so that we don't have to go to the community and put them through this again. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Uh, yes, good morning, uh, supervisors. This is Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I would like to point out something uh, important about the CalWORKs presentation, is that the lady that was presenting stated that, what would you like the children of the future to, when they look back on, to, to, to see what, what kind of wisdom would you like to convey to the future? And I think that's very important. I'm very, very proud to announce to the County of Santa Clara and the citizens of Santa Clara County, that the building that produced the first issue of Lowrider Magazine, which was an articulation of the creative and uh, the creative genius of the Chicano community, now has historical landmark status in the city of San Jose. It's located on Willow Street. Also, Sacred Heart Church, because of the work of Father Anthony Soto, who is the founder of both CET and Guadalupe Church, now has historical landmark status because of the work of PAC and the work of Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. It is those two spaces and places where the Chicano movement was articulated to all of these barrios that were experiencing the political, social, and economic conditions that relegated us and sentenced us. And it was a sentence. To some of us, it was a death sentence via poverty, generational poverty. And so while I applaud the efforts of CalWORKs in order to ameliorate and to amend some of these issues that we've condemned with, however, for every single success, there's at least a thousand, a thousand people that continue to experience those generational impacts. In particular, the Chicano community. A Chicano is a very distinct part of San Jose and Santa Clara County's community. So when we're talking about the preservation of history, I think we need to think about the buildings and spaces and places where it was created. Our next speaker is Galaxy A13 5G. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute and please go ahead. Good morning, supervisors. This is Sharon Lee, and I am a volunteer with the San Martin Neighborhood Association. We do a lot of different things for our community to ensure their voices are heard. Supervisors, why does it take multiple years to get traffic issues even discussed? Why does it take years to deal with loud for profit parties in our neighborhoods? Why, when project approved, there is no one who is being built? Why is it left up to residents to complain and write letters and appear before the board exhausted and frustrated? Why does it take six years of attempts to change bylaws of the SIMPAC committee? that only wants to help residents deal with the issues that I have addressed and sewage flowing over their properties. The stench even today is awful. These are just a few of our ongoing issues. You are excited to bring the micro kitchens into Santa Clara County when you can't even deal with illegal vendors and now and traffic we have now. On Sunday, I stood outside of Foothill Avenue and counted 100 speeding cars down the road. I cannot even get out of my driveway at 6 a.m. 
these are country roads. Let's clean up Santa Clara County first, hit the brakes and address concerns and move forward. Make everybody accountable and accountable for taxpayer dollars you have spent out. My volunteer work does not stop at 5 p.m. I am often up until 2 a.m. in the morning, writing letters and doing what those get paid to do. Let's work together and start making a difference for all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Lopez. Please go ahead. Christina, you'll have to, there you go. Hi, good morning. It's difficult to breathe with the N95 mask on for eight hours a day. Please stop discriminating against unvaccinated employees. Please align with California state that requires all employees are allowed to wear the surgical mask and be treated equally. Please stop only testing unvaccinated employees and please stop segregating. In 2020, nobody was forced to wear an N95 mask and we were able to work safely. Please change that policy. Please rescind it. Please help the Santa Clara County employees. These are the only employees that are being forced to wear the N95 mask. It's unfair. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more, two more. Our next speaker is a phone number ending in 923. Please go ahead. And you're still muted. Let's go to there the next go. one. Yeah. Oh, good. Phone just came up. Oh, hi, this is Connie Ludwig. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Well, thank you. Thank you um, for hosting uh, the meeting today. Um, I wanted to um, um, mention that um, SAMPAC in San Jose has requested since 2016 to update the bylaws and um, and seems like an awful long time. And I know that since that time, other um, uh, organizations have um, had their requests addressed and so I'd like to ask that you put that on your agenda. Um, it just doesn't seem right to ask uh, people to be a, a committee to um, give recommendations and comments if they're not going to be heard. Um, secondly, I'd like to quickly mention the SB9. Um, I'd like to ask that the county write a letter to the state. Um, there's a discrepancy over the way the, the state views San Martin, considering it to be urban whereas the county is considering it um, rural. And um, it's very important because we just don't have the infrastructure for all the housing. Um, we're already impacted with the traffic and I understand that there are traffic studies being um, undergone right now. But um, anyway, I thank you for your time and um, have a good day. Thank you. Next speaker is Irvish. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Thank you very much to the Board of Supervisors uh, and uh, respective staff, as well as uh, uh, respective staff, as well as the county clerk. I wanted to, as we are uh, about to march towards the end of the year, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the efforts that's been carried out throughout the year uh, by the county Board of Supervisors and as well as the respective staff. I also wanted to acknowledge the amount of work that has been carried out. And as we as we are approaching toward the next year and going further, uh, I expect and foresee to see a lot many improvements, a lot many aspects and a lot many factors uh, to be involved and as well as engaging the county uh, to, uh, to provide towards a better uh, governance as well as the establishing the, the notion of what it takes to uh, provide the provide the good governance service. So thank you very much for the consideration of comments. And as, again, I wanted, to, I wanted to thank you all, uh, all the Board of Supervisors for allowing the pleasure to speak. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. And thank you, Jess. We now move on to item number eight, which is approval of the consent calendar and change to the Board of Supervisors agenda. Jess, why don't you take a deep breath and read us what's been posted, and then we can make our comments after that. Okay. And excuse me one second. Anyone wishing uh, to speak on consent items, please register electronically. Go ahead, Jess. 
We have a request from President Wasserman and Vice President Ellenberg to consider item numbers 27, 23, and 24 after item number 13. Item number 13 is to ratify November 1st, 2022 agreement between the County of Santa Clara and James R. Williams regarding his appointment as County Executive upon the vacancy of the position of County Executive. Item number 27 is to receive report relating to mental health facility planning. Item number 23 is to consider recommendations relating to the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Facility and Behavioral Health Services Center. Item number 24 is to receive report relating to tenant improvements at 650 South Bascom Avenue, San Jose. We have a request from President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg, and Supervisor Lee to consider item numbers 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 concurrently. Item number 16 is to receive report relating to the establishment of the Sheriff's Protective Services Officer Classification and Implementation Plan. Item number 17 is to approve job specification and amend classification plan to add classification of Sheriff's Protective Services Officer. Item number 18 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.23.40, an ordinance amending the Santa Clara County Salary Ordinance number NS-5.23, relating to compensation of employees deleting one protective services officer position in the county library district and 11 protective services officer positions in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and adding 75 sheriff's protective services officer positions in the office of the sheriff and amending the salary schedule to add the classification of sheriff's protective services officer and adding footnote number 873 to delete protective services officer and supervising protective services officer positions one year after becoming vacant. Item number 19 is to consider recommendations relating to the management structure of the new Office of the Sheriff Protective Services Division. Item number 20 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.23.58, an ordinance amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.23, relating to compensation of employees, adding one sheriff's lieutenant position and four sheriff's sergeant positions in the office of the sheriff. There is a correction to item number three, 23. The, the item should read as follows. Consider recommendations relating to the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Facility and Behavioral Health Services Center. Project number 263-CP19008. Corrected to reflect a construction time of 1,065 calendar days rather than 807 calendar days. <clears throat> we have a request from administration to hold item number 31 to December 13th, 2022. Item number 31 is to receive report relating to the status of the timeline for county hospitals to implement the drug facilitated sexual assault evidence collection protocol and a list of all private sector hospitals contracted by the county, including the associated responses to the sexual assault forensic examination program, loss of awareness slash consciousness protocol. We have a request from administration to hold item number 32 to December 6, 2022. Item number 32 is to receive report relating to a mechanism to track wait times, wait list, bed occupancy, and individuals for social detoxification. We have a request from administration to hold item number 33 to January 2023. Item number 33 is to receive report relating to a guaranteed basic income pilot program for unhoused high school students. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 78 from the consent calendar to be considered concurrently with item number 26. Item number 26 is to receive report relating to the prog to progress of the food system work plan and funding options for food assistance by community-based organizations. Item number 78 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 45, $121,713, increasing revenue and expenditures in the Consumer and Environmental Protection Agency budget relating to the implementation of Senate Bill 1383. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 81 from the consent calendar. Item number 81 is to adopt resolution certifying the former San Jose City Hall Project Environmental Impact Report, making the required California Environmental Quality Act findings, 
adopting a mitigation and monitoring and reporting program, approving a landmark alteration permit, and approving the former San Jose City Hall project at 801 North First Street, San Jose. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 83 from the consent calendar to be considered concurrently with item number 14. Item number 14 is to consider recommendations relating to the Valley Homeless Health Care Program. Item number 83 is to consider recommendations relating to leased office space at 2111 Little Orchard Street, San Jose. And that concludes my summary. Thank you, Jess. Well done. I'm going to turn to Supervisor Chavez first, then Lee, then Ellen Brooke. Thank you, um, colleagues. What I'd like to ask is if we can move item 28. This is the agreement for our Title IX audit to consent, and I will make a couple of comments relative to that. And item 29, um, and this is the uh, resolution and recommendations relating to the, uh, the attacks um, in Iran on women in that community. If my colleagues um, are comfortable with that on Title uh, on title, I'm sorry, on action item 28 on title nine. Um, this is a referral that was actually directed um, in 2020 from Supervisor Cortezzi. I'm very excited about this finally um, moving forward. I do want to thank the community for their patience and the staff for their diligence in working through this. I'm very excited about getting it moving forward. I see that there is a work plan that the staff has available. And I'd like to recommend as part of this action that that work plan uh, be discussed at Children's Family Seniors Committee early next year. And again, thank you to, to all of our community leaders who advocated for that. Item 29, um, this is an item that uh, was brought forward by Supervisor um, Otto Lee and myself. And I want to say to the staff that I appreciate working with the community advocates on this, and I'd like to um, move the adoption to condemn violence against women and children and the attacks on protesters in Iran. The murder of, you know, Masa Amini was not just a shocking act of violence, but the continued violence against women and girls and the use of rape as a weapon is something that should not be tolerated anywhere and this resolution will serve to support them in their fight for basic human rights and autonomy and to condemn the actions of the Iranian government that took the life of one young woman but many many more our our um and I, I do just again want to say how much I appreciate that the county is willing to stand up for women no matter and children no matter where they are in the world those would be my additions to these thank you supervisor Chavez Thank Supervisor you. Lee. Yes, thank you. I certainly echo the uh, comments of uh, Supervisor Chavez on especially item number uh, 28 regarding the uh, the atrocities that we're now seeing in Iran. And I'm glad that this hopefully my uh, this will go through consent and be approved by our colleagues. Um, on item number 23, there's a cor cor uh, correction on the construction time for the uh, Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Facility Behavior Health Services Center. Uh, when I first read it, AO seven days, I was like, hmm, that looks great. That's like better than we expected but <laughs> since I was a typo of 1065. Well, I'm going to say let's do our best to see if we could lower it to closer to 807 than 1065. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, and um, and before adopting the agenda, I actually do have a comment later, but I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody make the comments first on this. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that number was strange and 35 months more realistic. And I hope your request that it's done much sooner is fulfilled. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. I, I don't have any changes uh, to recommend, uh, but I just want to sunshine for my colleagues and the board uh, that, uh, and the, the public that I will be absent for a portion of this meeting as I'm currently attending the annual uh, California State Association of Counties annual conference. Uh, since joining the Board of Supervisors, I've had the privilege of being our county's representative to CSAC, working to ensure that our county's voice is heard in partnership with colleagues up and down the state whenever there is a need for advocacy of interest to counties. I'm particularly proud that our county has been able to do some very strong work using utilizing CSAC's resources on broadband homelessness and behavioral health issues. And 
while I regret that the conference overlaps with today's board meeting, I am hopeful that we can get through the bulk of the agenda before I need to leave at 1.30 to fulfill those duties. Thank you. Thank you, I share that. Supervisor Lee. Yes, before adopting the agenda, I just want to make a, a brief comment uh, regarding the uh, World Diabetes Day that was yesterday, November 14th, and that November actually is the National Diabetes Awareness, Awareness Month. One in 10 adults worldwide are currently living with diabetes, and that affects approximately 37 million people in the United States. Approximately 45% of adults with diabetes are undiagnosed, and over four in five of those live in low and middle income countries. So I just want to do a shout out of diabetes awareness, and please talk to a doctor about diabetes testing, care and education. And testing is really important because when I did my test, I certainly thought I was a healthy person running uh, uh, frequently and li uh, live a very healthy life. And did I find out I am now the pre-diabetes by one point. So this can happen to anybody. I just want to make sure that this gets out there. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Jess, I'll turn to you. Looks like we have uh, one speaker. Two minutes? Yes. We'll bring up a two minute timer. Our first speaker is Ian. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Ian, you'll need, there you go. Hi, I'm not sure that I'm doing the right thing. I wanted to speak about the proposals for the PSOs. Is that, is it the correct time? Uh, hold on. Uh, We'll have regular agenda items. Those will be heard concurrently, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's and then we, then we can raise our hands? Yes. Correct. Oh, good. That will clarify for everybody else as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One more speaker, perhaps, Jess? No, you're gone. Nope, okay. So we have, I need, I'll make. A motion to approve the consent calendar with the changes that Supervisor Chavez added in. Do I have a I'll second? second? Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Stavidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you. We're now turning to item number nine. I'm going to turn to our director of the Department of Planning and Development. Development, Jacqueline Onciano. The uh, subject matter is a public hearing for Senate Bill 9, Ordinance Amendments. Good morning, President Wasserman, board members, Jacqueline Onciano, Director of Planning and Development. With me today is Associate Planner Robert Kane, Principal Planner Burdat Singh, Planning, um, Planning Manager Lisa McKyle, and we have County Council with us today. The, Item will be presented by Robert Kane, and I'd like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Kane. Robert? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director. Thank you, President Wasserman, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Robert Kane, and I'm an Associate Planner in the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, the purpose of today's uh, presentation is to provide information on the proposed ordinance amendments to implement Senate Bill 9 in the unincorporated county. I'll begin with a brief overview of Senate Bill 9. Uh, it's one of over 30 new housing laws signed by the governor in 2021, one of several specifically addressing the housing crisis. Senate Bill 9 addresses housing density, streamlined approvals, and objective development standards. The intent of the law is to allow denser residential development in urban areas. It requires jurisdictions to approve two unit development and subdivisions on qualifying parcels in urban single family residential zones without a discretionary review or public hearing. An SB9 project could include one single family residence and one urban primary unit plus one ADU and one junior ADU on an existing lot or a single family residence and one additional unit on each lot after an urban lot split. Mr. Kane, I'm gonna interrupt just for one minute. Sure. Um, since we are losing vice president at one o'clock today, and we're not gonna have lunch until one o'clock today, and we have a 300 page report that sure. we received previously, I would just ask you to limit your comments and be available for questions. Certainly. 
Okay. So, um, Robert, um, just give a real brief yes. close and then <laughs> closure, and then uh, say I'm available for comments. That's what President Wasserman, I'm sorry, Jacqueline Anshano through the chair, that's what President Wasserman is asking you. So yes. if you can just summarize very briefly and then say I'm available for comments, that would be great. Certainly. Thank you. Today, staff is asking you that to affirm the amendments uh, are exempt from CEQA. We're asking you to adopt uh, amendments to the subdivision ordinance. Uh, we're recommending that you do so, including an exemption for SB9 projects under the inclusionary housing ordinance as seen in attachment A3. Um, alternatively, the board could adopt uh, attachment A1, which does not include that exemption for inclusionary housing. And that we're asking you to adopt amendments to the zoning ordinance uh, to allow the creation of a new class of urban primary units, which includes a maximum square footage of 1600 square feet for those units, as well as other design standards and objective standards that are allowed under the state law. So with that, uh, I'm available for further questions as are a number of our other staff members. Thank you, Mr. Kane. And that was faster than I had intended, but I appreciate you going to that summary. I'll turn to Supervisor Chavez first. We don't have any speakers at this point. Thank you. I'm, I do want to say thank you to the staff for all the incredible work. There were two um, areas that I just wanted you to take a couple minutes to, to sunshine. And one is the issue of how we discern something to be urban versus rural relative to the um, state law. And then the second is the distinction between the the utilization of inclusionary housing as a component of SB9 just to both to put it on the record but also so I'm clear that so I'm clear that I'm clear thank you thank you Mr. King uh, through the chair let me share um, another screen with you so uh, under SB9 the state chose to identify urban areas based on your U.S. Census Bureau designations. For unincorporated areas, it's defined as any parcel that is completely within an urbanized area or urban cluster. Um, the county does not independently determine if an area is urban or not. Um, and because the state law bases it on the U.S. Census Bureau, those areas could change whenever the U.S. Census Bureau makes a change, such as every 10 years when they do the census cycle or would they redefine their definitions. Um, so that is the basis for what is urban or what is not urban in the state law. And so just as if I could follow up on that, yes. Mr. Kane, um, sure. just so I, does that mean that all the designations that you're putting forward are, are based and rooted in that in that um, information, meaning that we can't change that definition unless we're actively engaged with the Census Bureau when they're going forward to make their recommendations. And the reason I ask is that it appears that some of our land use strategies are opposite of what what we're trying, what's what SB9 is going to, how it's going to impact areas that we've been trying to protect. Uh, absolutely. Through the chair, I, I think that there might be two ways forward. One is is to work with the Census Bureau, perhaps, but another would be to work with the state legislature um, and, and ask them to modify their, the definition in state law. Um, we, we're doing our best to continue to preserve the areas that we consider to be um, resource areas. Uh, for example, uh, Senate Bill 9 is only eligible in certain zones. It's it's written in the law to be eligible in single family residential zones. So agriculture and uh, ranch land zones. And we've also uh, cited that hillsides is also counts as one of those resource protection zones um, are excluded. Um, th the law also protects areas that have prime farmland um, on on site and provides other uh, language that allows us to look at septic capacity as well. So there are some tools that, that we'll definitely be using to try to protect these areas, um, but we can't flat out rule out areas such as San Martin 
um, the way that Senate Bill 9 is currently written. Thank you. That's helpful and and troubling because I, I do think that these, you know, we have two definite um, issues that are conflicting. And I what I had thought was that SB9 was intended really to be focused on urban areas, but it's going to allow for green field development and, and probably not just here, but across the state. Um, and then my second question is, could you just talk a little bit about why inclusionary zoning was um, absent from from this from SB9? Sure. So uh, what we understand um, from uh, talking to, I apologize, talking to HCD and reading what they've published is the state sees SB9 as an opportunity for individual property owners to add to housing inventory throughout the state um, and not as a residential development project. Um, they have been skeptical, uh, I guess is, a, is the right word for certain jurisdictions that have tried to put additional inclusionary housing requirements on SB9 development um, and seeing those as uh, a way to limit SB9 use by placing um, unreasonable economic burdens on these individual property owners as they try to develop. Um, we, we believe that because we have an existing ordinance that isn't specific to SB9 development, we uh, right now we would apply that when it matches our existing inclusionary housing ordinance. Uh, but we see these developments as similar to an ADU or junior ADU. This is an additional unit on an existing lot um, that may be used for uh, other family members. It may be rented out um, up to the individual owner, but we exempt ADUs and junior ADUs from our inclusionary housing ordinance already. Um, and so that's why we're recommending that we also exempt SB9 projects from inclusionary housing. These are meant to be additional smaller units that are, by their nature, uh, perhaps more affordable than um, a single family residence on its own lot might be. Uh, and I think that's how the state looks at it. And that's how, why we're recommending um, the exemption into the inclusionary housing ordinance. So, Mr. Kane, essentially we're being consistent with the way we're applying our own rules now, and that's not a violet, and therefore it's not a conflict in our policies. Correct. Okay. I, I would agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. And then on um, and then I apologize, you sparked another question for me in that explanation. And that is, um, are we capping the um the number of units? Um, that can be built on these properties. And I'm asking that because, and I apologize if that's in the report, I just want to make sure I understand what the limits are to what to what we're it, to how we're applying SB9 and whether or not we're being restrictive in those limits. And colleagues, the reason I'm asking that is you all know I'm very pro building housing of, along all affordability. Uh, uh, you know, along the affordability continuum, but I am concerned about, again, the agricultural and um, sp agricultural issues. And I'm also, frankly, concerned about water issues, because as you all know, South County is the the filtration center for our, our healthy, clean water in our community. Through the chair, uh, under the state law, you can have two primary units on a lot if you're not subdividing it. And then plus uh, ADUs, and, and our ordinance makes it clear that you get the two, you get the single family residence, a second primary unit, one ADU and one junior ADU. If you split the lot, the law states that jurisdictions are not required to approve more than two total units on each lot after the split. Um, and so in our proposed ordinance, we make it clear that each lot could have a single family residence and one other unit of any type. Um, uh, in addition to that, we are also concerned about water quality and water availability in places that are not on um, on piped water, uh, especially. And, and there are requirements within our review for additional units and for subdivisions that require applicants to show that they have access to sufficient water and have the capability for sub sufficient uh, septic if that's required. Uh, 
there is also a provision in the state law that allows the building official to make a determination that a project has uh, severe impacts to the environment that cannot be mitigated for that we can review on a case by case basis. Thank you that that so what I'm understanding is that we're taking the most rest restrictive for lack of a better word approach on this and in part to protect the the lands that we're responsible for. I agree through the chair. I, I think that's the case. It's also why we're yes. proposing the 1600 square foot cap for the second unit. So that way we're, we're limiting what the development is. So we're not uh, having people build to 10,000 square foot homes on a property in the South County that would require much more water um, and resource consumption uh, than these smaller units that would allow people to have additional development on their property. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Smillian. Thank you. I um, excuse me, Supervisor. Just for the record, we will open and close the public hearing after the supervisors have spoken. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. All right. Well, I will hold off on a motion until after we've heard from members of the public, if there are any members of the public who wish to speak. Uh, but I do have some uh, inclinations that prompt some questions. So let me go to uh, Mr. Kane and or his colleagues. Um, uh, Mr. Kane, um, my understanding is that there's a uh, requirement uh, for a an affidavit uh, that provides some assurance that the three-year primary residency will be on the site. Do I have that right? Through the chair, that's correct. Uh, and two questions. Um, what, if anything, do we do to ensure that that's for real? And the second question is, and if it's not, what's the penalty for violating the affidavit? Through the chair, I think I should defer that to County Council. Thank you. Thank you, James. Through the chair, I believe we have Lizanne Reynolds uh, through County Council. Thank you. Sure. Welcome, Lizanne. Yes, the, the law isn't clear as to the enforcement mechanism for that, but presumably the county would, uh, you know, cite, notify the the owner uh, that they're in violation of the restrictive um, you know, residency requirement. I, I will note that it's three years from the approval of the urban lot, lot split, not construction of a home or, or finalization of anything. So it is fairly limited given how long it takes to get things built. Uh, nevertheless, that's what state law requires. Um, but you know, we would contact the owner and inform them that they are uh, in violation of the restrictive covenant. And you know, if they do not um, comply, we would pursue our enforcement remedies, which might be some kind of you know administrative process or it ultimately civil court. Well, Ms. Reynolds, thank you. That's that's helpful. I guess what I'd say is that's helpful, but disappointing. Um, I, you know, I think um, given the controversy around the legislation, it's important that the assurances provided by the legislation be real. And I hear you loud and clear that there are some limitations based on the way the legislation is structured. But I think it's going to fall to our county to make sure that whatever the law provides is, in fact, uh, what's happening on the ground. Um, so uh, I, I guess my question is for planning is and, and for county council is, you know, is there any way that uh, we're going to be aware of the fact that someone's in violation of the three-year requirement other than on a complaint basis. Let's start there through the chair. Yeah, uh, so this is Lizanne. I can, uh, yes. you know, I can defer to staff if they want to chime in, but, you know, our, our code enforcement system is a complaint-based system currently uh, that it doesn't have to be that way. We could be <sighs> more um, proactive um, if that's the desire. So I, you know, I'll leave, leave it to staff to respond. 
If I may, through the chair, Jacqueline yes. Anciano, Director of Planning and Development. We are developing right now a system within our Excella system to have a notifications, automatic notifications. Um, we're working on that system right now to have automatic notifications when we have um, this need within our department because we have it in other areas to, and we're trying to do this 60 days before there's an expiration that a notification would come forward and that it's automated. It's what we're working um, through um, with our Excella program. And through the president, uh, Wasserman, Lisa McKyle, deputy director with planning services, uh, our SB9 projects that are coming through the county, they're specifically identified through the Excella program that uh, director Anshano was noting. So we are able to track SB9 specific projects uh, and through the notifications that Ms. Anshano um, provided, we, we, we could potentially do follow up um, with those and inspections with those uh, specific applications and properties, if desired by the board. Thank you. And through the chair, just to confirm, uh, the Excella program is what uh, is sometimes colloquially referred to as a tickler system. No, if I may, through the chair, um, Thank you. Yes. director on channel, it is our permitting process system. Uh, it's the system that we use to issue our permits, to track our permits, it took the place of FileMaker Pro. It is the program that runs our department. And um, it this um, automatic notification that I spoke to is what we are currently um, working with the Excella vendor to implement. So it is our desire where we have permits, um, and this is our, our intent, that have expirations and that have um, that need monitoring that we are using this system in this manner so that we are more efficient and responsive and in assisting the public um, so that they are aware early on of an expiration date of, of that type. Yeah, Ms. Uh, excuse that inarticulate utterance, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, yes. but uh, Ms. Anshano, I, I am thinking here when you said 60 days before expiration, um, you know, the requirement to, to maintain a primary residence on site, as I understand it, Ms. Reynolds, please correct me if I'm wrong, is continuous for the three-year period, yes? Yes, that is correct. Three years from appro the approval date. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be unrealistic. I don't think somebody's going to be, you know, out knocking on uh, a homeowner's door every day for 365 days a year, three years in a row. On the other hand, you know, a one-time check-in 60 days before expiration strikes me as perhaps uh, inadequate to the task. And uh, again, I'm just, I'm trying, if we're going to end up approving something today, which I understand we need to do, uh, I, I want to make sure that it's real and rigorous to the extent that we possibly can, uh, because I don't want to be sending the message that this three-year requirement is, um, you know, something that people uh, sign an affidavit with a wink and a nod, and nobody really cares, nobody pays attention, and nobody enforces. So, which gets me to the enforcement piece of this question, which is, Ms. Reynolds, I, I didn't really hear what the consequences would be if somebody doesn't really use this as their primary residence. Do they, you know, I mean, if they've managed to game the system for two years and they they've got you know another unit or two or three built uh do we just say you know shame on you or at the other end of the continuum say take them down or what's i mean i'm i because absent some clarity about what the consequences are I, i'm not inclined to think that this provision would serve as a real deterrent uh in terms of folks uh flouting the law well, we have we have um, our administrative civil civil penalties um, pursuant to our ordinance code, and we could also seek um, a, an injunctive relief from a court, which I think is where you're heading. That we really want the owner to live there. Um, obviously, money talks. So if we hit them with penalties, and those penalties keep accruing every day, at some point the owner would have to decide whether it's worth it to continue incurring the penalties, or you know, or just move back into the unit. Okay, 
Um, let me move on from that and ask a, another question that deals with uh, issues of notice. Uh, as I understand it, the proposed ordinance does not actually require notice to surrounding property owners, uh, presumably because the approvals are ministerial, so there's not a quasi-judicial hearing for folks to participate in. Do I understand it correctly and do I understand the rationale or is there a different rationale that I'm not imagining? But through the chair, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, here's here's what I'd like to raise as a possibility. And if staff has a concern with it, please tell me, is there any reason we couldn't require notice anyway, consistent with our current notice requirements, um, just so people know what's happening and also, frankly, to facilitate uh, some conversations between neighbors? I think, um, you know, I know staff is probably thought this through but i mean you're gonna have some unhappy folks about changes in their neighborhoods and the only thing worse than being told and no there's nobody you can talk to and there's no place you can go to appeal this would be to have it sprung on them wholly unaware and you know maybe there's an opportunity with a conversation before somebody gets too far down the development path to talk about site concerns, design concerns, uh, you know, those are conversations that I would think we would want to encourage and facilitate. Any reason we couldn't just say, you know, we're going to do required notice, uh, even though it's a ministerial action? There's some disagreement <laughs> um, uh, among uh, staff about whether the state would challenge us on that, uh, on that issue. So I, th I think we, we, that's a, a gray area. And, and please understand uh, both staff and Ms. Reynolds and the kind of counsel's office, my next remark is not directed at you. It's like, I, I, I'm prepared to let the state challenge us on providing more information to the public about what happens in their neighborhoods. If the state wants to make an issue on that point, I'm okay with that. I, I don't wanna get too testy here, but uh, I understand the concern, but, um, you know, if we're going to create uh, an acceptance out there in the community for additional housing development, then treating the community right, which includes notice of what's happening in their neighborhoods, is a necessary precondition to generating that, uh, that acceptance. And um, as I say, if that's an area where the state wants to... Uh, draw a red line, uh, good luck with that. Uh, I, I think I'm pretty clear about where I am on that one. Um, the, uh, there was a, there was a, um, some indication from some members of the public that uh, there was a concern about short-term rentals. I believe the ordinance currently uh, says that, um, the units can't be used for short-term rentals at 30 days or less. Do I have that right, staff? Sure, that's correct. They, they can't be rented for less than 30 days. They need to be at least a, a month, a month lease. Um, what if we said 180 days? Any anything in the law that precludes that? Back to Lizzie. Yeah. Um. I. I'm on the fence with that. I have to admit. Reynolds. Here's here's my thinking. the The goal here is to create housing. Now, you know, I know there were folks on both sides of the debate. Some thought this was a good tool, SB nine. Others thought it was not a good tool. But if the goal is to create housing, having people float in and out, creating vacation rentals, um, corporate uh, short term rentals, that's not a housing creation. That's a revenue maximization which is not what the purpose of SB9 was. And if we really wanna create housing for people who are gonna live in the community, um, you know, letting folks roll over every 30 days is not the way to do it. So I'm gonna be pushing for 180 days as a minimum term here um, in, uh, in a moment. And I'm gonna be pushing for noticing as well. And then, uh, and I'm gonna, be pushing that uh, primary occupancy be 
something that is seriously addressed, both in terms of communication to applicants and in terms of enforcement. And then uh, the last thing I would ask is, is there any reason this couldn't all come back to uh, the board in uh, 2025 uh, to with a report back uh, on uh, the impact of whatever ordinance we adopt today? Because I do think to the point that I think uh, Ms. Reynolds made earlier, you know, it's going to take a couple of years for projects to go through the pipeline and get built. But I think once that happens, uh, it's incumbent on our county to take a look at what the real impacts on the ground have been and to make adjustments as called for. Okay. Staff, is that through the chair, if I may? Is that fine coming back in a couple of years, staff? If I may, through the chair, Jacqueline Unshannel, Director of Planning and Development. Yes. Um, Supervisor um, Simidian, I, I would like to come back before 2024 because I think it's important for us to report to the board um, not only the permits that are being processed through, but some of the comments we may be receiving from the neighborhoods, if that would be acceptable to the board. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, again, forgive that inarticulate utterance. Uh, um, I, I am, through the chair, I, I think an earlier report back is fine, but I also want to embed in our decision making today, the later report back in the year 2025, after there are results on the ground. So I think Ms. Anshano is wise to counsel an earlier check-in as well, but I don't want us checking in before we've got real facts on the ground to uh, illuminate and then think everything is fine. I want us to come back uh, again after there uh, are projects through the system and completed, and we all have an opportunity to step back and say, all right, how'd that work out? Because there's some things we may not do today that will be a source of disappointment to some in the debate. And um, some of those will be our best policy judgments. Some of those will be constraints of law. But uh, I think we owe it to everybody to come back in uh, a period of time when we can see it for real uh, and reassess what's happened. And not coincidentally, by 2025, uh, there will be three new board members sitting in uh, these seats and uh, probably important for them to um, take a look as well. Thank you. Those are all my points Thank and you. questions for the we'll moment. Back. I look forward to hearing from colleagues in the community. Yes, and we'll do that and come back to you for a motion. County Council uh, Reynolds, you had your hand up, then it went down. Are you good with the way Supervisor um, ended? I just wanted to add um, thanks to my colleague Elizabeth Pianca for quickly checking the statute. And the statute says that the the, the unit shall, term of rental shall be for a term um, longer than 30 days. So it could be for longer. It's okay. not just 30 days. We, we we'll, could have a longer period. We say we'll take that as yes for an answer. All right, supervisors, before I go back to you, I would like to open the public hearing. We have three speakers, Jess. And then we'll close the public hearing. Then we're going to go to Supervisor Lee for his comments, then Supervisor Chavez for her comments, and then back to Supervisor Simidian for his motion. Thank you. Two minutes. Uh, yes. Climbed a little bit, we're at five. Yep. Our first speaker is Melissa. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you for taking my call. Good morning. Um, I'm just saying that whatever is already here that should be protected should always be protected. Like, um, I want to say protect Juristac no query on loose and sacred grounds. Um, I think it's important to, to protect and honor what's already here as well, whatever decisions y'all want to make. And of course, um, um, homeowners too should also. Picking up on us. I'm not missing. Well, yeah, I, I think she's through. Okay. Our next speaker is Sarah. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So um, I just wanted to mention that a lot of people I've noticed are talking about how SB9 has um, not taken into consideration the um, 
the stress on our infrastructure, and that is absolutely true. I'm 100% in favor of affordable housing, but this bill does not actually guarantee affordable, being the key word, housing. It just um, is opening the floodgates for people, not just like big developers, but just the average person to come in by the by a single family home, overbuild the area, and um, then just rent out Un, well, what should be considered um, unlivable space um, to whoever is willing to pay an outrageous amount of money for it. So um, we're looking, we need to really look at whether this is going to be just frivolous building, overbuilding of houses and um, and if whether it's going to affect because it has in my neighborhood negatively affected those of us who have lived here for over 30 years the quality of of, of living is ridiculously low now and then of course people um if there aren't any kind of guidelines or restrictions at the front end people out here have just been building and doing whatever they want to their properties without permits and then on the back end when they get uh notified that they need permits it's a simple matter of just throwing money at it to get the permit so that whatever they've done regardless of how it affects the neighborhood is just legal because they can afford to permit it so i'd like um for everyone to consider those talking points um and maybe bring it up to uh sacramento so that they can really understand that it's more than just building houses out here Thank you. Our next speaker is Galaxy A13. And unfortunately, there's an error. Galaxy, oh, here we go. Sharon, if that's you, you should be able to speak now. Thank you, Jess. Hello, everyone. This is Sharon Luna from the San Martin Neighborhood Association. And um, I wanted to just touch bases on um the clarification of the San Martin being urban uh instead of rural um we had um noticed this way back in August and we have been asking the planning department to challenge um this ruling um uh, because the legislation it stated that um the census was under um you know being reviewed and there could be a reversal on it and we asked the planning department we thought a letter was already issued um when rob eastwood was uh with the planning department um but we found that no letter was issued so all we were asking is to see if a decision has been made um, by the state uh, in order to see if there was a reversal done before we start proceeding um, with any of um, the building. We support the efforts that the planning department has done, but what we need to do is to look and see if there's any reversal done, challenge the state in regard to what San Martin is all about, um, what the impact of this excessive lot subdivision would be on traffic, water usage, septic systems, etc. And that is what um, we have been requesting, and it hasn't been done to our knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vince. Please go ahead. Good morning. My name is Vince Rocha. I am the Vice President of Housing and Community Development with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. And I just want to remind the Board of Supervisors as you consider um, any policy implications around implementing SB9, two main issues. One is your housing element will be coming before the state uh, in January, and you want to make sure that you are helping facilitate housing development to the extent possible so that you are compliant with state law. We've seen that cities in Southern California that are not compliant will be subject to the builder's remedy, meaning that um, you can have unplanned development in your community if you do not have a compliant housing element. So let's ensure that we're creating policies to facilitate housing here with SB9. Second of all, groups like AARP and the Greenbelt Alliance endorsed SB9 when it was passed in the state legislature. 
because it actually is environmentally responsible to build two units where you had one. This isn't building on open space and open land. This is building with the existing urban infill infrastructure. Finally, I want to also mention that part of SB9 wasn't just about more housing. Yes, we are in a housing crisis. We have a shortage of over 3 million homes in our state. However, this is also about dismantling the legacy of redlining. The reason single family zoning even exists was to exclude people. The implementation of SB9 is about inclusiveness. It is about ensuring that we can make more equitable communities moving forward and that we will not continue the history of redlining in our county and our communities. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jasharo. Apologies if that's not your name, J-E-S-S-H-A-R-O. You'll click to accept your microphone. Hi, Please. this is uh, Jess Haro, not Jess uh -huh. <laughs> Just known as Jesse. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to spend these couple of minutes to talk about what is happening on our, on our street and it's happening in our neighborhoods. And it isn't a fancy neighborhood, it's a neighborhood of, um, you know, World War II generation, Korean War generation, where the seniors are passing away and uh, and folks are buying these homes and then filling them up to, to the gills with 14 to 16 people um, living in, in abusive conditions. Um, and then building is going on uh, up and down the street. And we're worried that this will continue as our seniors uh, pass away. and there's got to be something that that doesn't deteriorate our community and lead to the the serious parking issues that we have now, as well as um, opportunity crime increasing uh, over the past couple of years, as well as garbage because the number of people staying in these these facilities they certainly will generate more more garbage uh, than um, than they'll, they'll have available. Uh, speed is increasing. And I understand there was a law that just got passed at the state level that if you're within a half a mile, um, you know, you know, to a transit, uh, then the parking requirements will be even be lower. We we have given quite a bit for affordable housing. Pacific Properties is moving is creating down the street. Chari Catholic Charities is is creating their facility. There's another facility on Allen Rock. Um, we've got to look at the entire infrastructure when we're trying to solve this problem, because right now the, the quality of life is deteriorating in, in our middle middle class neighborhoods. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Deborah Paris, uh, and I'm a resident within the Burbank neighborhood. Um, I've specifically over the last three years um, been working with um, Gary Flagg and a number of folks within the planning department regarding um, one specific um, neighbor. Uh, and th the issues that we're having here are consistent with the issues that two previous speakers have pointed out. Um, between the changes on in the 2020 ADU uh, ordinance and what's being proposed today, um, there are um, no uh, verifications that these units are being used for um, 30 days or more. And again, 30 days is still a transient population. That is not um, a, a long-term housing situation. Um, there is also um, no confirmation that any of this is affordable. Um, for instance, the ADU next to me is renting for $3,800 a month, and that's a one bedroom, one bath. Um, this same property, I have tied it to five other properties within Santa Clara County um, that they have illegally modified the homes um, and are renting them out with multiple uh, Airbnbs. And unless they're turned in by a neighbor, and unless that risk for retaliation is taken by a neighbor, um, th there is no assurance that these properties are being used for the purpose uh, and the intent of, of this ordinance. So I ask that this not be passed, that this be delayed 
um, and provide neighbors with more opportunity to provide feedback. And that concludes our requests. Thank you very much, Jess. Okay, with that, I'm going to officially close the public hearing. I'm going to turn back to Supervisor Lee now, then Chavez, then back to Supervisor Simidian, who off, was going to offer up a motion, but I uh, wanted to offer other supervisors an opportunity to speak. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I, uh, I want to thank staff for a very comprehensive report on an extremely important uh, issue since housing is something that is so lacking in our community. Um, as we all know, the, the, before I make my comments, I just have a qu few questions for staff. First of all, um, right now, the way the law is written, and as uh, mentioned by uh, Supervisor Simidian, the uh, minimum number of days is only 30 days, correct? For this housing, uh, that is to be added? Mr. Chair, that, that's correct. The, the state law says that they shall not be rented for terms less than 30 days. And we've mirrored that in our local implementing ordinance. Right. And and right now, if let's say we want to increase it to 90 days, 180 days, uh, we can do that legally, correct? I, I defer to county council, but they've indicated that, that that is correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay, very good. Uh, I, I just want to confirm because certainly I think yes. that might be uh, usage of, uh, I, I think 30 days is uh, good, but certainly not long enough for uh, the short-term uh, issues that has been raised by Supervisor Sumerian. Uh, although, of course, at times there are folks who uh, come to work for a few months. Uh, for farm worker, for example, I could see that six months sometimes could be too long. So I just want to ask to see there might be a, a different number, that, but that would potentially uh, uh, yes. satisfy all these uh, concerns, number one. Second thing, my question is regarding the cap of the full area of the primary units. Uh, the current proposal says 1,600 square foot is a cap. Uh, I'm looking at the report. Uh, there is on page packet 180, um, you have listed the uh, uh, size of the various parcels ranging from about 1,200 square foot square feet to uh, 3,000 square feet, I think are the, are the uh, median uh, uh, floor area ratio of the of the of the square footage of these housing and i think it's kind of like cut the baby in half and is that how you came up to 1600 we came to through the chair we came to 1600 yes. looking at the number of um the size of the units that currently exist right on the various different uh zones the five primary zones that sb9 would be eligible in Right. And taking the median size of all of those homes uh, right. is is fifteen hundred uh, something uh, square feet, and we rounded that up to sixteen hundred as a reasonable size uh, for these units. Um, it's been a little bit controversial, uh, as you note in our report. We asked both SIMPAC and the Planning Commission to provide recommendation on that size. They all agreed that there should be a cap. Every every member, individual member, agreed that there should be a cap, but they could not agree on a consensus of what that cap should be. Um, we provided 1,600 because we think that that is reasonable. We think that 1,200, which is what the cap for ADU uh, is set by the state, would also be something else that would be defensible because we, we want to make sure that whatever we land on, we can explain to HCD as to why we reached that that limit instead of just picking an arbitrary number. And on the slide deck, it talks about alternative minimums ranging from 1,200 to 2,000 square feet has been proposed. So these are proposed by other jurisdiction that that's been approved. Is that correct? That was proposed by the Planning Commission. Oh, by the Planning Commission. Okay. Correct. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so today, obviously, we can select any numbers we want, but certainly we, if we re follow the recommendation of the Planning Commission, we should select numbers for anywhere between 1,200 to 2,000, uh, correct? That That is correct. Okay. Uh, right. Just a point of clarification to the yes. president. Mm -hmm. The Planning Commission did not uh, unanimously determine 1,200 to 2,000. They were unable to land on a square footage. Um, unanimously. So I just want to make sure that that's a uh, clarification provided. It's Thank not you. a recommendation by the planning commission as a body. 
And, right. and if I made through the chair, I saw yes. Lizanne's hand up. Lizanne, did you want to clarify? I think you're on mute, Lizanne. You're on mute. Sorry, my apologies. Um, the, the the way the law works is if there are changes that the board wants to make that were not previously considered by the planning commission, they have to be re-referred. That is not the case with the size limits because they did consider 1200 and 1600. So if you wanted to make it 1200, you could do that. As far as the uh, resident, the 30 day limit, that was not something that was before the planning commission. So that change would need to be re-referred to the planning commission before the zoning ordinance could be adopted. So I just wanted to clarify that if, if the board wants to make any proposed changes that were not previously considered, we would need to evaluate those to see whether they need to be re-referred back to the planning commission. I see. So you're saying if I propose 12 or 1600, we will not need to go back. How about if I propose 2000? Would that have to go back to planning? Uh, I I don't think that they specifically considered that size. I'm going to defer to Robert Kane because he is more familiar with the exact size issues that were vetted with the planning commission. Okay. Yeah, through the chair, they, they were there were two separate motions, um, one of which included a 2,000 square foot cap in certain zones and 1,200 in other zones. Um, none of the motions passed, although each motion that was presented, at least one of the replaying commissioner voted for at least one of the the, the measures motions, that, and each of the motions included caps. So they did vote on whether or not to have 2,000 in certain zones. Um, they, they just didn't reach a consensus, a majority consensus to, to pass any of the motions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and I just want to share my, my comments of, of what uh, this is about. So first of all, the goal of SB9, as we all know, is to lower the cost of housing by increasing the supply of housing right here in Silicon Valley and you know, so many places along the coast of California. Our cost of housing is not just too high. It's literally ridiculous. The most effective way to decrease pricing, of which besides having a massive earthquake, is to increase the supply. Uh, secret exemption is extremely important because, as the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. As a strong supporter of many green environmental efforts, I've also witnessed how CEQA, which was supposed to help to protect the environment, has been severely misused and abused for decades to allow frivolous lawsuits to slow down development and significantly increased cost of any construction projects that our housing is needing right this moment. And I'm just making a statement because this is an issue that I care a lot about. Uh, and I do see the, the lack of affordable housing that we have because of the fact that so much of our land cannot be used. And then infill housing, of course, is really one of the best way we can increase the supply of housing. And for that matter, I'm trying to make it more flexible. Uh, I, I certainly do agree with uh, 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 Supervisor Midian about the 30 day requirement seems to be a bit too low. And I think I'm, I'm agreeable to increase that number uh, to a greater number in order to protect the neighborhood so that we don't have people just coming in and out kind of like a and B and B's type situation. So I think something like around 90 days or something like that would be uh, uh, possible. But unfortunately, if that means they have to go back to planning, then then be it because I really do want to protect the neighborhoods as well. Second thing is regarding the size. I don't believe everybody would build very large houses, but at the same time, one of the things we are trying to do is to meet the character of the original house. Uh, if the character of house is anywhere from 1,200 to 3,000 is what we're looking at, uh, I, I see no reason why we cannot increase that uh, cap from 1,600 to something greater to 1,800, even 2,000. So those are the my, my view of this issue. I just want to share with my colleague, uh, and I, I would defer to Supervisor Median, uh, since he mentioned he wants to make the uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to say this very quickly because I have concrete sawing going on behind me. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I really appreciated hearing everybody's comments. Just a couple things that I wanted to raise. One is that I think it would be a value to have a comprehensive and transparent process and guidelines to addressing violations. I, I think um, Supervisor Samini and I concur with you that we have to be very sincere about our willingness to protect neighborhoods. And I think both um, Jess and another um, uh, speaker really talked about 
impacts we're already seeing right now in our community that we're not managing. And so I think um, one, I'd like to see that comprehensive plan come back, maybe to Hewlett, if the maker of the motion is amenable to that. Um, two, I think the issue relative to the Census Bureau and the approach that the, the county is going to be taking to identify what areas need to be protected in South County um, should also come back to Hewlett for a deep dive and a strategy around that. And Supervisor Samidi, and that may even be appropriate for the federal task force um, to discuss, because I, I do think it's an important element of our of our discussion. And then third is I just hearing people's concerns now the enforcement strategies that and the ability for people to complain when there's something happening and this high high level of fear of retribution is very real and i would like to hear the staff um not necessarily today but as part of the returning with a comprehensive and transparent process so that people know what to expect if they're making a violation that the the enforcement strategies that are protective of people who are making complaints be discussed in a more rigorous way so that we have something we can share with neighbors because more often than not, when we get complaints, people ask us not to complain for them. They want to tell us what's wrong, but they're very fearful of the of the repercussions. So if Supervisor Simidian, if you would consider those as part of any action you take, I would appreciate it. Um, the last thing, unless you wanted to respond to that, do you want a minute to think about that, Joe? Um, the last thing I just want to say to the speakers is this really wasn't intended for affordable housing. I know that. And I I think that what Supervisor Lee was saying about making sure there's enough housing available so eventually it starts to bring down cost is the big vision and dream. But this is not about affordability. And to Mr. Roach's comments, it's really even not about integration of neighborhoods. What we're seeing is that in um, moderate to low income communities, intensification of, of um, challenges with, you know, the quality of life. And in the first areas that have pulled permits to act on SB9 have been mostly, um, yeah. you know, mostly in affluent areas, building more um, non-affordable housing. So we, you know, there's a road to tow here to see whether or not SB9 uh, produces what it's what's it, its intentions were um, initially. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Suraj Sumitian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna, here's another uh, utterance there. Uh, I'm going to uh, resist the temptation to respond to some of the comments from uh, folks uh, who spoke uh, during public comment, just mindful of the time, uh, want to assure them I've heard uh, heard the comments, and in some cases I'll follow up offline. Um, I do think um, that uh, a number of good issues have been raised today, so I'm going to try a motion, see if I get a second, And uh, but I am noticing that we did not hear from Supervisor Ellenberg, I don't think has her hand up and I just want to make sure I'm not cutting her off sir yes sir I was just doing you as I had said the order before and supervisor vice president Ellenberg next but if you wish to defer to her at this moment uh, we will defer to her I do thank you vice president Ellenberg thank you very much I, I want to extend appreciation to my colleagues and to the public for your really thoughtful uh, comments on this issue. The, the Burbank neighborhood is 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 an unincorporated pocket. I'm glad that we had an opportunity to hear uh, from a Burbank resident. And, and I know with regard to um, code enforcement, uh, they, they're actually experiencing um, some issues there in getting responses. And, and I wonder if there might be a staffing issue as we have in so many of our other uh, departments that there there simply isn't the employee power right now to keep up uh, with concerns from residents. I see Jacqueline nodding, um, but I do really strongly prefer that we think about um, a a proactive or or timed enforcement mechanism rather than putting the burden on neighbors. I, I don't think it's fair um, 
to have a system where we put a law in place and then we depend on on neighbors to to point fingers and whether they're going to be retaliated against or not um it's still not an appropriate burden to to place on them so i i would appreciate some thought there and, and it sounds like part of that picture jacqueline is going to be simply having more person power to be able to do the enforcement uh with regard to supervisor Simidian's uh, uh comment uh, regarding a longer period of time, I think it's essential. I, I'm not interested in in 30 days at all, and I think 180 days, half a year, um, is is much more reasonable. You know, truly, a, a year even makes sense because, again, to your point, to the point that Joe made, we're not looking to provide um, income drivers. We are looking to provide housing for residents who truly want and, and need to be part of the, the neighborhoods. I understand, you know, unfortunately, this isn't necessarily an affordability uh, driver, other than to the extent that that massive amounts of new housing may, in theory, reduce prices here. We haven't seen it yet. Um, Supervisor Lee, I, I, I heard your comment and concern for uh, farm worker housing and maybe needing less than, than six months, but I'm not sure we're talking about the same populations. Um, here, I think that that's a real concern for farm worker housing. Um, if these units are not, uh, you know, affordable or subsidized in some way, this is not what they're going to be looking at um, at any rate. So I would be very comfortable with the with a six month um, a minimum. And to the the third point about square footage that a number of my colleagues raised, and and perhaps I didn't fully understand this in the report, and, and maybe Jacqueline or someone else can clarify for me, that the square footage, it, to me, seems that, that it should be dictated by a percentage of the lot rather than specific square footage, because 1,900 square feet may be minuscule on somebody's giant manor property. It may be overwhelming uh, in another neighborhood. So it, it, has there been consideration of setting minimum or maximum sizes for for square footage based on not square footage of the house, but proportions, percentage of the lot that could be covered? Jacqueline, Lisa. Sure, through President Wasserman. Thank you, Lisa McKyle, Deputy Director. Uh, one of the challenges, well, I'll first start with saying that the state law does provide for a minimum of an 800 square foot unit for this additional unit. So there is protection when you have a smaller lot and there's a 1200 square foot minimum of a parcel size. So um, we, we didn't have concerns with the 800 square feet. Now, there are some concerns when we, and, and some of the challenges that we face throughout the county, is there are varying parcel sizes. So you can have parcels that are hundreds of acres in size, one acre in size, or several thousand square feet. And uh, it becomes a challenge for the public to understand the code and how to implement it, as well as the staff in, in enforcing the codes. So we do believe that having a consistent square footage would, would uh, be the highest and best alternative in, in uh, applying SB9 due to the challenges that we have here at the county, it is such a vast area and there are so many varying parcel sizes. But if I may, so, through the chair, um, we did talk about a percentage. That was your question. Uh, amongst the staff, we did have that conversation. We did consider that um, as an option relative to the zonings that SB9 would apply to. And where we landed is at the recommendation that we have presented to the board. Thanks, Jacqueline. I, I am glad that it was considered. Um, Lisa, your comment actually made me feel even more strongly that it should be um, proportionate to the lot size, since, as you described, we do have such a huge variation. So it's interesting to me that the planning experts came down on the side of specific square footage of the units rather than um, the property size. But I'll, I'll defer to that because truly the, the bigger issue issues for me are the enforcement and the amount of time that that needs to be um, for which the property needs to be leased. Thank you all again very much. Uh, really good conversation here. Thank you. Back to Supervisor Simidian and Supervisor in our agenda. We've got um, items B and then being asked C or D as far as our need to affirm, adopt, and adopt. 
You have the floor, sir. Thank you. I am prepared to offer a motion to adopt item 10B, the ordinance uh, in uh, chief, and item 10D as in dog, uh, which identifies the uh, recommended staff approach on uh, inclusionary uh, housing fees, which is to exempt in this case. And in addition to uh, those to uh, offer uh, the motion with a requirement for notice consistent with our existing uh, public notice requirements, and as I said, to ensure uh, public awareness and to make the um, minimum time period uh, uh, for rental to be 180 days. Uh, and I heard what Supervisor Lee was saying, but I think uh, Supervisor Ellenberg makes a compelling case that um, this is really not going to be uh, farm labor housing in most instances. And I think some simplicity and clarity is probably desired. For that same reason, uh, I'm leaving the maximum square footage alone, but I will ask that uh, staff be directed to come back to the board on at least two occasions, one during uh, the 23-24 period to report uh, on the impacts of uh, SB9 implementation and then once again, uh, during the 25-26 period to uh, provide a further report as we see more development on the ground, that could either be through Hewlett, our committee, or it could be to the full board. Uh, the further direction is to uh, pick up on some of the comments and requests that Supervisor Chavez made to um, identify a uh, and to a process for addressing violations to to formalize that process in a written plan to bring it back to our board through the housing land use environment and transportation committee with a uh, particular emphasis on the requirement under state law that there be a three-year primary uh, occupancy and uh, the one other uh, piece that I could use a little help from Supervisor Chavez on, if she's amenable, is I do want to make sure we address these urban rural uh, questions that have been raised as well as infrastructure, but wonder how you might like to uh, suggest I incorporate that in the motion, Supervisor Chavez, if you're amenable through the chair. Thank you. And then we're going to turn to Jess, who has had her hand up. Just yes. want to clarify that the motion is for nine B and D rather than ten B and D. Yes, nine yes. B is in Baker D. I, I apologize. I misspoke. I was looking at the next item already. My bad. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. I'll second it, and uh, for some uh, point of clarification, and uh, maybe even uh, some friendly amendment. Thank you, Supervisor. You're asking for feedback now from Jacqueline. Um, may I, um, Supervisor Simidian, to the motion? This is Cindy. Um, what I would recommend is that the staff report to the committee and the federal task force that you chair with a Census Bureau approach to be protective of the policies that we already have for South County and Coyote Valley. And if we incorporated that direction, and I was wondering why you were looking at the Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force, but I'm assuming through the chair that that is in part because of the census uh, component, yes? That's correct, Supervisor. Thank you. And I'm wondering, uh, Supervisor Chavez, does it work as well if we direct staff to seek clarification on these urban rural descriptors for some portions of our county from the state as well as part of this motion? That's a very good idea. Thank you. Yes. All right. Then uh, if our clerk can track all that, and Mr. Chairman, I think uh, board members can track both the referral of these issues and census tract information to both uh, Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee, as well as the Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force, along with direction to staff to seek clarification and guidance from state authorities. So Areas that are properly designated as urban are properly designated, and areas that are properly designated as rural 
are properly designated as well. And I think that covers everything. If I can get a second, and then I know uh, Supervisor Lee is looking to weigh in and. Um... Yes, I'll second. Thank you. Chairperson, you're muted, sir. Thank you very much. I was saying you have a second already from Supervisor Lee, and I know your motion's going to include final adoption on December 6th, but I also know we have our lead Deputy County Counsel, Elizabeth Pianca, wanting to chime in. Ms. Pianca. Thank you. Elizabeth Pianca, lead Deputy County Counsel. I just want to make clear for the record that with the motion to amend the ordinances to add a um, minimum term of 180 days and also a notice requirement. Those are two components of the ordinances that were not considered by the Planning Commission. And so um, before there would be final action on this um, to adopt or approve these ordinances, they would return to the Planning Commission for the Planning Commission to consider those two additions. Thank you. Supervisor Smithian, comments? I'll just shake my head uh, and uh, let it go at that. <laughs> I, I no, I appreciate. I, I don't. Uh, I appreciate the reminder uh, on process. Uh, it's a bit cumbersome, but presumably uh, the commission and the staff will work to make that uh, happen as expeditiously as schedule permits. And that's coming from a man who loves process, Supervisor Lee. Yes, I think uh, exactly. I think it is what it is. Um, if uh, when you go through uh, planning uh, to get more uh, guidance and clarification. I think that's uh, certainly helpful for the great work of our commissioners on the planning commission. Uh, one friendly amendment I would like to ask is uh, if the maker of motions will be able to um, uh, accommodate us uh, potentially increasing the maximum lot, uh, maximum unit size um, uh, for those over 1600 through application process uh, to be go up to 2000 uh, square foot uh, uh, based on the fact that uh, the lot size, whether they would consider the lot size as uh, mentioned by Supervisor Ellenberg. So for the huge lots, and I think through application process, they could actually go beyond 1600 to 2000. Uh, does that make sense? Or is this something that would be uh, meaningful? I'm going to leave the motion uh, on the floor as um, stated with the, uh, I'll confirm with Ms. Anshano and her team, the 1,600 square foot maximum. I believe that is the correct number, Ms. Anshano. Yes, just for the record. Yep. Yes. Thank you. And um, I think staff has made the judgment wisely, in my view, that uh, there's great benefit in keeping this simple. Now, I take the point that we don't want it to end up being arbitrary by virtue of having a single standard. But I do think keeping it simple is uh, to be well advised. And I think the larger number would uh, generate some pushback. That being said, Supervisor Lee, I am happy to incorporate in the motion a request that that issue of maximum unit size be addressed in the report backs that happen uh, not once but twice, once in the next two years and once subsequently, because I think then we may have some experience uh, with whether or not 1600 has in fact been unduly restrictive or whether it has uh, functioned well uh, during the intervening period. So I can't, I can't, uh, can't go all the way with you on that one, but I can go quarter of the way, which is let's keep talking about it or thinking about it or looking at it uh, once we have a little more information. All right. And if the seconder is amenable with that, uh, I'm happy to incorporate that as part of the motion, Mr. Chair. I would be you, Supervisor Lee. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I loved a prior reference to this being simple. This is almost done but not quite and going back to the planning commission then will come back to us and there were 18 public meetings prior to this public meeting to discuss this seemingly simple idea but i like where we're at and i'm going to be supporting it so we have a motion on the floor we have a second Jess, roll call vote please supervisor lee aye supervisor chavez yes supervisor simidia aye vice president ellenberg Yes. President Wasserman. 
Yes, as well. Thank you. That concludes item number nine. Item number 10 was handled on consent. And just as a reminder, we will be going until one o'clock and then have a half hour lunch break, just notifying staff of that of a slightly different schedule today. So we now move on to item number 11, which is to receive a report from our county executive, Dr. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, a few things to talk about today. First, I'd like to give you an update about election results. Um, as you are aware, last Tuesday, all of the ballots that had been received by mail and that were cast on election day were counted. We also received about 240,000 um, new ballots that day from uh, um, vote by mail um, citizens. Um, at this point, uh, there remains about 94,000 of those to be counted, and we expect the final count to be uh, done by Thursday, with the exception of the provisional ballots, because they require additional um, effort in order to assure that they're truly uh, countable. Um, we've had so far a uh, <clears throat> turnout of about 46,000. That'll change a little bit as the numbers in the counted range. 460,000, doctor? 46%, sorry. Got it, thank you. Um, which actually is about 460,000 because there are a million registered voters. Um, there's also been uh, the fact that the post office uh, lost about two dozen uh, ballots by the side of the road in Highway 17. We've now collected those. I want to reemphasize that uh, county and the registrar of voters never had possession of those ballots. They were dropped off apparently by the post office or lost by the post office in some way. It's unclear how that happened. As there's a chain of uh, possession that's in question, uh, we're working with county council to see if those ballots can be counted. Um, that will give a, we'll give a follow-up on that later on. Um, at this point, residents who have uh, questions about whether their ballot was counted may go to our um, website and there's a, um, a page there that will allow you to put in your name and your um, precinct and actually find out if your ballot was counted. So if there's any question people have, that's an appropriate step to take. Um, the um, Next thing that I'd like to talk about is um, the fact that uh, we've had um, a response to our letter of interest from uh, regarding the uh, possibility of building a clinic on the De Anza campus of the Foothill De Anza Community uh, College District. The district last week uh, decided to sign and return our letter of interest. So we're working on that issue um, and we'll be getting back to the board under a regular agenda when appropriate. The um, next issue I'd like to talk about is COVID. Um, we are seeing a slight increase in our numbers at this point. Two weeks ago, we had a case rate of about nine. Um, a uh, week after that, it was about 12. Um, that's obviously going in a direction that we don't want to see. However, um, it's still staying relatively low. So um, if there's no big spike after Thanksgiving and Christmas, um, I anticipate changing the administrative uh, policy uh, in effective in January to make um, masks optional in the county buildings. Um, 
the board may consider, obviously it's up to the board, coming back to um, open session in December with masks or however they would like to proceed. Um, and that's about it, unless there are questions. Thank you. And I've been informed that I skipped over number 10. I marked it as consent, but it was not put on consent. So I will come back to that in just a moment. Supervisor Lee and then Simidian, questions of Dr. Smith. Hey, uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, about the uh, report on the election uh, and the counting. Uh, as we have seen, there's been a, a, a long delay in terms of getting the ballot counted. Uh, and I just have some questions uh, as we have spoken before. A um, couple of which, one of which is um, the is, is current is the ROV currently still doing a 12 hour shift in terms of uh, doing the uh, counting work and the signature verification work right now? Yes, they're doing 12 hour uh, shifts daily. And uh, I should probably explain, I should have mentioned in my comments that in the county as a whole, there are about 335 different separate types of ballots having to do with the fact that there's overlap of districts and cities and unincorporated areas. So when the counting is done, there needs to be a signature verification that's done and a verification of what precinct they're in and a clarification of where they're counted. So they're actually put through the scanner a number of times in order to account for the different overlapping districts and the different um, uh, ballot types. And so that's why it's uh, quite labor intensive in order to get it done. So the, the ballots are actually fed through the machine. So that in that sense, that's machine read, right? But the actual signature verification to compare to the record, that's actually done manually, is that correct? It's done manually looking at a signature that's online um, and the ballots are put through the machine a number of times depending upon how many overlapping districts they have because the machines can only scan one contest at a time. Right. Now, um, based on the California law, uh, my understanding is that uh, all ballots has to have been returned by mail as of yesterday because that would be seven days from the actual uh, election, uh, assuming that those are ballots that has been uh, postmarked by election day. Is that correct? If they're postmarked on election day, I think the time period they need to be back is um, Saturday, but uh, you might be right. It might be yes, yesterday. I'm not 100% sure of that, but I know that ballots that are postmarked on election day are counted when they receive them. Right. And and so basically at this point, there is no outstanding ballots at all. Everything has been received. Uh, and so um, do you have any idea uh, how many more days would it take for the uh, counting to be completed uh, based on what we have now? Um, I The anticipated completion of everything except mm -hmm. for the provisional ballots is Thursday. This Thursday. Right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Supervisor Smithian. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. Thanks for uh, sharing a little uh, insight on uh, where things stand with the ROV. Uh, by virtue of your tenure here, you will recall uh, that, you know, 10 years ago, we were really struggling, frankly, uh, at the ROV's office to uh, get the job done. And I, I think we're in a much better place today. And I just want to acknowledge that always room for improvement. Uh, but, you know, one of the things our board did was say, if it takes more bodies and it takes more equipment, then let's fund the bodies and the equipment. And uh, that has made a difference in terms of the ability to generate results in a relatively timely fashion, given the changes in our state voting practice uh, that um, all of the counties are now confronting. 
I, I did want to say thank you for the um, uh, the shared information because I, I I think I have certainly been struck and I suspect others may have been as well by efforts to cast doubt on uh, on the integrity of our electoral process in the United States. And I think anything we can do here locally to make sure people know they can be confident in the integrity of the system is is important work. So I don't, um, and it's important that, that it not just be a process that uh, has integrity, but it, that it be understood and seen as a process that has integrity. Um, I just wanted to probe a little bit. My recollection is that we have a fairly well-established system for election observers from the public or the campaigns that which I assume is still in place yes yes that's um one of the reasons why um, we only do 12 hour uh, counting because we have to have independent observers uh, available to observe and you know if we did 24 7 that would be a problem good well I think the presence of those observers is yet another thing we can do and should be doing and are doing to give people confidence in the integrity of the system and i would certainly hope that every effort is made to accommodate the observers i i can imagine based on uh, uh, an understanding of the logistics that there's a, a certain uh, challenge to managing both observers and the operations of counting the votes uh in in the same space, but anything we can do to reasonably accommodate those observers and uh, underscore the absolute uh, integrity of the process, I think is to the good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. That concludes item number 11. We're going to jump back to the advisor. Yes, Dr. Um, Smith. One uh, late breaking piece of news that yes. uh, um, is a problem, I think. Uh, we just received notice that um, California Nurses Association has given Kaiser a notification that they intend to strike on the 21st of this month. Um, we are beginning preparation for the possibility of more patients coming to our system when that happens, and we understand that Kaiser is uh, trying to empty their hospitals as fast as they can. We expect that they will uh, probably need to um, depopulate by 60 to 80 patients in our region. Um, so the surrounding hospitals will need to take up the uh, responsibility. This will be um, potentially a big stress on our organization. So I just wanted to let you know that that was going on. Sorry to interrupt. I just got that over my email. No worries. And I'm sorry to hear that. And I hope it's resolved soon. And before we go back to number 10, Supervisor Smitty, and your hand is raised. Your hand is down. We're now going to go back to item number 10. Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez, some comments and a motion. Thank you so much. This referral directs administration to build on our county's already annual support provided to the African African Ancestry Health and Heritage Month uh, activities since 2019 and to set aside ongoing funding in public health or, or whatever department is appropriate to support this work in conjunction with community organizations. I'm submitting the referral now and asking for a report back in December with a specific allocation so that the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet and their partners can plan for February activities rather than making this adjustment later in the budget cycle. The county funds this series of events annually, yet it hasn't been built into the base budget as ongoing funding. And we have the opportunity to do that today and to allow for uses for Health and Heritage Month as well as by National Health Week or other culturally focused health events that the county partners with local organizations to support. I wanna thank Supervisor Chavez for her support on this referral and her continued commitment to health equity. And with that, I would make a motion to approve the referral. 
I'll second. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for your leadership on this and staying true and focused on what we need to help our communities be healthy. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. No speakers, no other hands raised. Jess, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Travis? Yes. Supervisor Siminian? I'll come back around. You're muted, sir. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. And Supervisor Siminian? Give him just another moment. All right, we'll uh, expect that he joins us shortly and we'll cast a vote at that time. Nope, still, still having some difficulties. All right, with that, we're gonna move on to item number 12, which is to receive a report from County Council on legal issues and closed session meeting of November 14th. We'll hear from Mr. James Williams, and then I have some comments I'm gonna make. Mr. Williams. At the November 14th, 2022 closed session by unanimous vote with all members present, the board authorized the county to file or join amicus briefs in, in cases addressing when a person can choose to terminate a pregnancy, including two cases addressing whether EMTALA guarantees access to abortion care. State of Texas versus Javier Becerra, U.S. District Court of the Northern District of Texas, case number 22-CV-00185, and United States of America versus the state of Idaho, U.S. District Court for the District of Idaho, case number 22-CV-00329. And now I will turn it over to you, President Wasserman. Thank you, Mr. Williams. And I'm going to ask Supervisor Simidian to cast a vote on item number 10. Forgive me, uh, I am an I vote. Sorry for the Thank glitch. Thank you. So item number 10 passes unanimously. Um, back to item number 12. At the November 14th, 2022 closed session, by a four to one vote with all members present and Supervisor Chavez voting no, the Board of Supervisors appointed James R. Williams to be the next county executive, effective upon the vacancy of the Office of the County Executive, which we anticipate will occur in July 2023 upon the retirement of Dr. Jeffrey Smith. Congratulations, James and Dr. Smith. In the days following the November 1st Board of Supervisors meeting, the board received written notices requesting that the board cure or correct Brown Act issues regarding the board's closed session agenda in October and the report out of the successor county executive appointee on November 1st. We take those notices and our Brown Act obligations seriously and I want to thank members of the public for sharing their concerns. Although we believe there were no Brown Act violations with respect to the original actions taken to appoint Mr. Williams, the board again placed items on yesterday's closed session meeting agenda and today's open session agenda to appoint the next county executive and appointed Mr. Williams. These actions cure and correct all alleged violations relating to the appointment and allow us to move forward with this leadership transition and the county's important business. We look forward to working in close partnership with Mr. Williams in this critical role for the county. With that said, I'll see if there's any other board members that wish to make any comments. If not, we will move on to item number 13. Uh, Vice President Ellenberg. Sorry, having a, a hand raise issue. Um, I, I want to just just state on the record that I, I sincerely regret the comments that I made at the board meeting that added to the confusion on timing and process for Mr. Williams appointment as it relates to the Brown Act. I am very gratified that the board of supervisors took action to put those concerns to rest. And I, I do retain great confidence in Mr. Williams. It's my continued hope, continued hope that this transition in leadership will ensure that our community receives the support it needs to thrive. Thank you. And for the record, I will say I echoes, echo those same comments made by the Vice President. With that, we move on to item number 13. Item number 13 is the written agreement with James Williams relating to his appointment as the next county executive upon the position becoming vacant. This agreement was on board's November 1st agenda. 
Under the Brown Act, the clerk's office provided an oral summary of the agreement's compensation and benefit terms before public comment and before the, voted, before the board voted to approve it. After the board meeting, a member of the public sent a cure or correct request for the county to provide additional detail to the public about the compensation and benefit terms in the agreement before approving the agreement. In an abundance of caution, we are re-agendizing the agreement for approval today, and the clerk will now provide an even more robust oral summary before public comment and the board's consideration of this item. Before we begin public comment on item 13, I'm turning it over to the clerk of the board for that announcement. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Pursuant to government code section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the proposed salary and benefits adjustments that are required to be disclosed. Item number 13 on the November 15th, 2022 Board of Supervisors meeting is ratification of an agreement with James R. Williams as the successor appointee to the county executive upon the vacancy of the position of county executive. The terms are set forth in the agreement and described in detail in the publicly posted report attached to item number 13. Those terms include that Mr. Williams shall serve at the pleasure of the board pursuant to county charter section 401 and his appointment at, as the county executive is at will. Regarding compensation and benefits, the terms include that upon assuming office as the county executive, Mr. Williams, with four specifically identified exceptions, additions, and or clarifications, shall be entitled to all the benefits and other provisions of the Executive Salary Ordinance Number NS-20.22, as subsequently amended or adopted by the Board from time to time, that are generally applicable to County Executive Leaders, as well as those provisions specifically applicable to the position of the County Executive. That salary ordinance, originally adopted June 28, 2022, includes provisions regarding leaves of absence, disability income, other benefits, including actual and necessary expenses for meals and other reasonably related business expenses for the county executive and other specified executive positions, consistent with spe specified county policies, health insurance, vehicle allowance for the county executive and other specified executive positions, public employees retirement under CalPERS, retiree medical insurance, deferred comp compensation, and life insurance. A link to that executive salary ordinance is provided in the report attached to item number 13. The four clarifications additions and or exceptions that the agreement provides shall be reflected in the executive salary, executive leadership salary ordinance regarding Mr. Williams as the successor county executive R. One, the appointee's salary shall initially be set at 10% above that of the chief operating officer. This salary would be effective upon Mr. Williams assuming office as the county executive. The chief operating officer's current salary is $418,521.48 annually. If the county executive's office were to be vacated today, then Mr. Williams' initial salary as county executive would be $460,373.63 annually. Number two, the appointee shall be entitled to continuation of his current participation in the county's 401A supplemental benefit plan. Number three, the maximum accumulation of leave in section 5A2 of the executive salary leadership, executive leadership salary ordinance shall be tripled as applied to the appointee as of November 1st, 2022. That section currently provides that no more than 864 hours shall be accumulated in the vacation leave bank of employees in executive leadership positions, and that any balance in excess of 864 hours shall be used by the employee or paid in cash at the then current salary rate in the pay period that contains December 31st. The attached agreement provides that Mr. Williams would be able to accumulate up to 2,592 hours of accrued vacation instead of the county annually paying Mr. Williams for any accrued leave hours in excess of 864 hours. The agreement does not provide Mr. Williams with more annual vacation leave than other executives 
or change the rate of Mr. Williams' annual leave accrual, that accrual rate and all other leave accrual terms remain as set forth in the executive leadership salary ordinance. Number four, the requirement in section 10B of the executive leadership salary ordinance that such service must be accrued immediately preceding the date of retirement and the employee must retire directly from the county under the provisions of the California Public Employees Retirement System, CalPERS, shall not be applicable to the appointee for retiree medical insurance. <clears throat> All other provisions of Section 10 of the Executive Leadership Salary Ordinance shall remain applicable to the appointee. That concludes my summary. Thank you very much, Jess. And with that, let's turn to the public first to speak, two minutes each. Our first speaker is Melissa. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, good morning. My name is Melissa. I am a San Jose resident and part of the Care First Jail Never Coalition. Without getting into detail of who is the right person to fill Jeff Smith's seat or arguing its process with all the county's recent controversies, the county board cannot possibly make a sound decision concerning the construction of the new jail until there is a resolution concerning the county executive's seat. Again, we urge the county to suspend any discussions or decisions regarding the construction of the new jail until there is a resolution concerning the county's executive's seat. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Catherine Hedges, and I'm also a member of the Care First Jails Never Coalition, and I just want to second everything the previous speaker said. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose Valle. Please go ahead. Hi, how are you doing? My name is Jose Valle with Silicon Valley Debug. Um, Currently, our county seems to be shrouded in constant controversy. Our county rejected an already approved contract after a jail construction company uh, was uncovered by a troubled history that did not align with our county's values. Sheriff Lori Smith resigned just before being found guilty of corruption and misconduct in a civil trial. County Executive Jeff Smith abruptly announced his retirement, which may have led to a violation of the Brown Act by, the appointing, by appointing James uh, Williams as the next county executive by means of a secret meeting. Uh, without getting into detail, who is the right person to fill Jeff C or arguing about its process, with everything said, the county board cannot possibly make a sound decision concerning the construction of a new jail until there's a resolution concerning the county executive seat. Again, we urge the county to suspend any discussions and decisions regarding the construction of the new jail and there is a rest until there is a resolution concerning the county executive seat. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cynthia Longs. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Hello, my name is Cynthia Long. I'm a one registered voter, system impact assembly member, Debo's organizer, and member of Jail Never Coalition. Hello, Board of Supervisors, our county has been involved in constant controversy. Our county rejected an already approved contract with the company J.E. Dunn, who troubled history did not align with the county's values. Sheriff Lori Smith resigned just before being found guilty of corruption and misconduct in a civil trial, and the county exec, Jeff Smith, abruptly announced his retirement. Then the county appointed Mr. James Williams to fill this seat. And in this secret meeting, the Brown Act is violated. Then the county seeks to resolve its controversy of the murder of Michael Tyree and the county's practice of inhumane and definite solitary confinement with the construction of a new jail. Therefore, as the previous speaker said, I think the Board of Supervisors cannot possibly make a decision concerning the construction of a new jail until there is a resolution to the county executive, which I think you guys tried to do that today, I did it today. Therefore, we urge the county to suspend any discussion uh, or decision regarding the construction of a new jail until the resolution for the county executive. Again, jail is inhumane because of the culture of the police officers, district attorneys, 
custody shares, not the concrete building. It is the culture that is the issue, not the concrete. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sharon Luna. Please go ahead. Sharon. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. Mm -hmm. um, as a recently approved member of the San Martin Planning Advisory Committee, SIMPAC, I had to take the two-hour training on ethics and it sparked many questions that still have not been answered. I sent them in writing. And many of these questions take place at uh, the board meetings. And um, through the years of being on SMA, we've had to deal with many issues and concerns, starting with oversized projects, sewage issues, and traffic concerns and de development in San Martin. With this recent issue um, and knowing as far as the training that it takes um, to go through and understand the Brown Act, there have been some concerns of how our information is being reviewed by the Board of Supervisors. I recall one situation where um, Supervisor Wasserman asked um, Mr. J Williams to uh, contact me in regard to a situation and I have yet to hear from him. I don't know Mr. Williams, I don't uh, know his uh, credentials, but I'm just looking as far as when we say something, we need to follow through. And this is what I find that with the county, um, that there is that lack of follow through. And I know that with the ethics training that I did take and reviewing the Brown Act, we all need to take it seriously and work together to make ensure that there is no hidden agendas that could create situations like this. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you, Jess. With our speakers concluded, I'm happy to make the motion the board approve the agreement with Mr. Williams that is attached to the board agenda. And I look for a second. I'll second. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Yes, thank you very much. And I apologize that my um, camera's not on, but I wanna make sure that I'm I'm able to be heard. I, I wanted to just say a couple things. First, I really appreciate Supervisor Ellenberg, um, you were explaining your comments. I think that's really important to building public trust and Supervisor Wasserman as well, that we're candid when we make mistakes and we figure out how to how to write the, you know, write these um, situations. So thank you. Um, second, I want to be consistent with my the vote we initially took on this item. And that is to say that I think it's really important that every opportunity that we have to continue to be open and transparent is, is critical to the health and vitality of our overall democracy. And I think engaging the community does not diminish our role or our, um, our role in any way. As a matter of fact, I think it enhances quite a bit, um, but I understand the direction of the board. And I wanna say um, to the public that whenever you, me as a board member has a disagreement with four people that I respect so much, I have to give it a lot, a lot of thought. And I have in this, in this instance. And lastly, I just wanted to say something to Mr. Williams. I think you are a very ethical, smart man. I think you are an extreme talent. My vote today does not reflect my confidence in you personally. I am, frankly, I think that, um, the community will benefit a great deal from your leadership. And I look forward to seeing you do amazing things. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. We have a motion and a second roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? No. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you very much. And uh, congratulations, Mr. Williams. All righty. With that, based on what was stated in the consent calendar, we are now jumping to number 23. Then we'll go to 24, then to 27. Supervisor Wasserman? Yes. I, 
excuse the interruption. Um, I think the, the way it was stated in the consent and the understanding yes, was that we're going to do 27 at first and then 23 and then 24. Oh, you not only wanted to jump, you wanted to do 27 first. Okay, say that again, 27, 23, 24. The way that, that it appeared in the consent calendar, yes, to do 27, uh, 27. then 23, then 24. Okay. I'm on 27 and it says to receive a report from the Office of the County Executive relating to mental health facility planning. And Mr. Aturia, do we have you with us? Greg, are you there? Dr. Smith, we'll start with you. Yeah, I'm gonna do this one. Um, the um, issue that was raised by the board was to give a, a general outline of what we think would be a desirable uh, physical structure uh, for numerous services that the county should plan on um, having. What you have before you is um, a summary of those, and I'd like to go through it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> starting with the acute care adolescent psychiatric facility, which the board has already committed to, which is gonna be 77 inpatient beds, <clears throat> and also um, the emergency psych services for essentially a psych emergency room. <clears throat> These are beds that would be used for individuals who have severe mental illness, which does not allow them to function in society such that they are either a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or gravely disabled. These uh, criteria are elucidated in the LPS law and um, they've been talked about before. Uh, usually the uh, time of uh, being in the hospital is somewhere in the nine to 10 day range after an initial evaluation that happens in uh, 72 hours. And then there's a possibility of another extension after that, depending on how patient is doing. Second is an inpatient forensic unit, which is really a psych hospital that also has um, incarceration security. Um, this is really sort of a jail within a hospital. Um, this is for individuals who have similar severe mental illnesses that to the ones that I just described, but are incarcerated, therefore need to be in a secure facility with guards. We think we need about 40 beds. There's been discussion at the board level about whether to build a new uh, facility um, or to um, convert some beds in a current hospital. We've talked about how it would be much faster and much more cost-effective to convert beds in a current hospital. And um, we need about 40, we think. The next is a subacute um, mental health rehabilitation center, which uh, typically in the past was called IMDs. <clears throat> These are locked facilities which a patient is in voluntarily. Um, that means they've signed the ability, signed away their rights to be in an unlocked facility. Usually these are individuals who are recovering from severe mental illness. They've been in an acute psych hospital, but they're not quite ready to be in the community. They understand that or their conservator understands that they're willing to be in a locked facility to get more intensive therapy for a longer period of time under a voluntary status. <clears throat> 219 beds would be desirable. These beds could be built by the county. However, it's highly likely and probably much more desirable to have them built and operated by CBOs in our community. Um, but that will require some planning. Um, <clears throat> next is a subacute facility for those who are incompetent to stand trial or also incarcerated. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
This is a facility for the same uh, type of patient <clears throat> that I <clears throat> just talked about, but someone who is still incarcerated and unable to stand trial because of that. Um, the common parlance is these are individuals who are under a Murphy conservatorship where they're <clears throat> clearly involved with the uh, criminal uh, process, but also have such severe mental illness that they need to be <clears throat> treated in an inpatient subacute uh, environment. And so these patients aren't really voluntary. Um, they would have been assigned to such a location by the courts. Next group is mental health re residential treatment. These are individuals who have um, essentially made it through the process to the point where they can get back into a normal life, um, but um, have still have severe illness that precludes them from doing normal activities of daily living on their own. So this is an environment where they have support, um, staff members, therapy, and other um, uh, training to allow them to get back into a more normal environment. Then last, we've listed supportive shelters. These are individuals who um, have not necessarily gone through the um, mental health processes that we talked about with inpatient and subacute, but um, need intervention before they can before they worsen. This is a shelter environment, a temporary housing environment where case management and referrals to outpatient services can be made. Um, this would typically be an environment where an individual who was homeless, who had concerns about mental health issues or substance abuse issues, would uh, come voluntarily and get referrals and have some opportunity to have some interim housing and case management. If you add this all up, it's about 540 beds. Again, these are estimates um, to give us some kind of target. And you can see that we have estimated financial costs, which I have to really emphasize are very um, gross estimates depending on changing construction market, how much of this we have done by CBOs, um, and how many beds we end up having in total. So um, this gives you an order of magnitude of about $3 billion for construction, um, much of which we've already funded with the uh, inpatient psych facility that's uh, being built now and somewhere in the region of $3 billion of operational costs, which would be partially subsidized by Medi-Cal, Medicare, and other insurance aid uh, systems. So again, um, none of this is written in stone, but this gives us a target of what we think would be appropriate and multiple variables will impact it, such as the size of the county as the population increases, uh, need will increases, will increase the economy, which will push more people into homelessness. Um, the um, concerns we have with the effect of the COVID uh, pandemic causing much depression and mental health issues, um, changes in the Medi-Cal structure that are implemented through CalAIM. Um, and obviously county financial impacts as well as CBO impacts. So uh, with that, I uh, will just take questions. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Thank you for again, laying out the different types of facilities. It is, uh, it is a very complicated web that makes up this continuum of care and reminders of the definitions are, are very important. Um, 
what I didn't hear sufficiently was how we get from from here to there. Um, it's 11 months ago now, Supervisor Lee and I submitted the referral declaring a public health crisis in mental health and substance use disorders and calling for accelerated action and system-wide planning. There has been some progress in planning, including on facilities, uh, and quantifying the gap. I, I appreciate very much that effort by staff, and I recognize that the issues that we're facing in Santa Clara County are not unique, uh, not unique in the state or, or, the, or the nation. Uh, but they're issues that we we need to solve. It is fully in the scope of responsibility of the county to provide treatment and care to people with serious mental illnesses and addiction, and we need to deliver. So I found that I was I was frustrated by the report. I understand that this is one item in the scope of many other components in development, and that the intent of the report was to put a rough order of magnitude on costs to inform our capital planning next month. There are some really significant limitations in this analysis, and as a result, it doesn't really inform action by the board. Let me share some examples. Um, first, several levels of care are listed here, but they're not distinguished between those that are in flight and funded, like the acute um, inpatient facility for children and adults, and those that have no local plans developed for expansion, uh, specifically the subacute beds, which I believe really needs to be our focus as we proceed with other levels of care in parallel. Second, the report assumes that we're building subacute bed ourselves, and it doesn't explore alternative models, including public-private partnerships with existing subacute providers. I will want to know whether we can provide land or, or loans for private providers to build a facility. I want to understand whether we can repurpose and renovate other facilities. The options on the model uh, would really be a big driver uh, of the cost. Third, related to this lack of analysis, the report presumes a cost of $8 million per bed and extrapolates that out to our gap of 250 subacute beds. However, the cost of the acute facility on which this is based also includes demolition and replacement of a parking structure, which is not essential to adding beds, and other cost per bed models aren't considered in the analysis. For example, the tenant improvements that are, that are set to open at 650 South Bascom has a budget of $1.5 million for 28 beds. That's a cost of under $54,000 per bed. The renovations of BAP and Don Lowe, when vacated to repurpose up to 100 beds, was estimated at 40 million, a cost of 400,000 per bed. And I, I, of course, I recognize that there are significant concerns with the conditions of those buildings, but this board needs and deserves, and the public deserves a robust analysis of all of the possible options to inform our policy decisions. And four, there's no path forward to getting from this rough analysis to real action on building beds. Administration has set a goal, your own goal, of 500 beds by 2025. But as we near the end of 2022, I'm not seeing a clear and specific path forward on one of the biggest gaps in that plan, which is the more than 200 subacute beds. I know that our staff works so hard and I am so appreciative of the efforts, but, but truly in the end, this particular report felt dismissive to me. The lack of subacute beds means that people either stay in higher levels of care or are unable to enter the system through EPS as there's no throughput and they often end up released to the streets or they wind up in jail because we haven't built the capacity. I understand that the work is expensive and it will require hard decisions by the board and very likely some robust advocacy to the state and federal partners that, that, uh, that limit reimbursement for some levels of care, which we all know is a problem, or that underinvest in necessary infrastructure. That advocacy is going to be necessary. Um, I, I'm involved in that work through, through my CSAC role but we need a whole of county approach. The statewide allocation of $2.2 billion for the behavioral health infrastructure capacity grants 
is a billion short of the 3.3 billion estimated in this report, and our county is only 5% of the state need. So under the requirements of care court, the counties need to prepare to serve people in need, but we continue to not have the places or the workforce to provide that mandated care. Back on um, May 3rd, uh, Supervisor Lee and I submitted uh, a motion in writing that was approved unanimously by the board. It said to direct administration to initiate capital planning and financing of one or more county owned subacute psychiatric facilities to alleviate current reliance on our limited acute psychiatric beds, Barbara Aaron's Pavilion, or jail for individuals on Murphy conservatorships, LPS conservatorships, competency restoration, or otherwise in need of long term psychiatric treatment. To the extent state resources or regional partnerships are available, these opportunities should be maximized, but they cannot delay an immediate local effort to begin planning, financing, and identification of a location. Funding to support pre-construction work should be included in the FY23 revised recommended budget presented to the board ahead of the June hearings. That was the direction. Then on August 30th, the board adopted 10 charges for accelerating action on behavioral health, including, quote, to present a plan, timeline, and funding plan for development of a county-owned IMD at a public meeting of the Board of Supervisors within 90 days. That board direction was backed up in the budget with a designation of a million dollars for initial planning for a subacute facility. So six months later, and I, I shall finally get to a question, uh, Dr. Smith, can you tell us how the $1 million has been used and when we are going to have a robust set of specific options for meeting the gap in subacute care in our county? Dr. Smith. Um, a number of issues there. Um, I'm trying to think about how to respond. Um, this report, as I stated, is a general idea of what we think we will need with general costs and general number of beds. Mm -hmm. um, it will change um, and it will change dramatically. Um, so some of the issues that you raised um, obviously will change. Um, in terms of when the decision gets made about specific costs and specific allocations, the board will make those decisions during budget and we anticipate coming back during the mid-year budget with some suggestions about uh, what we think can actually be accomplished um, in a rapid period of time. As you know, we've been contracting with <clears throat> CBOs to provide some of the IMD capacity and subacute capacity. Um, and we think, as I mentioned, that the 219 beds that we probably need will be um, supplied mostly by CBOs and our partnership with them. Um, just because <clears throat> the concept of building 219 um, subacute beds, I mean, uh, IMD beds is um, something that we probably can't do in an expeditious manner. Um, so uh, what we've been using the million dollars for is planning and helping us to understand how much we actually need of each service. Um, I guess uh, the fundamental issue is that um, we uh, wouldn't recommend funding things until we actually have a plan for implementation. And the plan for implementation requires a number of moving pieces to be uh, decided, as we've seen from our experience with the inpatient facility and with 650 Bascom and with other facilities, uh, the need far exceeds the capacity of the organization and the CBOs and the timing of these uh, constructions and contracts 
-hmm. is easy to be delayed. So that's the best I can offer you. So, thank Dr. Smith, we knew, you know, coming into this that we have challenges with with construction. So th this report that we got tells us what we already knew, but doesn't provide a solution going forward. Of course, the money is far in excess of what we can afford to do. And of course, you know, a major construction plans on multiple projects are not are not going to be um, are not going to be practical. But this report didn't get us closer. And, and what I would like, and, the, and this will be um, a motion, is a follow up to this report um, to be to be received. Let me talk to you about the about the date after I tell you what I'm looking for. It, it's a follow up to this plan that would compare various models, new construction, renovation, or partnership with private providers or neighboring counties that would provide specific location options, a more thoughtful cost estimate on facilities that would compare models that are currently in use in other communities and that establishes a timeline. And what I would also say is that if this level, and add to the motion, if this level of planning is beyond the capacity of our current staff to complete, I would like to see us engage a contractor to develop this scope, not, not just similar to what we are doing with the jail project, to identify project requirements and use those to build a framework for the cost of a facility. Um, we don't necessarily need the community engagement um, uh, consultant on this piece. But again, we need to move this in an urgent way. We need clear plans and the board needs to be positioned to make decisions. And we are we just don't have the tools to do that yet. So that's the information I'm looking for. Um, I'm happy for your estimate or reaction on what you think a reasonable um, yet urgent uh, return with that information would be. Doctor. Well, a couple of things that are problematic with asking for that information. One is that we can't really pick a location for facilities without being able to sit down and negotiate with the owners. Um, so that's a problem and that has a huge impact on costs. Mm -hmm. And and the issue of who's the owner, whether it's a CBO or not, is obviously also an issue. Um, but um, I think um, using your analogy to the jail issue, um, we would be happy to hire an outside consultant to give us the best information we possibly can. Um, because um, we're working from a perspective of trying to do as much in each budget as we possibly can. Uh, and what I hear you asking for is a more of a long distance uh, view of how we could accomplish that. And so we an don't outside have consultant would probably be a good idea. So uh, I, I'm not looking for a, a long range view. I am looking for the quickest responsible decisions that we can make. And we are not getting to a place yet where we can make those decisions. The urgency, I mean, it, it cannot be overstated. People are, are, are dying, are, are dying by suicide, are dying by overdose, are dying by untreated uh, mental illnesses that land them in in jail or or keep them on our streets. So, I, no, I don't want long term. And, and what and what is the most likely option then is that we're not going to build our own, but we're going to look uh, such as you recommended a, a secure um, a secure floor in a in a hospital. I would not like to think of that as a. I think you mentioned it as a. Um, jail within a hospital that's absolutely not the goal the goal is a therapeutic first treatment facility um and if there needs you know and and whatever security to keep um keep patients safe and staff safe 
uh, and the rest of the community safe. Absolutely, I understand, but let's let's not think of that in a jail forward uh, perspective. But I want you to bring us back options that are going to allow us to care for more people with as great speed as possible. Um, like I said, and as you suggested, I think probably the best thing for us to do to try to answer your questions is to get an outside consultant. Okay. So if that's we'll, the fastest, let's do that. We'll be happy to do that. Okay. So that direction to the extent it is feasible rather than going back sentence by sentence is, is my motion and I would hope for a second. All right. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Ms. Ray. Supervisor Thanks. Lee, you seconded the motion. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. Um, and Supervisor Ellenberg, thanks for walking us through that. Um, I I come at this in a in a very similar vein. Um, and I want to ask um, Dr. Smith just a, a, a kind of a big picture question. Um, there it's kind of two big picture questions. One is when we think about the folks in the community that the county is responsible for, um, who who do we think we're responsible for relative to mental illness and folks with addiction? Um, theoretically, we're responsible for anybody who doesn't have sufficient coverage to uh, provide the care they need. But and, excuse me, anybody that doesn't need to have their microphone open, please close it. Go ahead, doctor. Um, I think that's about the answer. Um, the way that um, mental health funding and direction was set up from the, by the state many years ago is that the mental health departments in each county were effectively turned into um, health plans. They didn't actually have a Knox team designation, but they were responsible for treating severely mentally ill individuals and implementing uh, programs that were uh, mandated by the state. Um, so that continues. There is the effort going on now with Cal AIM to eliminate that carve out and make Medi-Cal cover uh, mental illness as a parity issue, which we obviously totally support, um, but still the responsibility for the severely mentally ill would be the county. There's a responsibility for the moderately or minimally mentally ill, those individuals with say reactive depression or temporary um, issues of mental instability, anxiety disorders, and the like, um, they should be covered by their primary insurance with us as the back uh, drop, the safety net. Um, so it's essentially everybody who doesn't have coverage uh, that they need. It, or if they're a patient of ours, right? Like a Medi-Cal patient or somebody who is insured. Right. If they're a Medi-Cal patient or someone who's insured through our system or, for that matter, anybody who just shows up into our system who has need that's uninsured um, as our responsibility. Thank you. The reason I, uh, colleagues, the reason I'm asking the question of Dr. Smith is that I, I think that there there are so many issues here to unpack, and one of them is just What's the the hole we're trying to fill? What's the oh, need in oh our my community? options paragraph? I just added. Um, Otto, you're not on mute. Um, but anyway, like, yeah, I think the I think the first thing, the kind of the most important thing here is that we need to know um, the total number of people that we're trying to serve, the kinds of illnesses they have, and then what's the best tools. And I know we need to do these things concurrently, in part because it's not like we're going to overbuild in any area right now because we're underserving, but it's part of the reason that I have been so interested in knowing what the numbers are, what the wait lists are, and what the needs are, because what that's telling me, Dr. Smith, based on what you just described, is that 
the people that we see out on the streets that are are um, harming themselves or not able to eat or just homeless all of that that are that are really not able to take care of themselves and i'm going to just i'm going to just um decouple that from those who are who are um you know the the rules about conservatorship so let me just separate those for a moment and say that we have a lot of patients on the street that we don't have the right response to or they wouldn't be out on the street right now and so i i wonder if you all have been thinking about how to quantify the total number and the total need as part of what was presented in this item today and if so where does that analysis live and is that something that the board could have access to um i guess i need to go more into the history um it's not really possible to assess what the total need is in the county other than to go by statistical analysis of large populations. Um, so, for example, um, we know that roughly 11% of populations are severely mentally ill. So 11% of 2 million would be a statistical analysis, but we also know that this county has a higher homeless population than others, so we can anticipate that our need is actually larger than the 11%. Um, so trying to give the board a definitive number is not really possible, plus I think the other issue that we've run into numerous times when we're trying to explain to the public that um, some laws prevent us from dealing with homeless individuals and others with mental illness in a restrictive environment. Um, people have the right to freedom, they have the right to be mentally ill as long as they're not threatening to kill themselves or others. And, you know, that's just the state law. So we can't pick up people from the street based on the fact that they're homeless and acting weird and put them in restricted environments. Um, the other issue to try to address some of your concerns is that mental illness changes on a regular basis. People progress or get better. So, you know, a single spotlight, you know, single uh, analysis is not particularly useful, just like we've noticed with homelessness. We had surveys of homelessness, which said that we're gonna cure homelessness in 10 years based on a particular population. And as you know, we haven't cured homelessness and our numbers are still increasing. So it's, a, it's an intricate process and we only have so many tools we can use. Um, and that's why it's hard to respond to the requests from the board with anything that's definitive. Thank you. I, I, I just want to make um, a few observations about what you just said. I think the first one is that the issue about whether or not we're who we're who we're supporting and what their needs are. And if, in fact, what you're saying um, about the overall percentage is one that we can use, then there are national standards for how many um, beds of a certain type should be available for need in each community. And given that, in fact, we do have incredibly incredibly rich data relative to not the point and count um, study, but in terms of the um, the homeless database just as a as a first, and we have this incredible robust healthcare system, I mean, we actually have access to more data than most people in the nation. And so what I what I would want to just 
add is that just to say this out loud is that I don't think anybody here, and I, I know you know this, um, Dr. Smith, more than probably most, are concerned about folks who are on the street that are behaving oddly. It's folks that are on the street that are behaving either in a way that's criminogenic and or it's clear they can't take care of themselves. And, you know, and we just have to go into um, really the community I live in to see the distress and, and strain on um, on those that are really suffering in the streets and then and, and then how the community reacts around them. So I don't, I don't think this is just, you know, like addressing people who are acting weird. So I, I, I say all that because, um, so that's got kind of observation number one. Observation number two is that we're about to make a decision on um, the, the jail. And part of the reason this discussion is so critical is because the amount of bonding capacity that will suck up you know, as we look at all these other issues, it, they're not they're not separate. And because we only have one pot of funding, really, that we have um, dominion over that I, I think that the assessment is actually very important, because I think the board needs to be able to see all of the needs relative, or at least as much as we can reveal, relative to the amount of resources we have over a, a certain number of years to be able to address those concerns. And then third, um, and this goes back to the issue that you that I, I think maybe Supervisor Ellenberg or you, Dr. Smith, just raised around how we're able to and need to be able to respond to care court and preparing for that um, that eventuality means that we're going to be driven to make some expenditures um, anyway, and so they might as well be expenditures that we intend to make in a way that that will build up the system that we think has such significant needs and. So, so I say that because I think whatever help you need, I think we should get you because that I know this is immeasurably complex. Um, but I'm also feeling the urgency that um, that some that my colleagues are feeling too, and it appears to me that the longer we we're the longer we're in kind of this um, pattern of thinking about what we're going to do, the, the, the issues are getting more and more, more profound. And, you know, and I will use the example you used about homelessness, how we could have all the data in the world and not solve it. Well, let's, let's look back at that for just a moment and say, the research we did enabled us to determine much more about what the needs were. And while I think our responses don't address every need, our responses are allowing us to address thousands and thousands and thousands of people on an ongoing basis in a better way than most places in the state. So we're not ahead of the game there. I mean, we're a little, we're probably ahead of where others are. We have much, much more to do, but we've at least positioned ourselves to try to be ahead of the curve. And, and so that's really what I'm, I'm looking for. So thank you um, colleagues. For, and thank you, Dr. Smith for your comments. Well, um, just to follow up, um, as everyone knows, solutions to complex problems are not simple. And um, we've tried from an administrative perspective to address the referrals as much as we possibly can and the desires as much as we possibly can. So I think the idea of an outside independent Cons consultant is probably a good idea. We did the same with uh, the jail, um, but of course the board decided they didn't wanna hear what the consultants had to say. So we'll do the same with this and try to come up with some answers that will be useful for the board. Well, and Dr. Smith, just to respond, I, I don't think that it was that the board um, was non-responsive to the to the recommendations by the by the consultants, and I would also just say that I think that you know without um, you know digressing and um, but too much on this, I, I think that part of what is is different about the situation we're talking about here um, is that what we're saying is that if in fact what you're telling us is that we don't have as a county the expertise to be able to look at 
treatment, the resources needed for treatment, the physical facilities needed for treatment, and the path to getting us to, to being able to support the folks, again, that we're obligated to help, then what, sir, what do you need to be able to do that so that so that we we all can move on the same move forward. And I, I will just make this acknowledgement. I think the reason we see so many reports and so many referrals is that all of us are having the same problem, which is trying to get our arms around a seemingly insolvable problem. And then as it relates to the jail, I do, I do want to say that I, I've read every single document that anybody's given me on that. And my questions, my queries, and my own perspective on that were largely developed not only by the community and by listening to my smart colleagues, but also by listening to experts. I think we're all obligated to do that. That we come to different conclusions doesn't mean we didn't listen to the experts. Well, I didn't want to imply that we don't have the skill set to care for the individuals. I meant that um, from an administrative perspective after we've gotten scores of referrals from the board about these issues, it's pretty clear we're not providing what the board wants. And so I think getting an outside view would be useful um, in order to have some perspective from an outside expert. Um, from our perspective, we've responded to all of the referrals as best we can. So if we need another viewpoint, uh, we should get an outside viewpoint. Dr. Smith, thank you for clarifying that. And I apologize, my, my, my tone and my tenor were not to imply that we don't have an extraordinarily skilled team. Um, and in terms of providing services, I obviously have seen the incredible work that our staff has done. My, my only point there is, is that the two things. I think one, your very important point of having an outside set of eyes sometimes can be very helpful. And two, that we do seem to be locked in a bit of a of a you know of, a, of an inability to kind of figure out as a group how to move forward. And that isn't to cast aspersions on the staff. It is it really is only to say that whatever help you need, um, you know, I I for one and want to make sure that you get it. So to the staff who are listening, I no disrespect meant to any of you. It really is, how do we help um, you uh, help us help the community? Thank you. All right, Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank staff for this uh, brief report, which I think is a good start for a general estimate, uh, but of course, much, much more fidelity of how to build the beds for the one or more mental health care and treatment facilities that certainly would be needed. Um, I appreciate the, the uh, uh, conversion idea, the short term uh, to meet our urgent needs by doing the subacute beds using the existing facility and hospitals. Uh, the beer conversion is certainly gonna be much quicker uh, to implement. So uh, specifically in this case, I believe the inpatient forensic unit, which is for inpatient medical and mental uh, uh, treatment the 40 beds, um, those are going to be in existing hospital hospitals, right? So uh, Dr. Smith, would you care to share what are the location you think those will be in at this point? Doctor, you're muted if you're speaking. Sorry, having trouble with my mute. Um, can I ask you to repeat the uh, question because you were cutting off on my computer? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. So uh, really, just focusing on the um, the questions on the patient forensic unit uh, that you itemized there as the 40 beds uh, with the uh, uh, through the conversion uh, of uh, existing wow. bed you know, hospitals right now. So. Uh, can you give us a, a little bit more detail as to which hospitals you think those will be converted and what type of numbers you're looking at? What we were looking at is what we think we will need in terms of beds. Um, and 40 is a rough estimate based on what we're seeing with the Murphy conservatorship increases. Um, the hospitals that we control currently um, that could potentially have housed those for our O'Connor and St. Louis. 
Um, there's probably easier construction process at O'Connor, but we've also got the other conflicting priority that our current census in all three hospitals is really at its max. Um, so purchasing another hospital would be an easier way of moving ahead. Um, but O'Connor is probably the best target. But when you and say 40, it doesn't necessarily mean that all 40 has to be in O'Connor, right? I mean, there's a possibility that you convert part of that in O'Connor and Ponce and Luis, correct? Yeah, you could. The problem is you lose, um, you lose uh, savings of scale because uh, you need to have special training and special security in the location. So if you have to double that, um, it causes problems and um, 40 in one location would be best, but it doesn't have to be that way. Okay, all right. So I guess if we're gonna do the uh, uh, review um, of, of our consultants as well in terms of construction, I don't know, would, would we also ask the consultant to look at this issue as well? Certainly. <laughs> Um, I guess the other issue I was thinking about is we keep talking about building a new building and come up the, the budget being 1.8 billion, which is uh, uh, frankly very astronomical. Um, looking at you know the construction of a brand new hospital building, of course, is not only expensive, right, but the timing is just very very long drawn out. And as we are now seeing that there's a higher vacancy of uh, a lot of office buildings and quite a few are brand new. I would be very interested to also see if there's a study uh, by the consultant to see if there's actually a possibility of converting uh, some type of existing office building um, to retrofit it, to create the bed space that we need, that we're looking for, uh, which of course will allow far quicker implementation of these beds uh, and potentially far cheaper than the $8 million a bed. Um, and is that doable? We can certainly ask them to look at that. Okay. Typically, that's hard to do because the requirements of the state um, with regard to construction of hospitals make it very difficult to convert a current building to compliance, but um, have for inpatient compliance. For outpatient mm -hmm. services, that's different. Um, and we've talked in the past about partial hospitalization, which in the um, report would come under residential um, support. So those kinds of things can be done typically with a current building being remodeled uh, to a certain extent, but it's very hard to meet OSHPOD requirements with a current building. You really have to rebuild the whole building, right? And and the um, and right now our facilities offer both inpatient and outpatient services, right? Correct. Yeah. So I'm I'm wondering maybe we could shift more of our inpatient to the spaces where we use outpatient and then uh, do outpatients on these areas. I'm again I'm just throwing out ideas, uh, really trying to find the quickest way to get these. Uh, 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 patients being served, I think, is, is important. So I just want to throw it in as another idea for the consultant to potentially look at. Okay. Um, sure. And then I would also like to uh, check in about, uh, thanks so much for the, uh, the analysis on the deflection center. Um, and, uh, and what I would like to ask the administration is to provide a, uh, the, a more fidelity of a cost breakdown of the reentry resource center operations. Uh, um, and uh, an estimated cost for including the components of the deflection center as listed in the, the bullet point in page five, since uh, we've got a good re-entry re 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 resource center already. Uh, it's just a matter of if you think you can incorporate those uh, and basically uh, turning into basically like a deflection center type of a uh, facility, I think that could be a, a very quick way of implementing that service. Uh, and potentially not be too pro cost prohibitive to make it happen. Um, so if we could add that, I certainly appreciate it. Surely.
Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Supervisor Lee? That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we've got uh, one minute to the aforementioned one o'clock. We have a lot of staff and members waiting to take a lunch. It's only going to be 30 minutes because of the length of this meeting. Vice President Ellenberg, any closing comments? Uh, yes, please. Um, mostly in response to the, the very thoughtful uh, comments from my, my colleagues. I, I first just want to clarify uh, on the motion for a consultant. That should be uh, utilizing the um, the delegation of authority that the board approved on October 18th um, for accelerated action on the behavioral health uh, crisis if, if needed to expedite the work. So that that fits in there. Um, I, I understand the the, the, the sentiment and, and the urge to get our hands around this whole piece and, and be able to quantify need. But I want to start with what we do know. Staff said, has told us that we need 219 uh, subacute beds, 500 overall. So we do have some numbers to start with. And I think that we should take that at face value. And, and what we need is a plan to add those beds, a specific plan that can be presented to the board regarding how we are going to fill all of those, um, how, how we're going to fulfill the goals set by our own administration. We did at first ask for this plan in May, still haven't seen anything. That's why I went through uh, the history today. Um, I think another piece is to think about um, repurposing BAP when that becomes vacant in theory in 2025. BAP has 48 beds, uh, but, but there, there are clearly so much input from, from all of us. When this consultant is brought on board, I'd, I'd like to recommend that they report directly to FGOC, uh, just as the jail consultant um, is overseen at, at PSJC. Okay. Thank you for your comments, Jess, before, I guess we have direction. We should probably have a motion to accept that direction, but Jess- I did make a motion and, and supervisor Lee second. Can I interrupt yeah. for a second? Yes, motion by Ellenberg, second by Chavez, Dr. Smith first, then Jess, we're gonna hear from the two members of the public. Then I'm gonna to turn to Supervisor Smithian, Dr. Smith. Um, I'm not sure that the delegation would cover the consultant, but I think if you give us direction in the motion that you're making right now, that should be adequate. Um, All right. That's fine. Thank you. Jess, mem two members of the public, please. Three members for two minutes each. Thank you. I think for the record, I have a motion from Ellenberg and a second by Lee. Correct. By Lee, and thank you. That's correct. Our first speaker is B. Beekman. I've unmuted you. Please accept the end. You'll have two minutes. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. It was so nice to hear. Uh, boy, it was uh, important to myself. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the words of Dr. Smith, who uh, just clearly tried to define what, what exactly uh, uh, people's rights are uh, in, in being on the streets. And um, excuse me, um, I'm at lunch right now. Uh, it is uh, it is important to just have the basic ground rules and understandings, uh, civil rights understandings of what people uh, are allowed, and and we really have to make those concepts clear in how what uh, Supervisor Chavez then suggested as we're trying to all develop new tools to understand what exactly is. Uh, but when when is when is help actually needed? If it, I suppose if it's a persistent issue, um, and that that is tough to figure it out, and, and I, just to have some good ground rules described by Dr. Smith uh, about civil rights, very much of a thank you. I would also like to suggest, um, you know, with all there's a, just in San Jose and in other places, I guess with Megan's Law rules, there's going to be a big push towards those things uh, that's wanted. Uh, people like the uh, Alameda County candidate for DA, she was running on a platform, you know, to really help uh, address what exactly are mental health issues in, in the system and, and to work uh, in more in their terms. I thought I would mention her, I don't, can't remember her name, but her work at this time, I think is, can be really valuable to have a, uh, a progressive viewpoint in, in, in these questions we're trying to address and always make sure that at Megan's Law issues every six months 
give that review process on the dot. Every six months, there's a review process. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leslie Zeger. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Leslie Zeiger, um, District 5 homeowner, a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart. Buildings don't solve problems. It's how we relate to each other that can heal us or harm us. So when County Exec proposes 299 out of 540 beds in locked or carceral facilities in response to a public health crisis in behavioral health issues, he is proposing that over half of the response to that crisis sets up situations that divide us though, into those who are allowed to lock people up and those who we, al we allow ourselves to lock up. That will only cause additional harm. Why not focus on rehabilitation and reentry, like the mental health residential facility or supported shelter? I hope the board and behavioral health services department will demand that county execs uh, December 6 plan include more spaces that provide rehabilitation and help people participate fully in society. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please go ahead. Um, hi, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hedges. I am also a member of showing up for racial justice, care first, jails never. And I echo everything that Leslie and Blair said. And um, I'm just shocked to hear that we want the majority of our new mental health beds to be in a carceral situation. And yes, if someone has been charged with a crime, that's one thing, but for people who are voluntarily going in, it doesn't make any sense that it has to be a locked facility like that. And um, something one of our members brought up is that most operating costs in locked facilities are not reimbursed by Medi-Cal. And for those reasons, much of these expenditures will likely fall to the county's general fund. And that's directly from the report. And it's not humane to have people in locked facilities if it's not absolutely necessary and it's more cost effective and it provides better social outcomes and we shouldn't be you know as leslie said dividing ourselves between people who can lock people up and people who should be locked up that's not how mental health care works thank you very much thank you our next speaker is rocio molina please go ahead Hi everyone, Rocio Molina from Catalyze SV here. I uh, definitely echo um, Catherine's comments about you know the need to build community and build a service um, structure that really connects to the needs of the population. And I think the behavioral health um, nonprofit partners in the room um, and in and in the sector, as well as the justice reform partners and the um, and the racial justice partners would agree that there is a gray. Um, a gray area as far as the population goes for those that are um, justice involved, but may be suitable for a diversion program. And how that all plays out, I think is going to take community engagement, is going to take collaboration between the various stakeholders and partners. And I definitely value the conversation um, that we're currently having about how to do that effectively that respects the rules and regulations that must be implemented, but we also must think about it in a creative way that brings in, you know, the, the right partners in the room to, to figure out how are we going to make it work for the community as well. Thank you so much. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you, Jessica. We have a motion by Ellenberg, a second by Lee Subras Samiti. Your hand. Thank you. Thank you. The, the motion at this point uh, to be, if it could be repeated, so I, I know where we've landed yes. on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, you're muted.
Sorry about that. Okay. So the motion was to return to the board with a plan uh, more specific than this one that compares various models, new construction, renovation, or partnership with private providers or neighboring counties. Provi um, I understand that Dr. Smith uh, said that we can't provide specific location options, so I'll take that out. Provides a more thoughtful cost estimate on, a, on facilities, compares models in use in other communities, and establishes a timeline. And if the level of planning is beyond the capacity of our staff to complete, which I think we've just decided, we're going to engage a contractor to develop the scope in parallel, it's similar to what we are doing with the jail project, to identify project requirements and use and use it to build a framework for the cost of facilities. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, after a wide ranging discussion, uh, I, we were all clear. I uh, am, I think your motion is very clear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Jess, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. And I'm going to turn to Dr. Smith for a moment. I just wanted to be clear about timing. Uh, there was some discussion about when the report would be asked, when the board was asking the report to come back. And uh, I wanted to hear that specifically. Thank you, Vice yeah. President Ellenberg. Thank you for following up. I, I did leave that out. I had um, asked you initially, but I think got lost in all of the questioning. Um, if we're going to have a consultant bring this back, then it may take a little bit longer. But what I'm just so concerned about is that we are not in parallel moving ahead with what we know we need now. So let, let's have the report back um, in parallel to hiring a consultant to look at the broader picture. All right. Supervisor Did that give you, sorry, Dr. Smith, does that, it, it, can you tell me is a month reasonable? Is two months necessary? Um, well, actually, probably three months would be deliverable um, with the kind of information that you're asking for. And um, but we also would do that in conjunction with our plans for mid-year because um, that's where we'll ask the board to make allocations about subacute facilities. Um, so um if you're asking me for a desired time it would be three months i want to keep that separate then from the report that is supposed to come back in december um from the the memo that supervisor uh, lee and i issued a couple of months ago uh, that report is to come back and the direction on the imd uh, beds that was made in may uh still needs to be moving forward. So for this report, three months is fine with a consultant, but don't want to change the time expectation of the 90 day um, assessment. Again, we have to be moving quickly with what we do know that we need. All righty, Supervisor Smithian. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify one more thing uh, through the chair with Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, I thought I recalled earlier in the motion, earlier in the conversation about the motion, a direction that the consultant's report, uh, assuming that one is forthcoming, would go to uh, FGOC, which I have uh, all good, uh, but I would like to ask that it also go to and through uh, the Health and Hospital Committee as the Committee of Jurisdiction. Makes sense, no problem with that. Thank you so much. Can I just be sure that we're talking yes. about the same thing? Yes. Um, we won't have a consultant's report in three months. I mean, it'll take us at least a month to hire a consultant, and they will take however long they think they need in order to get the information. But we will definitely be able to come back with a report about 
progress and where we think we're going. Thank you. The, the consultant is meant to enhance the work and our ability to move faster. It is not meant to replace the forward movement that that the board has already agreed on with regard to the number of beds that administration suggested. That still is the plan. We are just looking for ways to support and move it more quickly, not to slow it down. So the, the consultant should be helping us to focus on a bigger bigger picture without taking away from the other direction from the board to present responses to to questions and and direction that we have previously given and i'm happy dr smith uh to to sit with you uh, offline to work through all of this thank yes. you I'll, I'll i'll chime in as well when you hire a consultant it's been my experience that they sometimes are aware of best practices nationwide and to bring back ideas and concepts that can be complementary to what the board's wanting can be completely opposite of what the board was thinking or could could be um, half, half and half. So I, I, I'm not gonna be around for it, but I'd certainly um, encourage the board to not go too far down any road before you hear back from a consultant that may well cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, I know we all have our different opinions on consultants uh, over the years and over the projects, but if you hire somebody for advice, we, we got to be open and positioned to, to go that way. So God bless to all of you. All righty. Uh, roll call vote, please. Uh, I believe that was just clarification on the vote already taken, James. Oh, yes, it was. Another... Sorry, we did not add anything. It was clarification. Jess, thank you for that. Jess, will you please confirm one more thing before we adjourn? Oop, Supervisor Lee, additional comment? Uh, yeah, just a clarification since we're talking about deadlines and dates. Uh, I asked the administration to provide the cost breakdown for the uh, reentry uh, resource center operations the, into a deflection center. Uh, I just don't, I want to check with Dr. Smith. Do you need a deadline for this? Or do you think the 90 days will be sufficient for that come back to us? No, that'll be sufficient. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Jess, will you please confirm this for all of our uh, fans playing at home? When we come back from lunch, it'll be item 23, then 24, then 13, then 14, four, then 14 with 83. Oh, no, we handled 13. Thank you. Yep. 14, 14 with 83, then 15 and then 16 and 20 together. 16 through 20 together, yes. And then yes. we have a few more items after that. Yes, we do. Okay. All right. I think everybody's deserves a 43 minute lunch <laughs> instead of a 30 minute lunch. We'll see you all at two o'clock. Bye-bye. Except me, but thank you very much. Yes. Recording stopped.
Loretta, if you were doing a practice there, we didn't quite see what you were going for, but you've got two minutes to try again. Error users, sorry about that. Thank you. No problem. Or less, yes. Recording in progress. President Wasserman, I have 2 p.m. and I believe everyone you're expecting is in the room. Wonderful. Jess, would you please take a roll call to establish the presence of a quorum? Supervisor and... Lee. Good afternoon, Lee present. Supervisor Travis. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg is absent. And President Wasserman. Here. Thank you. Thank you. We're on to item number 23, the ward construction contract for child and adolescent psychiatric facility behavioral health services. Mr. Draper, I am looking for yes, you. Yes, sir. I'm here. I see Doug. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes. President, uh, members of the board, Doug Koenig, Deputy Director of Capital Programs. Uh, as you're all aware, uh, administration has been negotiating with WebCore. Uh, an agreement to construct the new child and adolescent uh, psychiatric facility in the, the uh, Behavioral Health Services Center. Uh, we believe we're in days of uh, finalizing that agreement. And because of that, rather than wait another three weeks for the next board meeting, uh, we are seeking this delegation of authority uh, to the county executive uh, to, the war to award the contract as soon as it's finalized in order to expedite the, the uh, project. Um, are there any questions? Thank you, Doug. Supervisors, any questions? I'm not seeing any. Oops, I apologize. Supervisor Simity. Thank you. Um, it could, are the folks from Harvey Rose and Veneer on uh, the call as well or in the meeting, uh, Mr. President? I'm looking on screen one. I don't see them. Let me look on to screen two, and if they're there, anybody from Harvey Rose, please speak up. They were not on my panelist list today. Screen two, not on the list. Supervisor. Well, I, I, some questions. Um, where are we on timeline now uh, in terms of the, uh, the completion date? There's been some late breaking developments here, I gather. I think the uh, the completion date that we reported at the uh, HHC uh, committee meeting, uh, well, actually, the uh, beneficial occupancy date of July 16, 2025, has not changed. Um, uh, we, what we had in the report initially, we had said 807 days. That was, uh, we had uh, uh, confused calendar days with work days. Uh, the 807 actually translates to, to the 1065. So, so. That did not reflect a delay in the in the uh, schedule. And the delegation of authority, whether this is for Dr. Smith or for Council, is time limited. In what way? I'm. I, I my concern, candidly, is that uh, the board stay on top of this project. As you know, Mr. Koenig, we've had. Um, unfortunately repeated assurances about timing that have then uh, not been realized and um, additional delays 
And so I, I you know, I, I'm understanding of the desire to provide a delegation of authority uh, and not cost us another three weeks. On the other hand, I don't want to discover that the delegation of authority is then somehow usable to let things slip even longer. So where where are we in that? Uh, let me turn to Mr. Williams uh, and or Dr. Smith. Doctor, if you're talking, you're muted. James or Jeff, one of you two, come on on. The delegation of authority contemplates the execution of a very specific agreement with dollar amounts and so forth. Um, the board could certainly add an expiration time to that, um, such as you know early December, so that that delegation would expire. But it's not it's not your traditional delegation that um, is untethered from a very specifically contemplated agreement. So the wording is based on a very specific amount and a um, number of days. I'm talking about 23 possible action A. Well, I, I'm sorry, you're talking about what again, please, through the chair? Act, possible action A under 23. So yeah. you may wish to add an end date to that. Well, the uh, the the calendar days, um, the so the could I get a just a I apologize, a lot of moving parts here. Um, could I get a the last line of that three line subparagraph a should read how again well if i understood what you were your concern and maybe i didn't understand it correctly but if i understand your concern uh you wanted to make sure that this delegation itself um ended on a date certain so i have two concerns mr williams uh and thank you for your insight in parsing them one is absolutely as you describe it uh, you know, I want to know that the delegation of authority is um, time limited so that the um, control for decision making rests, as I think it appropriately should, uh, with the board at a date certain. But I also want to be clear now the construction time is described how? Uh, construction time is described under action A, and it was corrected to 1065 days so one yeah 1065 days calendar days work days Cal calendar days okay. thank you and my concern next which is an integration of the two concerns mr smith uh mr williams is i want to make sure that there is not some change to those days during the time when the delegation of authority is there dr smith can you help me on that in other words, I want to make sure that if we provide the delegation of authority necessary to keep things moving, that six weeks it doesn't come back and somebody tell me, oh, it's really 1,200 days. Yeah, there's the delegation doesn't allow for changing the uh, dates of completion. It's just to complete the contract. All right, then uh, I'm going to uh take some solace in that i may be prepared to offer a motion in a minute but i want to hear from my colleague supervisor lee first uh, mr chairman i see that his hand is up and uh then i'm happy to make a motion thank you supervisor lee <clears throat> thank you um just though uh going back to the 807 versus the uh so <clears throat> it turns out that the mr draper 807 is actually the work days uh, as opposed to calendar days is that what the confusion was Yes, correct. that's correct, Supervisor. Okay, so based on that, it means it's only, is this a five-day work week? I'm, I'm sorry? Are these, are these five-day work weeks? In other words, they're supposed to take that. It, well, that it's generally a five, it's a five-day work week. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, I'm sorry? Nope, go ahead. My apologies. No, it's, it's a five-day work week. It's it's based on, you know, an annual, uh, within the construction industry, they have a an annual construction calendar. But essentially, it's a five-day work week. You know, I was quite impressed the other day. I was sitting eating uh, uh, outside in the Sunnyvale downtown, looking at the downtown construction on the Saturday, and those cranes were moving on the Saturday. So, uh, is there a possibility for us to look into having that work week be extended to six days? That was significantly, uh, I think, save quite a bit of time, isn't it? 
Well, the, maybe a possibility. One of the things they build into their schedule is, is that they count on the Saturdays to, to, you know, for acceleration, should they get behind. So, you know, if they, if they were to take a, you make it a six day work week, if they could, and I'd have to look at the, uh, uh, the ordinances. Um, yeah. They, um, uh, it wouldn't necessarily translate into, uh, you know, a six day constant work week. And I'm not sure they're, they're, uh, subcontractors would sign up to that. When we went uh, when we went through this with the previous contractor, uh, there were very, uh, very few contractors that were interested in uh, established six day work weeks or double shifts. Uh, they believed that uh, if time was the, the issue, that uh, the, the best way to approach that was with with the larger crews and, and regular shift. So yeah, so obviously the larger crew would be a good thing, but as we all know, um, given what uh, delay this project has gone through, uh, and and I don't have to remind that with Supervisor Smidian, uh, I think there certainly is an urgency to to speed up or speed up this process, whatever way we can. So I certainly would like to go and ask if you could check in with uh, WebCore uh, if there's any possibility of uh, shifting the schedule so that we are looking at a uh, uh, six day work week or adding some double shift from time to time in order to keep the schedule moving so that we could actually come in sooner than, than later. Certainly, we, we will certainly uh, uh, request that they do that. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Supervisor Simidian. Comments and a motion? Uh, one more question for the County Council. Presumably, the recommended action, which might be amended slightly. Is the uh, all three items A, B, and C contained in our published agenda? Yes. Yes. And Dr. Smith, any reason why uh, the uh, uh, delegation of authority would need to be uh, in place after December 16th, which is the end of that work week? That's a Friday. Um. Well, I just promised you that the delegation wouldn't change the dates of completion. So if you ignore my promise, uh, <laughs> that would be okay. I, I certainly don't want to ignore your promise. I want to say thank you for your promise. Uh, but I also want to know that at any given point in time, uh, any change uh, would have to be uh, within the purview of the board. So why don't I say uh, I am prepared to move the recommend, well, let me ask one more question, Dr. Mm -hmm. Smith. The, the 1,065 calendar days uh, could be uh, stipulated as a, uh, in the motion that the delegation of authority, even though it, I know you say it does not apply to the calendar days, that the delegation of authority will not uh, affect those days. That wouldn't cause you any difficulty in wrapping this up, yes? Yeah, I think um, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but I think what your question is, is that we don't want to use the delegation to extend the time period, but if we can use the delegation to, you know, decrease the time period, that would be okay. Yeah, so I think what, thank you, you got it, and uh, thank you for being crisper than I was in articulating it. I, I know I uh, wandered around a little bit there. Uh, so I am prepared to move the recommended actions A, B, and C uh, as contained in our published packet for item 23. This is packet page 564 with the delegation of authority to expire uh, on December 31st of 2022 and with the uh, direction that uh, under no circumstances shall the delegation of authority be used to extend the construction time beyond the 1,065 calendar days contained uh, in the uh, corrected recommended action and with direction consistent with the conversation with Supervisor Lee to administration to continue to explore opportunities to expedite the timeline. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. You want to second that? Yes. Thank and you. then, Dr. Smith, was that clear and all manageable in your uh, thinking? Yes, that's clear. Thank you. And thank you for helping me get it clearer. 
All Thank right, you. that's what I motion? got, and I'll take a yes. Thank you, good. We've got a motion and a second. Those speakers, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Travis? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. We now move on to item number 24 regarding 650 South Bascom Avenue tenant improvements report. I've got Jeff Draper on my agenda. Supervisor Smitty, your hand is just up there. We got rid of it. It's lingering when it should. Lingering, all right. Lingering digits. Okay, I'm Jeff Draper. I'm looking for President, you. Yes, President Wasserman, I'm present. Yes, thank you. Go right ahead. So you have thank our you report. You have. Uh, you, have, uh, you have our report. Uh, I'm ready to take questions if if there are some. I think right now the Super. construction TIs are supposed to be finished in March and the building open in May is the current schedule. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Draper, for this. Um, just want to check in with you to see uh, in your conversation with uh, MCM and the uh, contractor, uh, any uh, uh, um, solutions or try to get things speed up? Any, any uh, takeaway you get from talking to them? We 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 uh, work with them obviously very regularly and been checking in on opportunities to move the project forward. They they're still working through the hazardous abatement process. Mm -hmm. The project is moving at good speed. I think we'll have updates for you as we move along, but they haven't made any you know commitments to move it forward just yet. Okay, and they mentioned something about some problem of getting permitting with the city and all that. Did you hear anything uh, on that as well? Or I, I believe it was resolved. Okay, good, good, good. I I was extending. Uh, the possibility of contacting the mayor if uh, if they are not uh, cooperating fast enough. So certainly we want to do whatever we can uh, to to help them. Uh, whatever Thank you for that offer. All right. Okay. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. It was received report only. We have no other hands and we have no speakers. So we will consider 24 as having been received. I'm now going to move on and just correct me at any time to item 14, which is being heard with item 83. Item 14 is the monthly report on the Valley Homeless Health Care Program. And item 83 that was on consent, uh, pulled off and combined, if memory serves me right, perhaps Supervisor Chavez, um, consider recommendations relating to 2011 Little Orchard Street. Supervisor Chavez, was that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Do you want to take the... Uh, lead on this with your questions and your combining? Yes, thank you very much. Um, you first, let me, let me say the staff, um, outstanding reports and very good information um, on the VHHP, just all the work that you're doing. My question really centers on how long, you know, the length of the um, the hoteling at um, the Picardo Center relative to the work that I understand we're trying to do with reestablishing a, a similar center at BMC campus, the wellness center. Could you just talk a little bit about that, Paul? Sure. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez, um, and through the chair, Supervisor Wasserman. Yes. Um, so at present, we've been fortunate um, through the COVID experience uh, obtain a hotel via lease that has really been um, supporting the program much more to the to the degree that we had hoped. Um, so the lease, I believe, is for another 12 months, uh, which would accommodate the program as we look to accommodate a new facility on the VMC campus. Uh, we have gone through some preliminary planning in terms of the number of beds. Uh, as well as some preliminary design of the building on the comp on the complex. The challenge that we're facing in working with FAF is the entire master planning effort. And what we want to do is make sure that we situate the, the new respite center on the BMC campus in a manner that is consistent in, in terms of adjacency and, and program and programming. Uh, so that's pretty much where we're at today. Our hope is that we, within the next 12 to 24 months, um, we will have a new location on the campus here at Valley Medical Center. All right. Paul, well, could you just share with us when that master plan will come back to the board? 
I believe the county executive yes. has identified with FAF to come back to the board in January. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I know Jeff Draper is on the line. He can confirm. Yeah, I, I can I can confirm that, Paul. You're you're exactly right. Oh, okay. So if that'll come back, the plan will come back in January. Can we agendize the the um, medical respite site concurrent to that discussion? And mostly just because I don't want to lose sight of it. And I know it's connected to some long-term care work also, Paul, that you all are working on. Um, but I would like to be able to understand what the implications of the, gen the um, master plan are for the medical respite center. And yes. with that, I... I would move item 83 um, and, and, you know, by the way, I think home first does great work. And one question that I'm sure we don't know the answer to yet, but irrespective of when the medical respite site comes to us, we still may need the home first partnership. So I, I don't think one negates the other. Is that correct, Paul? That's correct. We are going to continue to provide clinic service at the uh, home first location. Great. Okay. We have a motion. Oh, Supervisor Chavez, I was, you made a motion to approve 83. 83 with the report back on the medical respite center as part of the January uh, report yep. back on the general plan. And um, yes, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just looking for a second on I'll one. second. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Your hand is raised. Do you have additional comments or was that to second? Yes, uh, it's a it's a second. Uh, this, we're on 83. Are we talking about 14 as well? Yes, but we're voting, on 80. we're voting on 83 right now. Okay, and then we'll talk 14 later. Thank you. Yes, so Jess, roll call vote, please, on number 83. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you. And now we return to item 14. Supervisor Chavez? Um, thank you. I, I did not pull this item. This is a regular item, and I know that staff needs to give a very brief report. Okay. And Supervisor Lee, you had comments on 14. Do you wish to hear from staff first? Yes, yeah, staff first, please. Thank you. All righty. So on item 14, I think we're back to you, Paul. Thank you, President Wasserman. The uh, item before you is, of course, our monthly report. A couple of things that you should note is one is your approval for the uh, annual grant to HRSA. Yep. That application is in the amount of 22, 2 million. 50, 2.5 million. And then also including your report is the quality improvement program update as well as the grant budget update. I believe that there was an advisement uh, from your board to come back specifically from Supervisor Lee to see if we can acquire uh, the vehicle for the backpack medicine program sooner than later. And in fact, uh, we were able to work with FAF to accelerate that schedule and have the vehicle present no later than March of next year. Fantastic. Uh, so with, so with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Well, first of all, I want to thank staff uh, and Paul for your hard work on this uh, monthly report. And I'm certainly very pleased to see that there's been great progress made on purchasing this print of van and uh, to be delivered by March 31st. And I really hope that it would even arrive sooner than that, because this is something that uh, our, our VHXP uh, 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 folks have been uh, talking about for a long time. Um, and certainly, I, I, I have to say that I've heard nothing but praises about the work that BHHP has been doing. Uh, a few of suggestions that we've received to better assist the great work that BHHP has been doing is around improving some of the transportation services, like additional staffing or maybe other quality of life improvements for our case managers and our clients. So in that spirit, I'm asking for an agenda report for the administration the research and provide options for improved transportation services, like a shuttle service, for example, along with the capacity of a case manager to be notified when the client becomes incarcerated, and an additional social worker therapist to assist the clients. Okay, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I'm happy to second. Did we second this one already? I'm sorry. No, we have not. <laughs> Okay, I'll second the motion from Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Uh, and then I would like to ask that we make sure we get updates on the number of medical respite patients who we are able to secure transitional or permanent housing for while they are in respite or refer for housing. And I'm particularly interested in determining whether or not CalAIM 
um, and that we're able to use Kellyanne Housing and Navigation Services um, as part of our programming. If we can include that as part of the motion, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Yes, we do. Definitely. Thank you. And just to be clear, the uh, yeah the motion would be to include all the possible action of A through E on page three thirty nine. Thank you. Yep. No, it was A A through D is action, and E was receive only. Thank you. A through D. But let's. You. Okay, that's fine. So we have a motion by Lee to approve A through D, a second by Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still raised. Your hand is down. Jess, roll call vote. We have no speakers. Supervisor Lee. Hi. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you very much. With that, my compadres, we move to item number 15, acquisition and use of body-worn cameras. Supervisor Simidian, do you wish to speak first or hear from staff? Well, uh, let's hear the staff presentation, please. All righty. I'll turn to Acting Sheriff Kenneth Bender. Or Lieutenant Jonathan Stream. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, I'm Lieutenant John Stream. I'm uh, a lieutenant here in our training division. And as well as overseeing uh, in service training, I also oversee our body worn camera program. I have a real quick uh, statement and then I'll be available for questions. Um, transparency and accountability are cornerstones of modern policing. The community expects proper documentation and real time evidence of law enforcement encounters. This agreement with Axon Enterprise ensures continuing operations of body-worn cameras and the addition of unlimited storage for digital evidence, modern technology for collecting and retrieving digital evidence, technology designed to rapidly deploy resources during critical incidents, and mechanisms for supervisorial oversight and accountability. The agreement also includes VR training specifically designed to place deputies in the shoes of members of our community who may be in crisis, so the deputies can better build rapport and be empathetic with those individuals they encounter. The Axon officer safety package allows the county to take advantage of bundled pricing, potentially saving the county millions of dollars over buying the needed pieces of software and technology separately. I'm happy to answer any questions about the operational needs of the equipment. And the chief of procurement, Gene Clark, is also on the call today and available to answer any questions related to the contract. Thank you. Super. Supervisor Simonian. Yes. Um, the cost of the program for five years has gone up dramatically. Could you explain what that's about? Sure. So there's a couple factors involved there. Um, things go up over time as they do with costs. Um, you know, we were talking with Axon and for example, they were talking about, you know, next year in 2023, they expect their costs to go up 10 to 15% just based on equipment and labor. But in addition to the cost over time and, and inflation, we're also adding some additional pieces of software that were not available when body cameras were a brand new technology. And I'm happy to go down these, but they're essentially pieces of software that help us ingest digital evidence, store digital evidence, make processes more efficient in increased transparency and accountability. Well, <laughs> Let me, um, I'm, I'm looking at this and the first, I'm looking at packet page 397, which is the second page of the referral from Acting Sheriff Binder. And the contract history reminds us that the five-year contract initially was for less than $4 million. Um, and it was notable now that if I understand the five-year price tag is $16 million. Is that correct, sir? 15.8, yes, sir. All right. So let me just say a 300% increase is a lot of inflation. Forgive me for being just that blunt. Uh, but uh, I find that hard to countenance. Um, and my concern is that it appears to me from looking at the documents like some of that cost increase is tied to the interoperability, the compatibility with the tasers. Am I reading that correctly or no? 
you know, the tasers have been removed from this agreement. If if and when we bring tasers back in February uh, at your direction, the tasers are interoperable and and have those same built-in accountability measures, but the tasers are not part of this agreement. So are you, are you telling us that a 300% increase from the first five-year contract to the second five-year contract is a function of inflation and new features? Yes, sir. Mostly new features. As I stated, there's significant features that are a big improvement for our office and keep us as a modern contemporary law enforcement agency. Yeah, you don't have to sell me on body warrants. You may or may not recall I was the proponent of body warrants, which were not fully embraced when I suggested them five years ago, six years ago now. And I'm very pleased, and I mean this quite sincerely, to hear that the department now has fully embraced, embraced the importance of body warrants. But as I say, I, I don't need to be persuaded. It was a referral I brought uh, back in you know, 2015, 16, I can't remember when, uh, but I'm, I'm looking at uh, $12 million in increased costs without a real clear understanding of what that's about. I guess my next question would be, if there are these new features, um, that involve the ability to access additional information under different circumstances and or store it, uh, what are the implications for our surveillance ordinance? And does that then mean we should be looking at amendments to the surveillance ordinance before, excuse me, to your use policies before we um, authorize the expenditure of the funds consistent with the ordinance? Turning to county council now. James. Mr. Williams, County Council. Rob, Thank you, Supervisors. Um, as I understand the uh, additions, uh, Supervisor, there is nothing uh, that's being added that triggers the surveillance um, ordinance. The things that are being added as described by the Sheriff's Office, as uh, we understand them, are not new surveillance technology but it's how to process the uh, existing body-worn camera uh, footage and retain, store, and, and um, address that data. So our, our um, assessment is that there would be no need to revise the use policy. That said, the use policy is always subject to the board's discretion and approval. And to the extent the board wanted any updates to that use policy, we would work with the department as well as with you as the uh, board um, member most interested in these issues to ensure that an updated policy was presented to the full board and then to the unions for consideration. Has, has this set of questions around the surveillance ordinance been vetted by our Office of Privacy, which I know is understaffed at the moment supervisor rob coelho assistant county council i do not know whether uh it's been vetted with the privacy office i would defer to the sheriff's office and county administration okay i'm not aware that it's been vetted with a privacy officer let me ask, has it been vetted with, uh, has any of this been vetted with our Office of um, Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring, OCLAM? I don't know if Mr. Janako or some other representative of the OIR group is on the call today in that capacity. Mr. Janako, if you're here, join in. I'm going to my second screen. Jess, I don't see him, do you? I don't believe he was on my list today either. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask that we continue this item to our next meeting uh, in uh, December. And I'm going to ask that the Privacy Office take a look at the issues that I've raised. I'm going to ask that OCLAM take a look at not only those issues, but other issues. And I'm going to ask for a clearer explanation of a 300% increase in costs. Um, you know, on the one hand, we're being told 
oh, these uh, upgrades aren't significant enough that they present any uh, new issues in terms of surveillance technology. On the other hand, we're being told that it's $12 million more for a contract uh, that was uh, 4 million and is now 16 million. So that's my motion is to continue. Okay. We have a second by Lee. Lieutenant, did you have an extra comment? I, I do, Supervisor. Um, I just want to address a couple of those things. As far as on the surveillance technology side, there is nothing changing about what is being recorded as well as what the retention policies are with that. And that's why we don't believe that it is triggering uh, a surveillance policy. Also, in regards to the increase, I'd like to note um, that in addition to the original agreement in 2016, there was several amendments that happened after that, uh, including to where the contract was extended last year on a one year, to where this increase is actually in this first year only going to be an increase of $936,000 for the first year. And that would, then there's an ongoing cost there. There'd have to be a budget request. So the increase this year over the last year is, is not quite as high as this is being represented, um, and there is no new recording or retention that's occurring. Okay, Supervisor Lee. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I threw the chair. Lieutenant, yeah. the first five years was 4 million. The new five years is 16 million. Is that correct, please, for the record? The first five years started out at 3.9. In 2018, there was an amendment that increased it from 1.7 to 3.9 on May 8th, 2018. And then after that, there was a one year extension that also increased it. I'm gonna try again, Lieutenant, and forgive me if my language was less precise, but I want some ownership of these cost increases by your organization. The contract initially, was for less than $4 million for the first five years. Yes, please. When it was initially signed, it was, yes. The contract you are now proposing for the subsequent five years is almost $16 million, yes? Correct. All right, let's just get that of record. I'm gonna ask that the minutes reflect those responses, please. And if it sounds like I'm prickly today, Lieutenant, it's because I am. We've had plenty of time to bring this matter forward to the board in a thoughtful and thorough way, and we continue to have what I consider to be a less than complete explanation for what's happening here and what's driving these costs. So I'm hoping that when it comes back the next time, we get it. I spent months telling the department through the chair that I wasn't amenable to uh, including tasers before there was a new sheriff. The department felt compelled to push that forward nonetheless, and it was very quickly um, eliminated by the, the board. And so now here we are again, and I'm feeling jammed, quite frankly, and it's not a good feeling. So let's get the information out there and be clear about what it's costing and why uh, before we just routinely say, sure, we're gonna go ahead and authorize a contract, which is literally four times the initial contract for five years. Thank you. Mr. I, if, if I may, I, I would be happy to discuss the options. I think that you um, being concerned about accountability and transparency will like a lot of these features and what they're used for. Okay. I'm now turning, I'll be to you, Supervisor Lee, in just one second. Assistant Sheriff Rodriguez has been waiting. Good afternoon, honorable members of the board. Um, First, I'd like to thank you for hearing this matter. I think it's extremely important for you to give us uh, the platform to talk to you and, and tell you what our plans are for the future. And I understand the concern Supervisor Semidian has in regards to the contract. Um, clearly, there are some things that we need to look at, but I do believe that we're looking at a very um, technologically savvy um, piece of technology and we've been utilizing this platform for a long time. Uh, clearly the price has increased, but we are moving to a new, basically a, a more adaptable uh, model that clearly is more expensive. Um, but we're also looking at the large number of licenses that each item has. 
And I believe that's part of the problem. I think part of the issue, and again, I have to go back and look at the actual contract that we signed back uh, five years ago, but I believe that the licenses is what's driving the cost um, because we are getting more than just the BWC. We're looking at the um, ad the continuing use of our um, evidence.com for unlimited amount uh, because that is one of the things that we're seeing is that because of the, the new uh, request from the county and from the public and from DOJ, we have to maintain uh, certain things and available uh, for longer periods of time. So we need to increase the amount of data that is stored. And I think that's another issue that's driving up the cost. We certainly can come back to the board at a future time and give you some more information on this. But I do think that it's important for us to continue to have this resource available for our deputies. Um, because as, as Supervisor Estimating stated, um, perhaps there was a little bit of, of going back and forth before when this was proposed by Supervisor Estimating, but we truly do see the need to have this available to our staff. We see that there is a huge impact that is had when we're able to view um, what our deputies are doing and to provide um, access to the district attorney to see what our deputies are doing when they're uh, talking to our community members. So this is clearly something that we need. It's for transparency purposes. And I understand the concern. I will, uh, we can definitely come back like I stated, uh, but I do believe that we we're not trying to in any way um, put the blinders on to any of you as far as to what we're trying to do. I do really do think that a lot of it has to do with the licenses and the driving, the, the cost of the technology. Because again, we are looking at um, top of the line technology from Axon. Thank you. And our chief procurement officer, Mr. Clark, you have a comment as well? I do. Thank you, members of the board. Gene Clark, chief procurement officer. I would simply note respectfully that the agreement does expire December 12th. So that would put the uh, county in a position for its evidence-based tracking uh, devices not to be covered under contract. So I just want to put that out there on the table uh, as a point of uh, point for now. Thank you. Okay, and I think the motion in the second is for it to appear on the December first. Is that correct, Supervisor Smithian? If that's our first meeting in the month of December, yes, it is. And I have an additional comment. Okay. December sixth. December sixth. Yes. Okay. And December 12th, the contract expires. And Mr. Clark, that that may result in a difference in price, correct? Well, what would happen? You wouldn't have the um, the terms and conditions in place that would afford you the services uh, in a strict sense. Uh, if we did go back and negotiate later, yeah, we would have to pay a little bit more money. My thought on this would be to go ahead and... Um, approve this to keep the services in place, but I also would suggest possibly we could pull this effort in immediately when the new sheriff arrives and not wait till February. Um, I don't know if that helps or not, but I'm trying to problem solve here myself. My concern would be that the county does not have a contract, and that does include uh, the current tracking of the devices as well as what is archived in the event that um, a video is needed, et cetera. Um, it's just a lot, obviously makes a lot more strong sense to have a, um, a contract in place. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. First, let me say, I have always appreciated Mr. Clark's uh, inclination to problem solve. That being said, I think it's important that we not conflate two issues. I think part of what Mr. Clark was talking about was the tasers, which we have separately identified as an item that requires some policy discussion and that should appropriately be heard after the new sheriff has had the opportunity to uh, take uh, his new role, give this matter some attention and come back to us in February. That's different than the motion which I have put forward, which is to continue this item to the first meeting in December, which I think we've now clarified is December the 6th. Yes. It strikes me that December the 6th is six days before December the 12th. And so if we take action on the 6th, presumably that would solve the problem. Yes, Mr. Clark. 
Uh, very good. That would solve the problem. Thank you very right. much. Because now, yes. having said that, in my effort to problem solve in real time, I will not ever be comfortable if I feel like we are being jammed. And that's the way I feel today, Mr. Chairman. I feel like we are being jammed. We got brought an inadequate referral from the Sheriff's Department that attempted to push items through first before there was a new sheriff. Then once we clarified that we wanted the policy decisions to wait for the new sheriff, we got an inadequate submittal today with no real explanation for the multi-million dollar cost increase. And then we're told if we don't take action on what's before us today, that we will no longer have the benefit of the system and it will be our fault. And as the person who proposed this in December of 2014, candidly, I, I find that really hard to stomach. I'm sorry to make it personal, but that's the way I feel about it. I just feel like we're getting jammed and or like we're getting rolled by the vendor, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, I, I usually try to be a little more guarded in my language, but not today. Uh, it's like, look, let's get this thing looked at. Let's get it looked at carefully. Let's have the right folks looking at it. That includes OCLEM, that includes our privacy office. And it means that we need to have a really thorough explanation of what it is we're getting for the money and why that doesn't constitute a cause for concern with the privacy. And as I said, it's a little counterintuitive to say it's not that big a deal, but it's a big enough deal that it costs a significant amount more money. So that's where I am. And that's why the motion is on the floor. I, I now absolutely can't vote for this thing today. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Uh, actually, the, the my question was answered basically was trying to figure out that if this were continued, how that would affect the uh, the contract or whether we might lapse the contract. That was my main concern. Okay. Um, and the, the other thing I was going to ask the tenant, uh, just uh, uh, following the discussion in terms of costs. So even though initially it was like uh, 3.98 million, at the end of the day, the first five years actually went up to close to $8 million, right? So the contract has the overrun. So at the end of the day, the, the five year actually costs close to $8 million. Is that correct? From, from the report, that's what seems like it has gone through that the Fifth Amendment that increased to $8 million. Yeah, the amendment, the amendment to $8 million was for the sixth year. Oh, the sixth year. Okay. Correct. So the at the end of the five year, it was up to $5.7 million for the five years. I see. I'm sorry. Okay, got it. So five years, 5.7, but by the eighth year, they, they went up to to eight. Uh, for Wow, that's a lot for the for last year. But the, anyway, so that's just what. So at this point, we are actually, okay, I got it. Um, all, right. all right. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just chime in and turn to Dr. Smith. Supervisor Smith, your hand is down. You, you got a step ahead of me. Good job. I just want to say when we signed the contract to build our house, plywood, plywood was $20 a sheet. When we actually bought the plywood, it was $80 a sheet. It's down about half that, but we just ended up with the same plywood. I do hope whatever product we end up with is better than what we originally had, is state of the art, all the bells and whistles as the assistant sheriff mentioned. Dr. Smith. Yeah, I just wanted to do uh, <clears throat> a little suggestion of uh, problem solving. Uh, if the board puts it over to the 8th of December, the we'll sixth. have uh, Gene and uh, the sheriff sit down and um, pare down the cost as much as possible, eliminate any connection to take Lamb and our privacy officer as part of the motion to continue that we get clarity about what the basis for the increases from less than 4 million to 5 million plus and then subsequently to 8 million were for in other words what prompted those increased costs and part of the reason for asking Mr. Chair is I think that both the oral presentation today and the written presentation in our packet, frankly, conflated those increases uh, in a way that did not distinguish uh, that, you know, one of the increases was because we bought more time and um, one of them was presumably for other reasons. But I think if we're going to be making apples to apples comparisons and if people are going to say, well, 
It actually did go up later anyway, so it's not that big of an increase, still pretty big, um, that there needs to be some intellectual rigor about the fact that uh, some of the increases that are highlighted were simply for additional time uh, as we extended the contract. Understood, thank you. And I see Supervisor Lee nodded as well, head as well. We have a motion, we have a second, no members of the public. Just I do. I do have one request from the public. Well, it just popped up at the end of my sentence. Go right ahead, please, Jess. Our first speaker is Irvish. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, the Board of Supervisor. I again wanted to acknowledge the fact about uh, item number 15, which is about body worn cameras and technology agreement. Uh, we, are, we are prone to living in the world with the technology that's been around and been utilized by a lot of people. And we do know that, uh, understandably, that, you know, how the technology on a different platforms work. So uh, I, 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 incline to, I incline to go subsequently into the all three topics of A, B, and C, where it is important to drive the cost and as well as derive the legality of, of the procedural Hard for the procurement of uh, the technology that is required to be incorporated within the county sheriff's department. It is also equally important to 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 measure the facts that whether how much how much of the utilization of this technology is required, what drives the cost behind it, and as well as what is the benefits that is going to be available to the sheriff's department in terms of utilizing the technology. Whether we do know that that with the current technological de uh, development platforms, it is it is to be to be utilized by every other phone. But how much it is important for the governance, uh, you know, having the technology platform to be utilized, and equally, more importantly, what, is there a reason to drive the cost from the general fund contingency reserve funds? rather than allowing the procurement and the purchase of a technology from a regular funds. What is that driving this particular technology to have the funding be available from a specific funds and not having the investment to be done in an appropriate way, where if the cost is being increased, it can be covered appropriately through other investment. Thank you very much. And that concludes our requests. Thank you very much. Roll call vote, please, Jess. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you. That was item number 15. We're now going to hear items 16 through 20 together, as was previously agreed upon. There's a total of five actions during these uh, five items, plus there are two, I guess you could say seven actions, because there's five actions plus two that say final adoptions on our next board meeting, which is December what, Supervisor Smithian? The sixth. Say again, sir. Forgive I me. Said, we have five actions plus two adoptions on these five items. And those two adoptions are to be on our next board meeting, which is December. Sixth. Hey, all right. So Sylvia, I see you on screen right now. I'm going to start with you. And uh, how do you suggest, Sylvia, these five items be handled together, as was the board's direction? Well, I'm happy to present on all of the items. And Excuse then. Excuse me, one second, Deputy County Executive, for interrupting you. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Thank you. I, I just wanted staff to walk us through the timeliness of this again with the new sheriff coming in in just a couple of weeks. And so I, I actually was concerned about this 16 through 20 um, anyway, because I would like the new sheriff to give us their perspective on it. It's a it's a big change. Thank you. Sure, sure. And happy to speak to that as part of my comments, because I did on two occasions have a conversation with the sheriff elect, you know, based on the current tally and did share the proposals um, with him. So happy to incorporate that in the presentation. Thank you, please go right ahead. Oh, Dr. Smith. I guess I was gonna preempt Sylvia a little bit, but um, 
<clears throat> the motivation for creating these positions has to do with concerns, particularly at the hospitals, but also in social services that our employees have about safety. And what we're talking about is creating new positions that would have partial peace officer status, which would enable them to um, carry weapons and um, actual do arrests. And um, we're not talking about eliminating the current PSOs. We're talking about creating a new position, which the current PSOs could apply for, um, or if they desire not to, they don't have to, they would not lose their jobs. Um, they would uh, not lose their opportunity to participate. It's really a matter of creating a job classification that would uh, address the security concerns that our employees have. And that's what's moved it so, somewhat uh, expeditiously because we're worried about our employees feeling unsafe in the workplace. Thank you. That's so, great. So we go ahead. Thank you, sir. I'm happy to supplement those comments. So again, Sylvia Gallegos, Deputy County Executive, and I'm representing a rather large interdisciplinary work group, some of whom are here, including Assistant Sheriff Dahlia Rodriguez, Captain Eric Borsa. From ESA, we have Michelle Kwan, an HR manager, and also Matt Cottrell representing um, labor relations. Um, to get to your first comment, I will describe the five proposals. Item 16 is, in effect, a report that um, endeavors to describe this plan, which is, as the county exec indicated, the creation of a new classification with job duties. And that's reflected in item 17. And then we are, uh, and this is item 18, in effect, through uh, adoption of a salary ordinance, adding 75 of these new positions to the sheriff department, as well as deleting 12 vacant PSOs, 11 at the hospital and one in the library. We also are finally creating the appropriate management structure that was has been uh, long overdue. And um, item 19 would appropriate funds from a reserve that was set up specifically for this purpose. And item 20 would add in effect to supplement the existing um, management structure, we would add an, a lieutenant and four sergeants. So right now we have one existing captain, Captain Borsa, and then we then add the new lieutenant, and then we have one existing sergeant. The salary ordinance would add four sergeants, but only two of the four are funded at this time because we wanted this to be a cost neutral proposal in the current year. And the sheriff would, through the recommended budget, um, request funding for the other two sergeants. So that's overarching the proposal. While we've done exceptional work with respect to uh, physical security through the facility security um, program, through both uh, assessments, fortifications, adding surveillance cameras and panic buttons and as well as training, there are times when we need at certain facilities to supplement that with security personnel. And in effect, what I want to say about this proposal is it, it is our declaration that this work is best done by county employees. They will, over time, develop relationship with facility managers and clinic managers. They'll get to know the building occupants and the specific features of facilities. And with this proposal, we will be able to wean ourselves from existing security contracts with the particular focus on St. Louise and O'Connor hospitals. This is a tremendous professional development opportunity for existing staff because they'll get improved and um, more training, uh, including over 200 hours of classroom training, but also 160 hours of field training under the supervision of a field training officer. And in addition, they will have continuing ed on perishable skills such as um, CPR. It's important to note that this class will pay about 10% more than the current classification because it has more rigorous job duties. And importantly, and this is a point that the county exec was making, that the existing PSOs who cannot or do not want to become sheriff PSOs have the ability to uh, remain in their existing positions. 
There are many organizational benefits, including having a better and more consistently trained workforce, one command structure, and a pipeline that we hope will allow um, PSOs to stay with the county if they aspire to be law enforcement personnel. In my conversations with Captain Borsa, you know, in his time, we've had about 45 people leave, and our goal is to um, have them stay with us. With respect to staff's conversations with SEIU, over the course of a year, we've had at least seven meetings. And from these meetings, we have made um, numerous changes, including changing the name of the class uh, from Sheriff Security Officer to Sheriff PSO. We're carrying over seniority to the new class. And we're also keeping a vacated PSO um, positions vacant so that if someone desires and passes background is on probation and they may have a probationary release, they still have the ability or they decide that they're not interested in in, um, in this new role. They have the ability to revert back to their, um, their former class. This proposal, as I mentioned, is cost neutral. We're using savings from deleted PSO positions and also the reserve to pay for the management structure. And as I mentioned, um, I have been in communication with the sheriff elect and he has communicated to me that he thought uh, it was a great access point for aspiring law enforcement personnel. And he certainly agreed with the idea that it'd bring more uniformity to the training and the oversight of, of this class of personnel. So we're all here uh, and uh, willing and um, happy to respond to any kind of questions you may have. Thank you. I think it's a great solution. Supervisor Lee. You're muted if you're speaking, sir. Yes, I like speaking to myself a lot, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so uh, so first of all, thanks so much for the uh, very detailed report, and uh, this is certainly a very important uh, uh, issue uh, in my mind uh, for a long time because of the fact that you know the <clears throat> the safety of our personnel uh, in our hospital uh, in our ER especially is one where I'm most concerned about. Uh, we've I've visited many times, and with the nurses and the staff working there, uh, there's certainly a security uh, concern uh, of their own safety uh, and also the safety of, of course, our patients. Uh, and that's something that we could never compromise. Um, and knowing the fact that we don't have to properly train security officers at the different locations, uh, that's that's not sufficient, and we certainly need to make sure that we have the the right uh, training. Uh, so, uh, I, I I certainly in concept do support this type of classification. I guess the question I have is whether or not, in terms of timing wise, whether we should engage our new sheriff. I mean, I, I appreciate you uh, engaging our um, one of the candidates uh, of the of the of this, but again, I mean, it's not finalized, and you know the. Uh, I just want to make sure that the, the sheriff really have the time to sit down, the new sheriff, that is, uh, to understand the the, uh, the the these these issues right now. Um, trust me, uh, right after the, the campaign, when I ran for this job, my mind was not really clear for a couple of weeks, so I wouldn't want to uh, make any important decisions like that. So I, I really do think that it's important to have the new sheriff to have the ability to do a survey of the landscape, you know, once they officially take office. Um, and and as we know, the projected timeline to onboard a new PSO would be about three to six months, I believe. And I think waiting until January or later to implement this new sheriff PSO staff classification action wouldn't really affect the timeline that much. And will also allow the new sheriff to make the assessment if that's the direction they want to go in terms of the facility security. So I actually would like to uh, propose to uh, uh, continue this item uh, a little bit later uh, to allow the new sheriff to uh, to chime in before we move forward. So I just want to make those statements. Um, and I don't know if I should talk about the other item, like 17 or not, or should I just uh, deal with 16 first? Please, please talk about everything yeah. and anything you wish to. OK. Um, so um, I guess the uh, the the fact that obviously I'm glad to see the proposed uh, Sheriff PSO um, division uh, would unify and strengthen the training of the best practices of the facility security officers across the system through this proposal. Um, and I am interested in following the development of the training curriculum and receiving more specifics on what that would include, as these officers would be working with vulnerable populations that the county facilities serve 
perhaps even more frequently than normal police officers would. Uh, the Lech file has noted that the post standards would be used for basic training required by Penal Code 832, but did not cite any standards that would be used for the areas of community interest that it mentioned. So what we'd like to ask is if the administration or the sheriff's office would be able to help clarify whether the curriculum for the SPSOs will include substantial training on topics like medical privacy, working people with IDDs, and substance use disorders and other areas of community interest. Would you like a response now? Yes, please. Sure. Let me invite Captain Borsa to respond. Captain. Good afternoon, Supervisor. Good afternoon. Uh, I do have a list of uh, some of the classes that were in the, the basic training. I, I can list them out for you. Um, a lot of them are like force ops and de-escalation, um, you know, active shooter response, powers of arrest, uh, um, observation and documentation, liability, legal aspects. Um, I'm trying to get to the section, sorry, for the, we have uh, implicit bias, we have de-escalation training, we have uh, under the influence, which would be uh, part of that that subject as well. Um, so th those are the ones that I can find right off the top of my head that are here specifically that we have listed. And, uh, and specifically we have uh, other ones that are kind of cross-cultured, which is also part of the, the training that's going on. And I'm sorry, I don't have the exact ones for you right now. No worries, no worries, Cap Barca. I mean, I, I uh... Thank you. First of all, I, I just want to say that we defer to draw on the uh, knowledge and resources that our county has. Um, uh, I guess the other question I have is, uh, is working on developing and training be able to do so in partnership with Oakland? Is this something that uh, Oakland could work with you on uh, adding some of these items in there? Uh, I, I believe that's something they could look at. They could definitely help. Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah, because I understand certainly training is expertise that uh, that the Oakland has to, uh, advised many agencies on, and I think we actually may benefit from in creating these standards for the entirely new uh, division not the, at the sheriff's office. So if you could uh, maybe give us a follow-up report on the training curriculum uh, and the new division be provided once it's put together, uh, that would be very, very much appreciated. So if, if, um, if that's okay, I would like to uh, uh, make a motion. Uh, uh, President Watson, would that be appropriate? Yes, that's just fine. Yes, I, I, my motion would be basically to revisit this issue coming back uh, after uh, January uh, when the new sheriff has been sworn in uh, to uh, re, re, um, discuss this issue. In the meantime, I think there may be some clarifications that um, staff could provide back to us uh, when that comes back to us. Thank you. And Supervisor, you're, you're saying to bring back after the first of the year specifically which item? Um, I believe, I, I believe is the whole 16 through 20, unless I, uh, there's anything that we need to approve today. Yes, if okay. that's, if that is your motion, that, yes, that, that's my yeah. motion, yeah. I, I, I'm on track with staff first, is if there's anything urgent that we need to do today, we certainly would deal with it. If we can, I would like to keep the whole, uh, uh, as a whole, uh, from 16 to 20, if we can. Okay, and I'll just. Supervisor, they're I'll, all connected, so. Yeah. Yes, they are all connected. That, what I will say, and then I'll turn to Supervisor Submitting and Supervisor Chavez, what, what I will say is there are five actions in 16 right. through 20. You're saying continue them all until the first meeting in January. I won't ask Supervisor Submitting which meeting that is, because I don't know <laughs> either. But there are, in these two items, there are bringing them back to the December 6th meeting, so that will be deferred as well. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Before we continue our discussion, do we have a second? to Supervisor Lee's motion. So I would second it, but my caveat would be that either in January or when the new sheriff is instated, letting them bring it back at the sixth or the next me meeting. Yeah, and when the sheriff is ready, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the motion is to bring it back in January or quote, when the sheriff is ready? Well, sooner, sooner than January when the sheriff is instated and decides that it should come before us. Okay. Um, 
We have a motion, we have a second, we have a conversation now. I'm gonna ask that we hear from the one member of the public before we go any further, if that's okay, without objection. Could I, could I just ask a question, Supervisor, which is- Of course. Thank you, forgive, forgive me, but I just, I want the members of the public, if any who speak, to know what our various board members are thinking. And my question for Ms. Gallegos is, I, I see this, and, and you know, different folks will see it different ways. I see this as two different questions. One is, who should be training the training regimen and who should be training uh, the folks in this job category? And then that's a different question, at least to me, and it's what I want to ask you about, than where these folks should be placed in our org chart. And so my question is, what's the thinking about why they should be in the sheriff's department as opposed to getting their training from the sheriff's department, but staying at the library or social services or VMC? And candidly, the reason I'm asking the question, because I want to give Ms. Gallegos the opportunity to respond without trying to read my mind, is I, I worry, frankly, that if these folks go to the sheriff's department, they'll think of themselves as working for the sheriff's department rather than working for the library, working for the hospital, or working for SSA. That's just, you know, a concern. So uh, I would like a little help in understanding the thinking of the working group uh, in terms of this recommendation. And I'll stop there. Dr. Smith. I can answer that. Uh, the reason for that is that um, they cannot be um, limited peace officers unless they are supervised by a badge staff sheriff. Oh. So it has to do with uh, the rules of the state limiting their peace officer status. So if they work for a civilian, um, the option of limited peace officer status evaporates. Okay. And, and to expand on the count exec's comment to your concern that the uh, sheriff PSOs will think of themselves as sheriff employees and not have that relationship with the facilities they oversee. We don't believe that to be the case because they'll continue to be assigned to the various locations. And what happens is when you're assigned to them, you develop the relationship principally with the facility manager and all, or a clinic manager if it happens to be a clinic. And you genuinely, and I've seen this already um, with the current PSOs, you, you get to learn the people who come, the building occupants, their practices, their habits. And so it's a little bit of a relationship where you have it to that facility, the assets and the people you're trying to protect, but also you have this relationship with ESSO. And, and we do believe it's important that they get this improved and increased level of training to ensure that not only are they properly de-escalating and helping you know, the doctors, for example, manage patients, who may be combative, but also leadership and communication training that we think they currently lack. And this proposal brings in more management staff because we have really been unfair to the sheriff with respect to their ability to manage this complement. And we fully expect when this uh, program or if and when this program is approved that we have this pent up demand from a variety of departments that are eager to have more of a security personnel presence. So I want to assure you that um, they're not going to be captives of SO and that they will have their primary relationship with the with the facility and the folks at the facility that they are there to protect. Thank you. Through the chair, if I may. Yep. Um, I just, uh, I, I, we're going to continue this item, I believe, in a moment. So fair enough. Uh, I will keep an open mind on this subject. But I just want both Dr. Smith and Ms. Gallegos and anyone else who wants to weigh in on this subject to know that I, my inclination is to think that if you work for the sheriff's office and somebody tries to give you guidance at SSA or VMC or the library district, the response is going to be, you're not the boss of me. And that will be technically correct. That, that, I mean, that's just how, how things work. So uh, I'm just asking if you can uh, give that some thought. And, and candidly, what I'm saying is if you are hoping to bring me along on this one, I hope you'll have 
uh, some good reactions to that quandary when we talk about this next. Thank you. Fair enough. All right, members of the public, please, Jess. Thank you. <clears throat> Our first speaker is Ian. I've unmuted you. Please accept, accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Hi, um, I'm not, um, I can't decide whether to laugh at what's been said or, or not because um, Mr. Smith is talking out, he's talking nonsense. Uh, PSOs will, and the SPSOs will have exactly the same powers they already have, will have the powers of arrest of civilian, nothing more. Uh, I've known where this, com this, this, this statement about limited peace officer statuses is because a lot of the PSOs already ha have already done the post uh, exams and things like that. A lot of them, uh, experience in law enforcement uh, and if anything the sheriff since they took over 12 years ago is it discourages us from arresting people they tell us not to arrest people for certain things and to refer it to the sheriff's department and the fact that they we're talking about this at all is ridiculous it's just a waste of taxpayers money as far as we're concerned 80 percent of the PSOs voted against this because of the last 12 years of SO management because of the decline of the PSO department our training manual has most of almost anything, everything they've suggested. In fact, when the PSOs apply for reclassification, it basically was the same thing that's being presented to you now, but was rejected by the county. Uh, and we talked about this in the province, there's a meet and confer about having a sheriff's badge and a sheriff's patch and how it would discourage certain people in the community. And we were laughed at and dismissed and talked in a condescending manner by the labor relations and others. And uh, it just seems like it's just a complete waste of money. And uh, we had a two hour, three hour vote with the hospital employees and 300 people voted said they had no confidence in the SO. All of this should be significant when you decide all of this. And the, the lack of respect for the current PSOs is, 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 is terrible. You know, and the fact that so many of them don't speak now is because they fear the sheriff and what might happen to them if they speak out. And you should consider all this before you even even think about wasting money on this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose Naharo. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for this uh, time to speak. Uh, backing on uh, Ian's statement there, yeah, it's 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 unfortunate that they're presenting something that's already been uh, that's already it's already what we do. It's been a, a job that we've been doing for 40 plus years. We've been managing and dealing with the the county. And as far as us not being uh, skilled or skilled to have that leadership or the ability to de-escalate, I, I don't think they actually did a proper assessment. And uh, I think um, whoever did assess the situation didn't actually go down and see how we actually do this job. Um, they should see that this is, you know, we're not against providing the county uh, the security they provide. We want to give them all that they deserve, all that we want to give them. But the fact that they need to actually reassess this, look at this differently and see that the, there could be a lot of resources wasted as far as 11 PSO positions. And if they're using that just to wait, I mean, they could have provided the training the proper training that they promised us that would have been done in the past five years, at least to get us to a position where this could be promoted and, you know, expanded on better. Uh, that's why you got the 80% uh, of the departments saying no to this. And um, if we were to scoff, like they scoffed at us, at the county and the community that you, the board serve, I don't think they would take that too lightly. But for us to be in this community, they understand who we are, they know who we are, they know how we deal with them, and we're actually accepted for how we do our job. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Irvish. Please go ahead. Thank you, Irvish, to uh, Board of Supervisor, as well as county staff and the respective uh, clerk's office and the county council as well. First of all, I wanted to I, I wanted to uh, comment about the item number sixteen, and as well as making sure about that you know that the steps that is being taken to implement the plan and the establishment of protective officer. We do have a, a peace officers as well, and all the officers when they serve to respective agency, they work under a, a, a motto 
Our motto is to protect, serve, and safety. So all officers with the respect to the given work assignment and the implementation of establishment on an officer, they, they, provide the, they provide the protection, a serve, and a safety. But however, what it is important to distinct that, you know, how the protective officers are going to work, whether they are going to be serving at the medical, at the medical facility, whether they are going to be serving at the community facility, whether they are going to be serving at the recreational facility. If you go to parks, there are national park rangers. If you go to community or a specific library, there are community officers. So it is important to it is important to distinct here that you know what purpose the protective officers are going to serve. If the protective officers at the county level, if they're going to serve a specific purpose, like uh, helping for the animal welfare or helping diplomats or uh, or helping uh, a person uh, with a disability or helping a person where they require a transition from at the international level. So it is important that you know how the protective officer is going to work and what is the distinction between them and the other officer which has already been established. It is important to place them in an organogram where they are being dis they are being a being an officer of protective officer and what are the di different duties that they're going to be serving. Thank you very much for consideration of comments and please take this thing into consideration as well. That concludes our request. Thank you very much, Jess. We have a motion on the floor by Supervisor Lee, seconded by Supervisor Chavez. And we've heard from the public. I see no more hands raised. Jess, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Aye. Supervisor Supervisor Travis? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you, Jess. That was item 16 through 20. We now move to item 21, which is options for filling the, the vacancy in the office of the sheriff. The staff members are uh, County Council James Williams and our clerk, Tiffany Lanier. Thank you, President Wasserman. This item is brought before the board uh, consistent with board policy because there was a vacancy that occurred in the office of the sheriff. Um, the board policy doesn't exactly directly contemplate for a non-member uh, of the board of supervisors the type of scenario we happen to be in, which is that an election has occurred for the term that would begin on January 2nd of 2023. So the board, um, does need to take action uh, with respect to the vacancy for the current term that ends at noon on January 2nd of 2023. There's been an election for that next term. The board has uh, before it a number of potential options uh, with respect to uh, filling that vacancy, including taking action now based on um, the current results, deferring that action, um, and, and taking the matter back up in December, um, post-certification, uh, or advertising a vacancy and proceeding through any other uh, channel, as long as the board is considering uh, a person who is a, a county uh, resident, a voter who is otherwise statutorily eligible for the office. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, James. And a motion can be made if you'll confirm this, James, and it'd be the motion that I would make would be to waive board policy 2.2 and, and appoint the presumptive sheriff elect to the office of the sheriff at our December 6th meeting. Second. Thank you. That's motion second by Supervisor Chavez. No members of the public, no other hands raised. Jess, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Supervisor Smitty, and your mic's on. It's off, but we can't hear. Supervisor Smitty, could you repeat the motion, please? I apologize. I had to step out, Mr. Chairman. Again, my apologies. No problem at all, sir. The motion was mine, seconded by Supervisor Chavez. Specifically, was to waive board policy 2.2 and appoint the presumptive sheriff elect to the office of the sheriff at our December 6th meeting, our next board meeting. 
Um, I know there's a motion on the floor, and I apologize again for having to step away, but uh, at the meeting on the 6th, the um, presumptive sheriff, I don't know if that's a legal term of art or not, will not actually be certified by the um, registrar of voters, as I understand it. Uh, what's your, just to understand the motion, what is your expectation about how that uh, situation would be resolved? Sure, I would think it would be the board giving that direction, and then it's subject to, of course, whatever requirements newly elected persons, such as being certified by the registrar of voters, would have to undertake. And as soon as that is done, I'll say then he, because we know it's one of two hymns, that then he would become the um, sheriff at that time. And through the chair, if I may ask Mr. Williams, our county counsel, would it be possible when we took action on the 6th, and I know Supervisor Wasserman will smile at me when I say on the 6th, uh, would it be possible to indicate at that time that uh, we were appointing someone by name, but uh, pending certification by the Registrar of Voters, which I think is the intent of the motion? Yes, that is the intent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. I am ready to be an I vote. Aye. There you go. Please continue, Jess. President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. All right, that was our item number 21. We now move on to item 22, and uh, we'll hear from Imre Kabai, Chief Information Officer, to report back on secure information submission system. And Supervisor Simidian, do you want to lead off here? Hello, Imre. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the report. Thank you for clarifying that this is work you can and are planning to do. Thank you for making it a priority. I move approval of the recommended action, which is to receive the report. Happy to second that. Okay. Thank you. We have no members of the public. I see no other supervisors hands. Jess, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Travis. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. President Wasserman. Aye. And thank in you. all seriousness, Mr. Chairman, thank you again to Mr. Kabai and his team. Seriously, I, I, I don't want to give that short, short shrift. No, no, there will definitely be more difficult days for him. Not, not a worry. All right. Jess, we are now moving on to 25. Do you agree? I do. Thank you. This is regarding the Sunnyvale Overnight Warming Centers. I know that we have Consuela Hernandez here, our Director of Office of Supportive Housing, and I'm turning to Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Give me a second here. Just move. We're moving so quickly today. Okay, good. Uh, so um, first, I want to uh, thank the for the uh, Office of Supportive Housing, OSH, and uh, Consuela Hernandez, Director, for uh, her good work and this great update. Um, I also want to thank you for your work with collaborating with Sunnyvale City staff on this endeavor, uh, which is extremely important that potentially could save lives. Now, as we all have <clears throat> experienced, the weather has been getting colder uh, in recent weeks, and I think that only serves to highlight the need for the expediency of the overnight warming shelters need. And it's important that people have a place to stay at night and not, not be frozen. Um, and so I would like to request that the administration returns to the board at the next board meeting to provide uh, the report that provides an estimated cost breakdown around providing overnight warming shelter for the winter months, so for the next four months. Uh, and I'm understanding that our county has never utilized a quote pop-up shelter uh, approach uh, uh, that has been mentioned by some of the Sunnyvale uh, discussion. So I would like to find out the estimated cost can be for a traditional overnight warming center as well, um, along with the pop-up shelter approach. And I just want to uh, thank everyone and hope that this report will come back to us in the next part meeting with some uh, thoughts and sense on how much it will cost to make it happen. And that'll be my motion. Thank you. Thank you for your motion. I need a second. second. A second by Chavez. Thank you. We have no members of the public. Roll call vote, please, Jess. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. 
Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you, Jess. We now have item 26, which is going to be heard with 78. Uh, 78 was pulled from consent and asked to be combined with 26 by Supervisor Chavez. So I will turn to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to just start by saying how much I appreciate the extensive work and approach the county took on drafting this report. There are many, many concepts outlined given the need. Um, I think we're going to need to pursue all of them, especially seeking the state and federal reimbursement that for food um, being provided through housing and our shelter programs. I was really encouraged to see the idea of supporting the work at Second Harvest and other CBOs with core members and CalWORKs clients. I think that's that's really braiding our policies together in a thoughtful way. And just colleagues, I had an opportunity to meet one of the cons Conservation Corps members, and she um, got a chance to do this work with the Conservation Corps, and now she's the leader at Second Harvest. So that's, to me, that's just moving in the right direction. Um, I did read the concerns about our senior nutrition program. In addition to the food provided, these nutrition sites are really important to the mental health of our seniors. Um, as they return to these sites, um, instead of getting the to-go meals, I'm really interested in having Behavioral Health and SSA collaborate on whether or not we can use some Mental Health Services Act money to, um, to support the wellness for seniors at our senior nutrition program facilities. Uh, Dr. Smith, what I was hoping we could do is ask that you and your staff work to bring recommendations for funding on these efforts to the mid-year budget. Is that something you were already planning to do? Yes. Excellent. And then um, I think one of the other things I wanted to ask is, um, is this. I, I'm interested in, um, in knowing if we know what the, um, if San Jose, the city is paying through December um, through for food, like have they, did they stop their funding? Uh, Key will be able to ask for that. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Um, the funding is through December. So I think it's going to be what I would just say is if for any reason our mid year budget um, is it's delayed, I would like to pull this out um, as a separate item and have make sure it comes to the board in early January. If we don't think we're going to have our but you know, and in fact, maybe I'll just make this as part of the motion that we preview um, what the recommendations will be in January um, for the for the full board if you know prior to budget because I think that's going to help our nonprofit partners um, plan. Um, any concerns with that approach? No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, here's one other question that I have: Is the who, where is the food um, governance? Who owns food for us? I know it's in a lot of different departments, but it, but Dr. Smith, among your team, who owns the food work? Because uh, food uh, issues are different for different populations, um, the actual responsibilities lie in a number of different departments. Departments, which is why we've asked Key as the deputy county executive to coordinate. Got it. What I'm going to ask um, as part of this motion, um, I, and the reason I pulled off the other item, just you know, the the um, the item in the response to Senate Bill 1383 is I wanted to make sure that 1383 is being considered. Um, because your point, Dr. Smith, is really an important one that this is really spread all over the county. And so what I'd like to ask is um, key if uh, through Dr. Smith, um, through you, if my colleagues are amenable, that there be a, a presentation on a governance structure, at least for a working group or a task force that could be cross um, agency and also in partnership with our nonprofit partners so that we could be prepared to um, dive into this in a much more rigorous way, because I do think food is going to stay 
um, an important issue, both relative to state legislation and also meeting the needs of our local residents. And so um, if he, uh, through Dr. Smith, and if my colleagues are amenable, could come back with a task force or work group. And then um, finally, I'd like to ask the new chair and vice chair if they would consider putting together a study session um, in the first quarter of next year to be able to discuss our food system work plan. That would be a motion. I'll second it. Thank you. And then if I can, I'm happy to move both items, um, both item Thank both you. 26 and 78. I just wanna make sure that 78 is included in any future planning. All righty, was that a question? No, no, I, I just want to let staff know that's the intent of the motion. Understood. Thank you. And Supervisor Lee, are you okay with proving that? Yes, as well? of course. Before we take any vote, we have two members of the public. Jess? Thank you. Two minutes? Yes. Thank you. Our first speaker will be the phone number ending in 910. I've opened up your microphone. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, I was just calling in on behalf of Unhouse Response Group. We are one of the two groups that have been really benefiting from the food from the city. We've been getting our food from the fishes. We are very, very, very thankful. We certainly don't want to see the food end. We have fought every time they've tried to end it. Um, we have seen people eat the food right in front of us and we've given them more. People are starving out there and the it only grows, the need only grows more as we keep going to camps and going, oh my God, where'd you people come from? There's more and more people coming out there, more and more need. Obviously, the silver tsunami keeps hitting the streets. Um, I also wanted to ask if we could add Bloom. Uh, they are fantastic. They are the number one preferred food out there on the camps. Um, I also think that it's the most, uh, it's the heaviest food. When we hand it out, it weighs the most. Um, and if we could add them as a vendor, I think people would really, really appreciate it. Um, they really helped out in the beginning of COVID and throughout COVID. And if they could be added to the vendors list, we would really appreciate that. Um, I think people really like that food. Um, and uh, when we ask them which one they, you know, they would prefer, it's usually Bloom. Um, so if we could do that, that'd be great. If it's still loaves and fishes, that's fantastic. That's the one we give out uh, a lot to. Um, and they've been really good to us and really accommodating. Thank you. Please continue these programs. Thank you. Our next speaker is Irvish. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to uh, Board of Supervisors and as well as the uh, county uh, staff and the respective clerk as well. I wanted to mention about this, uh, the, all the organization participating to the food program. Uh, first of all, it is important that that there are perks available as well as there are beneficial federal governance programs are available in order to help the, the county of Santa Clara citizens achieve and accomplish the food requirements that is to be to be provided through the food banks. We know that that the how food bank system works. It is as equal as the financial finance for banking system. The part of the fact is that sometimes the need and the uh, the need and the the kind of a food that is being provided by the county of Santa Clara that differs on a daily basis. However, it becomes very important to manage the grants that is being provided by the Board of Supervisors and as well as county in order to maintain that, you know, what as a food bank nonprofit organization requires to preserve and continue to serve to the county of Santa Clara citizens. Moreover, it also becomes important that that how often the need of those nonprofit organization changes. For example, change of change in the program of a food governance, change in the perks that is being provided through the people, change in the type of the standard of a living that is being changed within the county of Santa Clara, as well as making sure about that what are the income level that has been provided low income level people and high income level people. Typically the food bank provides the be this benefits to the people with the low income. So it is important to evaluate that what are the people which is living below the minimum wage requirement that is being assigned and provided by the County of Santa Clara and estimate the provider of grants and estimation the expenses accordingly. Thank you very much. 
And that concludes our requests. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Yes, I want to thank staff for this uh, very important report uh, and how that is really affecting uh, those who are living in hunger in our very affluent county here. Uh, so many CBOs like Loaves and Fishes, Martha's Kitchen, Second Harvest, uh, that was here earlier today, and also even from the donations from the delicious meals from Bloom Catering, which I have the fortune to have tasted, have been the backbone for our food assistance efforts before the pandemic and continue to be stepped up during the pandemic. Um, as we have seen, the food insecurity issue has been sustained through the pandemic, and the, those demands has not declined at all. Add to the fact of the inflation, it's certainly much harder these days for people to afford basic food in our county, which is unfortunate. And that's why I'm strongly supporting the continuation of finding ways for our county to continue this important program that San Jose has done for so long. So I definitely want to support this. And thank you for Supervisor Chavez for her, her motion. Super. All right, we have a motion by Chavez, a second by Lee. We've heard from the public, no other hands raised. I key, I see you. Jess, roll call vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you. 27 was handled earlier. 28 and 29 were handled under consent. That brings us to item number 30. Let's move my tabs over here. And we have our, our COO, Greta Hansen, available, and Glenn Williams, our asset development manager here for questions or comments. And this subject is to report back on board referral for additional small business grants. And I will look, I see Mr. Williams. Go right ahead, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman Wasserman. Uh, just to quickly summarize for you, uh, as you are well aware, the board set aside $10 million in its last budget sessions to dedicate to help small businesses uh, who are impacted by, negatively impacted by the COVID-19 uh, uh, <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in response to that, the administration has uh, done a significant amount of uh, inquiry among stakeholders, among the business community, to see how best we could utilize that. And so we would, are coming back to the board with a preliminary uh, list of three things that we believe would be appropriate for the board to consider and gauge the uh, temperature for your enthusiasm for each of the three. Uh, we've the first of the, the first two of those you're well familiar with. Uh, one of which is the small business grant program, which we uh, instituted to utilize fees that were collected from the violations of public health orders. Uh, we distributed a little less than a million dollars of those uh, to date. We are proposing that we continue to administer those grants under the same program also administered by the Enterprise Foundation as they were in the first set. We are suggesting that the board uh, authorize us to allocate somewhere between three and $4 million to that program. And that they we already have a backlog of applicants who were never able to be adequately reviewed because there was not insufficient funds. And we believe that we could do somewhere in the three to $4 million range of grants at the average of the 2,500 that was true in the first case. The second of those is the uh, waiver of fees for the Department of Environmental Health. Uh, the board authorized the waiver of those fees in 2021. Uh, we are suggesting that we allocate a similar amount or uh, amount as the board chooses to, uh, to basically offset uh, environmental fees for the 2023 calendar year. Uh, somewhere between four and a half and $6 million, depending upon what those individual items would be. And then the third is new to the board. The uh, possibility is to authorize the board, the, the board to authorize somewhere between 500,000 and a million dollars to create a new program for the County of Santa Clara, which is would be administered through Kiva. As you probably are aware, Kiva is the administrator of the 
uh, CRF loans, which the board is authorized in two tranches. Kiva also has a program of crowdfunding in which they provide zero interest loans to very, very, very small businesses. Uh, we're proposing that we create such a program for the county so that these are uh, addressing an unmet need. The, the majority of the recipients of this program that Kiva has issued tend to be uh, those who have are not eligible for loans from traditional lenders. Often they are uh, individuals coming out of incarceration or they're coming back into the workforce at a later date uh, and they need uh, some ca investment capital in order to proceed with the small business that they're creating. Sometimes that's a, trades, a tradesman, such as a carpenter or plumber who has the skill set but needs uh, funding in order to acquire a vehicle for transportation or a tool set, et cetera. So those are the three alternative uses. Uh, we could not obviously fund all three of them at the largest amounts that we're suggesting in the range of, because that would be a total of $11 million. And so we are uh, seeking guidance on which of these are the priorities for you. Do you support all three? Do you support two, only one? Uh, how would the board like to do this? I want to make sure. I want to make sure that we're addressing Supervisor Savidian's comment to not uh, put you in a bind. We want to make sure that we Thank do you. this in advance in such a way that we get input from the board before we finalize the programs. Thank you very much, Glenn. I seems like. To me, anyway, B gives you more bang for the buck, but I'm I'm interested to hear what others have to say. We have no members of the public, so I'm looking to Supervisor Lee. Yes, I have some questions. Um, if I, this is appropriate time to ask. Yes, let's do it. Good. So uh, on B, uh, on the item number C, which is allocating four and a half to six million dollars for the Department of Environmental Health um, for the fee waiver um, for 2023. Uh, just wanted to check with you, uh, Mr. Williams, do you think uh, how much would be needed for this program? Is four and a half million enough or what would you say in, in your estimation? Well, two, two answers to that. The first part of that is that we authorize six million for the 2021. We, we authorize six million dollars for in 2021 for the program. And environmental health believes that they uh, that that was a reasonable number at the time. Uh, they're doing an audit currently to find out how much in the way of fee offset was actually uh, actually utilized. And the specific designations that they included for the last set of fee waivers uh, are certainly not fixed in stone. So that if they were authorized, you know, four and a half million, they would select those fee waivers that were uh, most uh, believe that they were most advantageous and were most used. Uh, whereas if they were to be authorized 6 million or even more than that, then they would simply expand the different fees that could be waived. They're doing an audit of those uh, currently. And on, in January or February, it's anticipated that uh, environmental health will probably come back to the board with an adjustment for fees going forward, which also changes the numbers. So uh, it, it is a it's a moving target. Right, because right now, given the three items and we have a total of 10 million that we're trying to allocate, let's say if we cut the baby now, let's say we allocate 5 million here for this uh, fee waiver program, then we only have five left for the other pieces, correct? That would be correct. Right, and then you're recommending three to four million for the small business grant program, and then another uh, potential half to one million to Kiva. So um, as for Kiva, can you explain to us what they're doing to administer these loans and how how, how is that uh, working with Kiva? Of course, uh, Kiva has this program in existence in a number of locations around the United States. Uh, it is not in existence currently in Santa Clara County. Uh, what they do is that they create a crowdfunding program in which they ask the applicant 
to secure the initial portion of the loan amount from friends and family. And then they through crowdsourcing, either through crowdsourcing and inviting people online to donate into their loan fund, or in the case like with us, it would be a sponsorship where we would provide matching funds in some ratio to the amount that is raised by the applicant. They do that for two reasons. One is that they find that uh, having friends and family essentially vouching for the individual with their capital uh, is a good indicator of future success. And secondly, it provides a very strong incentive for the uh, borrower to repay the loan because he's repaying his friends and family at the same time that he's repaying the loan to keep it. So if they want to be invited back for Thanksgiving, they need to pay the loan back. <laughs> Absolutely, and Christmas. And Christmas, right. Uh, now, um, so when you say the 500 to a million dollars, are those administrative fee or is it part of that matching funds that will be used as the loan that we're talking about? Those are matching funds. The, there will be an administrative cost because they can't do this without uh, having personnel working on it. Uh, what would be included in that is a... Mm -hmm. $50,000 fee, uh, which is a three-year uh, advance fee that they charge to conduits, which would go, in this case, to the Enterprise Foundation because they are the logical conduit for uh, outreach into the community. The, in addition to that, then uh, Kivo would have an administrative charge, and then the balance of everything else would be uh, for loan, loan amounts. The maximum loan amount would be 25,000 and much less in many cases. So even though the numbers seem small, they go a long ways. Do they provide micro loans as well? Like loans in the, like less than $1,000? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there's no minimum. I don't think the Diva has a minimum loan amount. Okay, all right. And um, what service will the Enterprise Foundation access SPDC provide to Kiva? What they're going to, what will happen is that a lot of the outreach, because they are Santa Clara County based and they're working with the same community, basically the same uh, potential small businesses, they will be in, inquiring of their uh, constituents, their applicants, the, those who are coming in for, you know, the small business grant program or others. Uh, you know, to see if they would be interested in and able to uh, meet the requirements of the program for Kiva. Uh, often, for example, uh, Access SBDC or Enterprise Foundation uh, provides a grant, for example, from our program for, you know, $2,500, and the business needs more capital than that and in order to uh, reach out on its next leg of success. And this would provide a, an opportunity for that to grow to up to $25,000 in loan dollars when they get repaid. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any questions. I'm ready for a motion. I just want to see if uh, the, uh, I, I want to wait for um, hearing from my other colleague as well. Thank you. Okay. Good enough. We'll go to Dr. Smith first, then Supervisor Chavez, then we have one member of the public, then we'll come back to you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to make it clear to the board that when we initially talked about this issue during COVID, there was the presumption that we would generate significant monies from fines that would help defray this cost. As it turns out, um, I think we've only generated about 600000 So I just want the board to realize this $10 million comes out of the general fund. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That's very helpful. Yep. Um, to just, a, just to give feedback um, to the staff, I thought this was a really nice range of, of creative responses. In my, my priority order would be um, B, number one, C, number two, and D as number three. Um, and mostly because I think that we have the infrastructure for B and C already ready to go. 
what I think is appealing about Kiva and something I really like about it is I like that it will get to more non-traditional uh, folks. Mm -hmm. So I would also prioritize the resources um, accordingly, perhaps, um, you know, three, four, or three to four, like you said, um, but maybe go to the low end of each of them so we can we can um, help more people based on the the condition that their own businesses are in. Thank you. Hello. Yep. All right, Jess. Okay, Hello. Jess. Go ahead for uh, one speaker. Thank you. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Paul Soto, are you there? Paul Soto, going once, going twice. Oh, looks like your mic is on, Paul. Go ahead. There you go. Paul, you're muted again. We'll go to Irvish and come back. Oh, are you there? No, my gosh. We'll go to Irvish and come back. Our next speaker is Irvish. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to Board of Supervisors again, as well as County staff and respect to Clark as well. Uh, I think it's important to derive that, you know, when any recommendations for allocating of funds to one of small business grounds that is to be measured, and as well as uh, the supplement funding that requires uh, fines accessed and collected in the violation of public health orders. Whereas it is equally important that, that the cost that is going to be increased within the grants and how it is deriving the, the rest of the cost that is going to be derived from the violation, how is that going to match up the grant that is to be procured and then be expensed back to the county. As most of the small business ground, it is also required to be paid back. So important to follow up on that, that what is a paid back program for the small grants and as well as making sure about that, that allocation and the funding of collection, what are the percentage of rate that is going to be applicable to the small grants, small business grants program such that the citizen be benefited equally in terms of the enterprise businesses, as well as the small businesses that is to be developed within the county. Equally for the item number C and D, most importantly, when any grants are being allocated specifically to a Department of Environmental Health, what are, what are some of, what are some of the, the waivers as well as how the small businesses can be benefited from the environmental health uh, grants? Such as the hospitals, as well as a nonprofit and the enterprise agencies, which work in in align with the international climate change plan, and also in reducing the carbon footprint, especially in the technology part. What are the applicability of a technology in terms of that, and what are what are the policies, criteria, and eligibility for such that would help derive that you know whether the cost increase would require in such cases. Thank you very much for consideration of coming. And that concludes our requests. Thank you, Jess. Now back to Supervisor Lee. Oh, let me unmute myself here. There we okay. go. Um, so I would like to try for the motion uh, per staff uh, recommendation uh, to not only receive a report, but also direct administration on the B, C, and D uh, for a total of not to exceed $10 million. Second. All right. We have a motion by Lee, a second by Chavez. We've heard from the public. Don't see any other hands raised. Roll call vote, please. Jess. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor, Aye. thank you. President that. Wasserman, no problem. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. And uh, thank you for the information you conveyed, Dr. Smith. Item number 31 was held, 32 was held, 33 was held, 34 is to consider items pre previously removed from the consent calendar. Jess, I believe the only one we have is nine, number 81 from Supervisor Chavez. Do you agree? Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. 
Thank you very much. Um, this item, as my colleagues may recall, is an item relative to the former um, San Jose City Hall project, the environmental impact report, um, and the like. And what I wanted to just ask the staff to do is take just a couple of minutes to talk about the outreach that they did. And then the second question is if they could just respond to the, the points from the community that there has been um, not ample research done on the reuse possibilities of the facility. Thank you. And I think we're going to go to Mr. Barry. Mr. Barry, you're up. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dave Barry, Chief of Facilities Planning Services at FAF. Joining me are Lizanne Reynolds, Deputy County Counsel, and Emily Chen, Principal Planner for FAF. Uh, with, re with regard to outreach, we did, um, of course, over the years we've done with the Civic Center Master Plan, we've, we've reached out to the community and we have formed a stakeholder list. Um, in particular, for the EIR process, um, we, we uh, did the required outreach um, for the EIR. I've also been in constant uh, or in regular contact with PACSJ, which is um, to date um, the only organization that has been um, consistently expressed interest in this project. Um, I was in, uh, we proactively reached out to PACSJ um, under the former director and um, since Ben Leach has taken um, the executive director role, we've been reaching out to him on a regular basis. And uh, we have included their alternative study um, that, that they commissioned um, in our package today. And um, I think, um, I think, you know, we've also been in constant contact with our stakeholder list through our, through our emails um, and updating our project website with that. Thank you, Mr. Barry. And I'm sorry, what was the other question? The other question is if you could talk just a little bit about the um, the consideration relative to reuse of the facility and not, by the way, not the entire facility, but the facility itself and then whether or not it was practical to, pr to protect the facade, for example, the curvature of the building. So the feasibility studies that we've done with uh, with our consultants um, have looked at, of course, you know, reuse as housing, reuse as office, and, and so forth. And um, from our understanding uh, from this thorough analysis, um, pretty much the building would have to be um, um, gutted um, and the building systems replaced, you know, entirely mechanical, electrical, plumbing, um, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Uh, considerable uh, seismic retrofit. And with regard to the, the curved um, glass curtain wall, uh, because it was such a prototypical version, um, it didn't always keep the elements out and uh, we would have to totally replace that uh, with, with a, a thermal barrier that would, uh, would keep um, the elements out and the heat and cooling in. I know, um, Lizanne, would you like to, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I just um, add that, that we, the county started doing feasibility analyses for reuse um, within a year following acquisition of the property in 2012, and then the, those were updated in 2019. We took a more thorough um, analysis approach in late 2019 and early 2020 to evaluate two housing and two uh, office reuse proposals, those, that was a more rigorous exercise, and those analyses are included in the, the draft EIR. Thank you. I, I do have some other comments, um, but what I'd like to do is I, I see we have some public speakers. Perhaps the public speakers could go first, and then I'll make my comments before the board takes action. Certainly, Jess, we will please, please allow our speakers to speak for two minutes each. Thank you. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I've opened your microphone. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, uh, myself, I'm more interested in the history that was created in that building. 
not just the architecture. Uh, Janet Gray Hayes, the first mayor in the United States, female mayor in the entire United States, Janet Gray Hayes. Norman Mineta, the first Asian mayor of a city in the entire United States. Uh, Al Garza, 1971, became the first Chicano that was ever able to legislate power within the context of the city after we became 10 districts in San Jose from the five at large. That was a significant victory on behalf of the Chicano community, and he was a reflection of that, and he exercised power in that building for the first time for the Chicanos. And then there was Mayor Ron Gonzalez, who, uh, despite the associations with him, he still won as a Mexican mayor of San Jose since 1846, since the takeover from uh, Manifest Destiny and the planting of the flag by Thomas Fallon. And so what I would like to do, and I would really, really like to work with the county in and, and, and preserving this space as a civil rights museum. I think it's time. I think it's time that we as a collective really start pushing racial equity within the highest, civil highest rights context museum? That, we, that we can. And what we can do is create this space and this place where power was legislated by the first Asian mayor, by the first female mayor, by the first Mexican mayor. This is what I'd like to do. Pack and myself were successful in establishing the building that produced the first issue of Lowrider Magazine and Sacred Heart Church as, and, and received those by the city of San Jose into the historical resources index, which is the precursor to having the historical landmark status. And I think we can do even more, uh, more significant work within the context of racial equity to establish a civil rights museum inside that building. Our next speaker is Sally Zarnowitz. Please go ahead. As a county resident and an architect, I think spending funds to scrape former City Hall, which is among the city's most important, if not the most important modern landmark, before vetting proposals for the site, uh, doesn't serve a public purpose. The projected uh, cost savings haven't been illustrated convincingly. And without a project, we don't gain housing or community services like the outpatient behavioral health facilities that were discussed earlier today, for example. Architecturally award-winning, City Hall sat prominently in the Civic Center area. Within its curving glass walls, the sweeping entrance stair welcomed wider groups of citizens after the war and provided new opportunities, as mentioned just earlier, under the progressive leadership of Norman Mineta, Janet Gray Hayes, and Blanca Alvarado, just to name a few. And today, as we work to design engaging and sustainable housing, we know that especially in downtown centers, the greenest building is an existing building. Designs like that submitted by PACSJ that take their cues from reusing these unique properties make feasible, made feasible by historic building codes and by 20% federal income tax credits really have spurred economic development throughout the country. The proposal to demolish this unique asset is premature. Concerned about opportunities for this and for the next generation that includes my sons, I urge you to take the Heritage Commission recommendation. Postpone any decision on the demolition until such time as a project rich in affordable housing is submitted for public hearing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ben Leach. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, ben Leach, I'm the executive director of the Preservation Action Council of San Jose. Um, I would acknowledge and thank uh, David Berry for uh, his um, uh, continued communications on this issue. It is true that something we have been tracking and frankly very concerned about since it was first proposed a number of years ago. Um, I would like to. Uh, we've submitted a, a, a number of, uh, you know, a number of we think very relevant pieces of information that um, not only um, describe our vision for this site, but also highlight what we think you don't have enough information for to be able to make a very consequential decision. Uh, spending ten million dollars to demolish a building before there is a plan for its its. Um, its replacement. You know, often in preservation, our challenge is um, fighting what's coming next. In this case, we are really trying to highlight the fact that without without a, a, a proposed reuse, this is an entirely premature um, um, and reckless um, spending of resources. Um, 
quite coincidentally, it is National Recycling Day. Um, and what we're really talking about is let's be smart with the resources that we have. Um, there is a professional difference of opinion on how feasible um, the adaptive reuse of this building is. Every consultant that we've shown this to, um, both ones that we've engaged with and ones that we haven't, have said that this building to them looked imminently reusable um, and that the numbers that the county is presenting on the reuse um, were very questionable. I'm not saying they're wrong, but they, they, they um, demand um, a second set of eyes. And we've tried to do that, and we hope that you saw that study. Um, we also have a uh, circulated petition that more than 300 people have signed. So there really is demonstrated community interest in the significance of this building, its history, and its potential future. Our next speaker is Mike Sodergren. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mike Sodergren, Preservation Action Council. There are many reasons why this building should be saved. From a preservation standpoint, the building is a platform for telling a part of San Jose and Santa Clara County's history that should not be buried in a landfill. Its architecture, its inhabitants, as Paul Soto has mentioned, Norman Manetta, uh, Janet Gray Hayes, um, uh, Susan Wilson, Blanca Alvarado, Lola Williams, all of these people and many more have contributed to what is a unique place in the United States. Um, the work that was done around the building and in it is very significant. Um, these leaders of our past should be an inspiration to pursue adaptive reuse of this building for the real issues of the day, housing, homelessness, mental health, and community services, not creating a vacant lot. Um, the concern is that instead of uh, insisting that this is infeasible to create something out of this building and, and uh, space around it. I respectfully note that there is a potential to draw a totally avoidable challenge under CEQA that will waste everybody's time and resources. Um, PAX uh, attorney for CEQA uh, notes this, clearing the lot would be fine if it did not contained the former city hall so historically significant that it is eligible for the honor of listing at the National Register of Historic Places. It was mentioned earlier that CEQA can be an impediment to development, and this can up development by saying, let's not go to a vacant lot, let's develop something on that spot. Um, for purposes of CEQA, historical and natural environmental resources are treated the same. Demolition of the historic city Mike, we've lost you. Our next speaker is Irvish. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Thank you very much to Board of Supervisors, County staff, as well as the respective uh, facility planner, and as well as the clerk. What I wanted to mention over here, it's a question of a cause and effect. As the building having a historical significance, as well as to protect, preserve the net the, as part of a National Heritage Monument Act, certain properties are to be preserved as a part of the heritage. However, it is equally important to, to make sure that, you know, how these properties are adding a value proposition to the county and as well as city, that would equally become important as well, because having a historical significance is an important part of the fact that they add the values to the certain properties, regardless of whether they are being preserved or whether, the, whether, whether they are being re-maintained and re architect as well. Now, on contrary, being the fact, being the fact that and heard from the constituents, it is equally important that you know what counties to derive from such properties, whether they are of a special significance whether they are to be made a post office or whether they are to be made a place or whether they are to be made a palace or whether they are, uh, they are maintained to be a part of a museum facility. It is up to a county and city to derive the facts that you know how it is going to be maintained and how it is going to be utilized. So my request to the county is to consider the measures for maintaining the cost as well as budgeting out that you know how the utilization would directly derive the cause and effect of the decisions that is to be taken. And that's how the decision is to be derived, not just based upon the cost factor, how also adding the significance of it, 
considering the law, finance, budget, and as well as how the property is going to be evaluated. Thank you for making consideration of comments. And that concludes our requests. Thank you, Jess. I'll go back to Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, colleagues, the reason I'm not supporting the action today um, is that when when I served on the city council, I had an opportunity, and I so apologize for the background noise. Um, I had an opportunity to vote on the future of the current city hall. And at that time, we had a decision to make about whether or not we would restructure the building, reuse the building, or build something new uh, somewhere else. And there were three reasons I didn't want to do move somewhere else. One, I thought it would strain the city and the county's relationship further. Um, two, I didn't think it was a good use of money. And three, at that time, we had leaders in our community who were still around, like Al Rufo, who were making the case that the building had significance and the people who had served in it um, really created a part of our uh, tremendous history here in the county. And we've talked about Janet Gray Hayes being the first mayor of a major female mayor of a major city in the country's history. Norman Manetta being the first Asian mayor of a mayor, major city in the country's history and going on um, with his illustrious career as well. Um, Ken Yeager flying the first freedom flag. There are a thousand reasons that it makes sense to look at the reuse or pre preservation at least of some part of the building. Um, so I will not be supporting the staff's recommendation. Um, I know that, you know, one one um, thing that I'm I'm particularly interested in is the fact that our historic um, heritage commission was concerned about this as well. And, you know, I I don't know um, what's the appropriate action. I I could I will make a motion that um, this action be referred back to staff. Um, if I could get a second, and for the purpose of really diving into the reuse issue, that would be um, a rec. A rec I'm sorry, a motion. I'll second it. Supervisor Chavez, do you have Thank further you. comments? Otherwise, Supervisor Lee has his hand raised. Yes, I, I definitely do agree that there's a, a significant a historical um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, value to this building. Uh, and and with so many ideas being mentioned by speakers and less we've been receiving, uh, it's been sitting vacant for a decade, and I certainly think it's been wasted, uh, whether it's for a, a, a public use, a museum, or housing, or whatnot. And the county historical commissioners are those that we appoint, uh, and we certainly should take their recommendation very seriously. In this case, they have come up with the recommendation to preserve the building. So for that reason, I really do think that the looking into reuse of this building instead of just demolishing it would be a, a more uh, important, uh, a better use of our times and resources and be able to preserve some of the historical buildings. Um, you know, Silicon Valley has got so many new and shiny things, but the, for the same time, we spend so much time looking at, looking back and, you know, the, the nostalgic of going to where Hewlett Packard has the first garage, or we drive by 101 and seeing the uh, hangar uh, one, right? That uh, that uh, that's being preserved. Uh, and now we're putting a skin on top of it. Um, these are really significant uh, uh, landmarks, and I do think that the San Jose City Hall certainly uh, serves that purpose as well. So uh, for that reason, I will support this motion. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, ask staff that if in fact they are going to give the range of options another look and it looks like that's what the motion is uh heading toward that staff consider if they come back again with a recommendation to proceed in this way rather than uh, identify some reuse that staff look at a more creative and robust program for what I'll call salvage and integration of elements of the building. I, um, you know, I know there's a range of possibilities. I know folks will be at, you know, every place along the continuum, but I, I thought, frankly, that the report we got uh, might have done something more 
then suggest, well, we'll look for some things that might be salvageable and or make them available. I really do think that, you know, whatever the future holds for the site, there have to be opportunities to incorporate some of these architectural elements in uh, a future development, if that's the course that's ultimately taken. And I, I just would sort of like to see a little more creativity on that front. Um, I, I think uh, the uh, hmm. I think we can do better. I'll just let it go there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other hands up? Seeing none, I've got a couple of comments. I've been looking out at that building for about 12 years. I think I'm older than that building. I understand and appreciate the history, um, especially the way uh, Paul Soto explained it so eloquently. I think it's entirely appropriate that a monument of some sort, um, be it a, a monument that's engraved, be it a, a small building where people can walk in and see on the wall a description of all the historical, uh, the firsts, as Paul Soto expressed, that have occurred in that location. As far as the building itself goes, um, we have extensive studies regarding the unfeasibility of reusing the former city hall structure for office or residential use. In my opinion, that building needs to come down, a monument of some sort documenting, honoring all these significant things that have taken place. Um, if not at that particular area of those individuals that have served there, uh, votes that have been taken, whatever some committee wishes to come up with, and I'm sure the list will be extensive can all be engraved and put on walls in some public art type of format. I, I could see all of that, a, a cupola or whatever, but the building itself is not safe, it's not sound, it's not, not repurposable. The land that it occupies is significant. I think the County of Santa Clara can do better for the people of Santa Clara and provide some sort of repurposing that benefits the people of Santa Clara County. And I think 95% of that building could go. You could re retain, and I'm, obviously I'm just picking round numbers, 5% and make that into something special where people of Santa Clara County can come, bring their kids, teach them some of the history that has taken place in the last 60 years and the individuals. And again, I applaud Paul Soto for the list that he came up with. I don't know if he had all that in his head or was reading something, but um, there is a lot of history that has taken place. There are a lot of individuals first that have occurred in the city of San Jose. And that was the city hall in which all the people he named made that happen. So I think that memory should be preserved in some public art type fashion, but I think the building should come down and be repurposed. Dr. Smith. Yeah, I just wanted to put a little historic um, spin on the issue. Um, when we first uh, took possession of this property uh, from the city of um, San Jose as part of the repayment for redevelopment issues, um, board at that time, which was a different board than is here now, um, envisioned using it for affordable housing um, as part of our um, Civic Center Master Plan. Um, as we talked about earlier, I think some of the uh, priorities have changed in this current board's uh, rendition. Um, so um, when you ask us to go back and think about uh, new use uh, for the area. Um, we can certainly come back to that, but uh, we'd like some direction from the board about what type of facility, what kinds of services they'd like there. Um, the building itself as it currently exists cannot be repurposed without enormous um, cost. Basically you have to take it down to the studs which are metal and then scrape all the asbestos off of them and then rebuild the building um, 
So that's really impractical. Um, but if the board would give us an idea of what they might want to use that property for, whether it's affordable housing, behavioral health, IMDs, um, some other purpose, uh, we can then come back with a proposal of how to proceed. All right, Supervisor Lee. Um, thank you, uh, um, <clears throat> Dr. Smith. I think that was very helpful. And, and, and uh, as we have declared the mental health being a uh, huge issue, and I think earlier today, that actually didn't, didn't cross my mind uh, about building, uh, uh, retrofitting for maybe like his IMD beds. Uh, if this is something that's even possible, I certainly want to uh, uh, get some, uh, get a look review of it if, if yes a or nay right for example so if this is potentially feasible i was only one study on it just to it came back to us what the cost implication would be and how soon and how fast would that be uh, implemented that would be great thank you all righty we have a member of the public to speak um that member of the public uh, I think we lost him for the last 10 seconds. He did speak earlier. Would you like to give him 10 more seconds? 10 more seconds would be fine, Jess. You're the best. Thank you. No problem. We'll give Camille a moment to adjust her timer. She might think that she's done with her job. There we go. Uh, Mike, we'll give you your last 10 seconds. Yes, I just would like to clarify uh, major architectural firms. Uh, Swinerton said that this is absolutely uh, can be rebuilt um, for half the cost of the original estimate. So. All right, Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Oh, I'm ready for the motion to be voted. Thank you. Thank you. Would you please repeat your motion? It's important for me. Uh, this it was made by me, and the motion was to ask um, staff to take it back to the historical uh, commission and to come back with the um, the recommendations and requests made by my colleagues during this discussion. Okay. Second, yes. Thank you, uh, Jess. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Travis. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. President Wasserman. Yes. And Jess, that looks like our last item. Do you agree? Yes. All right. And with that, Mr. President, can I come back? I'm sorry, Dr. Smith. I have right at the bottom of my page in red Sharpie, asterisk Dr. Smith. <laughs> Go right ahead, thanks, sir. Thanks for it. Yeah, right there. Um, as part of my uh, county executive report, I mentioned the possibility of coming back to uh, in-person meetings, the board uh, today under consent number 63 voted to continue the uh, emergency exception. So um, I just wanna notify the board, the clerk of the board needs at least a month runtime before being ready to come back to the chambers. We'll plan on coming back to the chambers in January. Thank you for that clarification. Um, with that, I'm gonna adjourn this meeting, Supervisor Submitting until our next meeting, which will be? December the 6th, Mr. Chairman. Excellent. <laughs> Have a good evening, everybody. Always a pleasure. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Good night. Recording stopped. Thank you all for attending. With that, this meeting room will now be closed. <laughs>